Chapter 22 The chapel was cold and damp. It was a round building, stuck to the side of a mausoleum like a cancerous growth. It was raining outside, and two television crews from New Orleans huddled beside their vans and hid under umbrellas. The crowd was respectable, especially for a man with no family. His remains were packaged tastefully in a porcelain urn sitting on a mahogany table. Hidden speakers from above brought forth one dreary dirge after another, as the lawyers and judges and a few clients ventured in and sat near the rear. Barry the Blade strutted down the aisle with two thugs in tow. He was properly dressed in a black double-breasted suit with a black shirt and a black tie, black lizard shoes. His ponytail was immaculate. He arrived late and enjoyed the stares from the mourners. After all, he'd known Jerome Clifford for a long time. Four rows back, the right Reverend Roy Fultrig sat with Wally Box and scowled at the ponytail. The lawyers and judges looked at Moldano, then at Fultrig, then back at Moldano. Strange seeing them in the same room. The music stopped, and a minister of some generic faith appeared in the small pulpit behind the urn. He started with a lengthy obituary of Walter Jerome Clifford and threw in everything but the names of his childhood pets. This was not unexpected, because when the obituary was over, there would be little to say. It was a brief service, just as Romy had asked for in his note. The lawyers and judges glanced at their watches. Another mournful lamentation started from above, and the minister excused everyone. Romy's last hurrah was over in fifteen minutes. There were no tears. Even his secretary kept her composure. His daughter was not present. Very sad. He lived forty-four years, and no one cried at his funeral. Fultrick kept his seat and scowled at Moldano as he strutted down the aisle and out the door. Fultrick waited until the chapel was empty, then made an exit with Wally behind him. The cameras were there, and that's exactly what he wanted. Earlier, Wally had leaked a juicy tidbit about the great Roy Fultrick attending the service and also that there was a chance Barry the Blade Moldano would be present. Neither Wally nor Roy had any idea whether Moldano would attend, but it was only a leak, so who cared if it was accurate? It was working. A reporter asked for a couple of minutes, and Fultrick did what he always did. He glanced at his watch, looked terribly frustrated by this intrusion, and sent Wally after the van. Then he said what he always said. Okay, but make it quick. I'm due in court in fifteen minutes. He hadn't been to court in three weeks. He usually went about once a month, but to hear him talk, he lived in courtrooms, battling the bad guys, protecting the interests of the American taxpayers, a hard-charging crime buster. He squeezed under an umbrella and looked at the minicam. The reporter waved a microphone in his face. Jerome Clifford was a rival. Why did you attend his memorial service? He was suddenly sad. Jerome was a fine lawyer and a friend of mine. We faced each other many times, but always respected each other. What a guy, gracious even in death. He hated Jerome Clifford, and Jerome Clifford hated him, but the camera saw only the heartbreak of a grieving pal. Mr. Moldano has hired a new lawyer and filed a motion for a continuance. What's your response to this? As you know, Judge Lamond is scheduled a hearing on the continuance request for tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. The decision will be his. The United States will be ready for trial whenever he sets it. Do you expect to find the body of Senator Boyette before trial? Yes, I think we are getting close. Is it true you were in Memphis just hours after Mr. Clifford shot himself? Yes. He sort of shrugged, as if it was no big deal. There are news reports in Memphis that the kid who was with Mr. Clifford when he shot himself may know something about the Boyette case. Any truth to this? He smiled sheepishly, another trademark. When the answer was yes, but he couldn't say it, but he wanted to send the message anyway, he just grinned at the reporters and said, I can't comment on that. I can't comment on that, he said, glancing around as if time was up and his busy trial calendar was calling. Does the boy know where the body is? No comment, he said with irritation. The rain grew harder and splashed on his socks and shoes. I have to be going. After an hour in jail, Mark was ready to escape. 
He inspected both windows. The one above the lavatory had some wire in it, but that did not matter. What was troubling, though, was the fact that any object exiting through this window, including a boy, would fall directly down at least fifty feet, and the fall would be stopped by a concrete sidewalk lined with chain-link fencing and barbed wire. Also, both windows were thick and too small for escape, he determined. He would be forced to make his break when they transported him, maybe take a hostage or two. He'd seen some great movies about jailbreaks. His favorite was Escape from Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood. He'd figure it out. Doreen knocked on the door, jangled her keys, and stepped inside. She held a directory and a black phone, which she plugged into the wall. It's yours for ten minutes, no long distance. Then she was gone, the door clicking loudly behind her, the cheap perfume floating heavy in the air and burning his eyes. He found the number for St. Peter's, asked for room 943, and was informed that no calls were being put through to that room. Ricky's asleep, he thought. Must be bad. He found Reggie's number and listened to Clint's voice on the recorder. He called Greenway's office and was informed the doctor was at the hospital. Mark explained exactly who he was, and the secretary said she believed the doctor was seeing Ricky. He called Reggie again. Same recording. He left an urgent message. Get me out of jail, Reggie. He called her home number and listened to another recording. He stared at the phone. With about seven minutes left, he had to do something. He flipped through the directory and found the listings for the Memphis Police Department. He picked the North Precinct and dialed the number. Detective Clickman, he said. Just a minute, said the voice on the other end. He held for a few seconds, then a voice said, Who are you holding for? He cleared his throat and tried to sound gruff. Detective Clickman. He's on duty. When will he be in? Around lunch. Thanks. Mark hung up quickly and wondered if the lines were bugged. Probably not. After all, these phones were used by criminals and people like himself to call their lawyers and talk business. There had to be privacy. He memorized the precinct phone number and address, then flipped to the yellow pages under restaurants. He punched a number and a friendly voice said, Domino's Pizza, may I take your order? He cleared his throat and tried to sound hoarse. Yes, I'd like to order four of your large Supremes. Is that all? Yes, need them delivered at noon. Your name? I'm ordering them for Detective Clickman, North Precinct. Delivered where? North Precinct, 3633 Allen Road. Just ask for Clickman. We've been there before, believe me. Phone number? It's 555-8989. There was a short pause as the adding machine rang it up. That'll be $48.10. Fine. Don't need it until noon. Mark hung up, his heart pounding. But... He'd done it once, and he could do it again. He found the Pizza Hut numbers. There were 17 in Memphis and started placing orders. Three said they were too far away from downtown. He hung up on them. One young girl was suspicious, said he sounded too young, and he hung up on her, too. But for the most part, it was just routine business. Call, place the order, give the address and phone number, and allow free enterprise to handle the rest. When Doreen knocked on the door twenty minutes later, he was ordering Clickman some Chinese food from Wong Boys. He quickly hung up and walked to the bunks. She took great satisfaction in removing the phone, like taking toys away from bad little boys. But she was not quick enough. Detective Clickman had ordered about forty deep-dish supreme deluxe large pizzas and a dozen Chinese lunches, all to be delivered around noon, at a cost of somewhere in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars. For his hangover, Gronky sipped his fourth orange juice of the morning and washed down another headache powder. He stood at the window of his hotel room, shoes off, belt unbuckled, shirt unbuttoned, and listened painfully as Jack Nance reported the disturbing news. Have a less than thirty minutes ago, Nance said, sitting on the dresser, staring at the wall, trying to ignore this goon standing at the window with his back to him. Why? Gronky grunted. Has to be youth court. They took him straight to jail. I mean, hell, they can't just pick up a kid or anybody else for that matter and take him straight to jail. They had to file something in youth court. Cal's there now, checking it out. Maybe we'll have it soon. I don't know. Youth court records are locked up, I think. 
get the damn records, okay? Nance seethed, but bit his tongue. He hated Gronky and his little band of cutthroats, and even though he needed the hundred bucks an hour, he was tired of hanging around this dirty, smoky room like a flunky waiting to be barked at. He had other clients. Cal was a nervous wreck. We're trying, he said. Try harder, Gronky said to the window. Now I gotta call Barry and tell him the kid's been taken away and there's no way to get him. Got him locked up somewhere, probably with a cop sitting outside his door. He finished the orange juice and tossed the can in the general direction of the waste basket. It missed and rattled along the wall. He glared at Nance. Barry'll want to know if there's a way to get the kid. What would you suggest? I suggest you leave the kid alone. This is not New Orleans, and this is not just some little punk you can rub out and make everything wonderful. This kid's got baggage, lots of it. People are watching him. If you do something stupid, you'll have a hundred fibbies all over your ass. You won't be able to breathe, and you and Mr. Moldano will rot in jail. Here, not New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. Gronky waved both hands at him in disgust and walked back to the window. I want you boys to keep watching him. If they move him anywhere, I want to know it immediately. If they take him to court, I want to know it. Figure it out, Nance. This is your city. You know the streets and alleys. At least you're supposed to. You're getting paid good money. Yes, sir, Nance said loudly, then left the room. Chapter 23 for two hours, every Thursday morning, Reggie disappeared into the office of Dr. Elliot Levin, her longtime psychiatrist. Levin had been holding her hand for ten years. He was the architect who'd figured out the pieces and helped her put the puzzle back together. Their sessions were never disturbed. Clint paced nervously in Levin's reception area. Diane had called twice already. She'd read the summons and petitioned to him over the phone. He had called Judge Roosevelt and the detention center and Levin's office, and now he waited impatiently for eleven o'clock. The receptionist tried to ignore him. Reggie was smiling when Dr. Levin finished with her. She pecked him on the cheek, and they walked hand in hand into his plush reception area where Clint was waiting. She stopped smiling. "'What's the matter?' she asked, certain something terrible had happened. "'We need to go,' Clint said, taking her arm and ushering her through the door." She nodded goodbye to Levin, who was watching with interest and concern. They were on a sidewalk next to a small parking lot. They've picked up Mark Sway. He's in custody. What? Who? Cops. A petition was filed this morning alleging Mark to be a delinquent, and Roosevelt issued an order to take him into custody. Clint was pointing. Let's take your car. I'll drive. Who filed the petition? Fultrick. Diane called from the hospital. That's where they got him. She had a big fight with the cops and scared Ricky again. I've talked to her and assured her you'll go get Mark. They opened and slammed doors to Reggie's car and sped from the parking lot. Roosevelt scheduled a hearing for noon, Clint explained. Noon? You must be kidding. That's 56 minutes from now. It's an expedited hearing. I talked to him about an hour ago and he wouldn't comment on the petition. Had very little to say, really. Where are we going? She thought about this for a second. He's in the detention center, and I can't get him out. Let's go to juvenile court. I want to see the petition, and I want to see Harry Roosevelt. This is absurd, a hearing within hours of filing the petition. The law says between three and seven days, not three and seven hours. But isn't there a provision for expedited hearings? Yeah, but only in extreme matters. They fed Harry a bunch of crap. Delinquent. What's the kid done? This is crazy. They're trying to force him to talk, Clint, that's all. So you didn't expect this? Of course not. Not here, not in juvenile court. I thought about a grand jury summons for Mark from New Orleans, but not juvenile court. He's committed no delinquent act. He doesn't deserve to be taken in. Well, they got him. Jason McThune zipped his pants and hit the lever three times before the antique urinal flushed. The bowl was stained with streaks of brown and the floor was wet and he thanked God he worked in the federal building where everything was polished and spiffy. He'd lay asphalt with a shovel before he'd work in juvenile court. But he was here now, like it or not, wasting time on the Boyette case, because K.O. Lewis wanted him here, and K.O. took orders from Mr. F. Denton Voyles, director of the FBI for 42 years now. 
and in his 42 years no member of Congress, and certainly no U.S. Senator, had been murdered, and the fact that the late Boyd Boyatch had been hidden so neatly was galling. Mr. Voiles was quite upset, not about the killing itself, but about the FBI's inability to solve it completely. McThune had a strong hunch Ms. Reggie Love would arrive shortly, since her client had been snatched away from right under her nose, and he figured she'd be fuming when he saw her. Maybe she'd understand that these legal strategies were being hatched in New Orleans, not Memphis, and certainly not in his office. Surely she would understand that he, McThune, was just a humble FBI agent taking orders from above and doing what the lawyers told him. Perhaps he could dodge her until they were all in the courtroom. Perhaps not. As McThune opened the restroom door and stepped into the hallway, he was suddenly face to face with Reggie Love. Clint was a step behind her. She saw him immediately, and within seconds he was backed against the wall and she was in his face. She was agitated. "'Morning, Miss Love,' he said, forcing a calm smile. "'It's Reggie, McThune.' "'Morning, Reggie.' "'Who's here with you?' she asked, glaring. "'Beg your pardon. "'Your gang, your little band, your little group of government conspirators. "'Who's here?' "'This was not a secret. He could discuss this with her. "'George Ord, Thomas Fink from New Orleans, K.O. Lewis. "'Who's K.O. Lewis, Deputy Director FBI from D.C.? "'What's he doing here?' Her questions were clipped and rapid and aimed like arrows at McThune's eyes. He was pinned to the wall, afraid to move, but gallantly trying to appear nonchalant. If Fink or Ord or, heaven forbid, K.O. Lewis happened into the hallway and saw him huddled with her like this, he'd never recover. Well, I... Uh, don't make me mention the tape, McThune, she said, mentioning the damn thing anyway. Just tell me the truth. Clint was standing behind her, holding her briefcase and watching the traffic. He appeared a bit surprised by this confrontation and the speed with which it was occurring. McThune shrugged as if he'd forgotten about the tape, and now that she mentioned it, what the hell? I think Fultrig's office called Mr. Lewis and asked him to come down, that's all. That's all? Did you guys have a little meeting with Judge Roosevelt this morning? Yes, we did. Didn't bother to call me, did you? Uh, the judge said he'd call you. I see. Are you planning to testify during this little hearing? She took a step back when she asked this, and McThune breathed easier. I'll testify if I'm called as a witness. She stuck a finger in his face. The nail on the end of it was long, curved, carefully manicured, and painted red, and McThune watched it fearfully. You stick with the facts, okay? One lie. However small, or one bit of unsolicited self-serving crap to the judge, or one cheap shot remark that hurts my client, and I'll slice your throat, Macthune. You understand? He kept smiling, glancing up and down the hall, as if she were a pal and they were just having a tiny disagreement. I understand, he said, grinning. Reggie turned and walked away with Clint by her side. Macthune turned and darted back into the restroom though he knew she wouldn't hesitate to follow him if she wanted something. "'What was that all about?' Clint asked. "'Just keeping him honest.' They wove through crowds of litigants, paternity defendants, delinquent fathers, kids in trouble, and their lawyers huddled in small packs along the hallway. "'What's the bit about the tape? I didn't tell you about it?' "'No. I'll play it for you later. It's hysterical.' She opened the door with Judge Harry M. Roosevelt painted on it, and they entered a small cramped room with four desks in the center and rows of file cabinets around the walls. Reggie went straight for the first desk on the left, where a pretty black girl was typing. The plate on her desk gave the name as Marsha Riggle. She stopped typing and smiled. "'Hello, Reggie,' she said. "'Hi, Marsha. Where's his honor?' On her birthdays, Marcia received flowers from the law offices of Reggie Love and chocolates at Christmas. She was the right arm of Harry Roosevelt, a man so overworked he had no time to remember such things as speaking commitments and appointments and anniversaries. But Marcia always remembered. Reggie had handled her divorce two years ago. Mama Love had cooked lasagna for her. He's on the bench. She'll be off in a few minutes. You're on for noon, you know. That's what I hear. He's tried to call you all morning. Well, he didn't find me. I'll wait in his office. Sure. You want a sandwich? I'm ordering lunch for him now. 
No thanks. Reggie took a briefcase and asked Clint to wait in the hall and watch for Mark. It was twenty minutes before twelve, and he'd be arriving soon. Marcia handed her a copy of the petition, and Reggie entered the judge's office as if it were hers. She closed the door behind her. Harry and Irene Roosevelt had also eaten at Mama Love's table. Few, if any, lawyers in Memphis spent as much time in juvenile court as Reggie Love, and over the past four years their lawyer-judge relationship had developed from one of mutual respect to one of friendship. About the only asset Reggie had been awarded in the divorce from Joe Cardoni was four season tickets for Memphis State basketball. The threesome, Harry, Irene, and Reggie, had watched many games at the Pyramid, sometimes joined by Elliot Levin or another male friend of Reggie's. The basketball was usually followed by cheesecake at Café Espresso in the Peabody, or, depending on Harry's mood, maybe a late dinner at Grisanti's in Midtown. Harry was always hungry, always planning the next meal. Irene fussed at him about his weight, so he ate more. Reggie occasionally kidded him about it, and each time she mentioned pounds or calories, he immediately asked about Mama Love and her pastas and cheeses and cobblers. Judges are human. They need friends. He could eat and socialize with Reggie Love, or any other lawyer for that matter, and maintain his unbiased judicial discretion. She marveled at the organized debris of his office. The floor was an ancient pale carpet, most of it covered with neat stacks of briefs and other legal wisdoms, all somehow cropped off at the height of twelve inches. Saggy bookshelves lined two walls, but the books could not be seen, for the files and more stacks of briefs and memos tucked in front of books, with inches hanging perilously in mid-air. Red and manila files were crammed everywhere. Three old wooden chairs sat pitifully before the desk. One had files on it. One had files under it. One was vacant for the moment, but would doubtless be used for some type of storage by the end of the day. She sat on this one and looked at the desk. Though it was allegedly made of wood, none was visible except for the front and side panels. The top could be leather or chrome. No one would ever know. Harry himself could not remember what the top of his desk looked like. The upper level was another of Marsha's neat rows of legal papers cropped at eight inches, twelve inches for the floor, eight for the desk. Underneath and next in depth was a huge daily calendar for 1986, which Harry had once used to draw and doodle while listening to lawyers bore him with their arguments. Under the calendar was no man's land. Even Marsha was afraid to go deeper. She'd stuck a dozen notes on yellow post-it pads to the back of his chair. Evidently, these were the most urgent of the morning's emergencies. Despite the chaos of his office, Harry Roosevelt was the most organized judge Reggie had encountered in her four-year career. He was not forced to spend time studying the law because he'd written most of it. He was known for the economy of his words, so his orders and decrees tended to be lean by judicial standards. He didn't tolerate lengthy briefs written by lawyers, and he was abrupt with those who loved to hear themselves talk. He managed his time wisely, and Marcia took care of the rest. His desk and office were somewhat famous in Memphis legal circles, and Reggie suspected he enjoyed this. She admired him immensely, not just for his wisdom and integrity, but also for his dedication to this office. He could have moved up many years ago to a stuffier place on the bench with a fancy desk and clerks and paralegals and clean carpet and dependable air conditioning. She flipped through the petition— Foltrig and Fink were the petitioners, their signatures at the bottom. Nothing detailed, just broad, sweeping allegations about the juvenile Mark's sway, obstructing a federal investigation by refusing to cooperate with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Louisiana. She despised Foltrig every time she saw his name. But it could be worse. Foltrig's name could be at the bottom of a grand jury subpoena demanding the appearance of Mark's sway in New Orleans. It would be perfectly legal and proper for Foltrig to do this, and she was a bit surprised he'd chosen Memphis as his forum. New Orleans would be next, if this didn't work. The door opened and a massive black robe lumbered in, with Marcia in pursuit, holding a list and clicking off things that had to be done immediately. He listened without looking at her, unzipped the robe, and threw it at a chair, the one with the files under it. "'Good morning, Reggie,' he said with a smile. 
He patted her on the shoulder as he walked behind her. "'That'll be all,' he said calmly to Marcia, who closed the door and left. He picked the little yellow notes from his chair without reading them, then fell in it. "'How's Mama love?' he asked. "'She's fine. And you? Marvelous. Not surprised to see you here.' You didn't have to sign a custody order. I would have brought him here. Harry, you know that. He fell asleep last night in the swing on Mama Love's porch. He's in good hands. Harry smiled and rubbed his eyes. Very few lawyers called him Harry in his office, but he rather enjoyed it when it came from her. Reggie, Reggie, you never believe your client should be taken into custody. That's not true. You think all's well if you can just take him home and feed him. It helps. Yes, it does. But according to Mr. Ord and the FBI, Little Mark's way could be in a world of danger. What did they tell you? It'll come out during the hearing. They must have been pretty convincing, Harry. I got an hour's notice of the hearing. That has to be a record. I thought you'd like that. We can do it tomorrow, if you prefer. I don't mind making Mr. Ord wait. Not with Mark in custody. Release him to my custody and we'll do the hearing tomorrow. I need some time to think. I'm afraid to release him until I hear proof. Why? According to the FBI, there are some very dangerous people now in the city who may want to shut him up. You know a Mr. Gronke and his pals, Bono and Perini? Ever hear these guys? No, neither had I until this morning. It seems that these gentlemen have arrived in our fair city from New Orleans and that they're close associates of Mr. Barry Muldano, or The Blade, as I believe he's known down there. Thank God organized crime never found Memphis. This scares me, Reggie. Really scares me. These men do not play games. Scares me, too. Has he been threatened? Yes. It happened yesterday at the hospital. He told me about it, and he's been with me ever since. So now you're a bodyguard. No, I'm not, but I don't think the code gives you the authority to order custody of children who may be in danger. Reggie, dear, I wrote the code. I can issue a custody order for any child alleged to be delinquent. True, he wrote the law, and the appellate courts had long since ceased second-guessing Harry Roosevelt. And according to Fultrick and Fink, what are Mark's sins? Harry snatched two tissues from a drawer and blew his nose. He smiled at her again. He can't keep quiet, Reggie. If he knows something, he must tell them. You know that. You're assuming he knows something. I'm not assuming anything. The petition makes certain allegations, and these allegations are based partly on fact and partly on assumption. Same as all petitions, I guess. Wouldn't you say? We never know the truth until we have the hearing. How much of Slick Molder's crap do you believe? I believe nothing, Reggie, until it's told to me under oath in my courtroom. And then I believe about ten percent of it. There was a long pause as the judge debated whether to ask the question. So, Reggie, what does the kid know? You know it's privileged, Harry, he smiled. So he knows more than he should. You could say that. If it's crucial to the investigation, Reggie, then he must tell. What if he refuses? I don't know. We'll deal with that when it happens. How smart is this kid? Very. Broken home, no father, working mother, grew up on the streets, the usual. I talked to his fifth grade teacher yesterday, and he makes all A's except for math. He's very bright, besides being street smart. No prior trouble? None. He's a great kid, Harry. Remarkable, really. Most of your clients are remarkable, Reggie. This one is special. He's here through no fault of his own. I hope he'll be fully advised by his lawyer. The hearing could get rough. Most of my clients are fully advised. They certainly are. There was a brief knock at the door, and Marcia appeared. Your client is here, Reggie. Witness room C. Thanks. She stood and walked to the door. I'll see you in a few minutes, Harry. Yes. Listen to me. I'm tough on kids who don't obey me. I know. He sat in a chair, leaning against the wall with his arms folded across his chest and a frustrated look on his face. He'd been treated like a convict for three hours now, and he was getting used to it. He felt safe. He hadn't been beaten by the cops or by his fellow inmates. 
The room was tiny, with no windows and bad lighting. Reggie entered and moved a folding chair near him. She'd been in this room under these circumstances many times. He smiled at her, obviously relieved. So how's jail? she asked. They haven't fed me yet. Can we sue them? Maybe. How's Doreen, the lady with the keys? A real snot. How do you know her? I've been there many times, Mark. It's my job. Her husband is serving thirty years in prison for bank robbery. Good. I'll ask her about him if I see her again. Am I going back there, Reggie? I'd like to know what's going on, you know. Well, it's very simple. We'll have a hearing before Judge Harry Roosevelt in a few minutes, in his courtroom. That may last a couple of hours. The U.S. Attorney and the FBI are claiming you possess important information, and I think we can expect them to ask the judge to make you talk. Can the judge make me talk? Reggie was speaking very slowly and carefully. He was an eleven-year-old child, a smart one with plenty of street sense, but she'd seen many like him and knew that at this moment he was nothing but a scared little boy. He might hear her words and he might not, or he might hear what he wanted to hear, so she had to be careful. No one can make you talk good. But the judge can put you back in the same little room if you don't talk. Back in jail. That's right. I don't understand. I haven't done a damn thing wrong, and I'm in jail. I just don't understand this. It's very simple. If, and I emphasize the word if, Judge Roosevelt instructs you to answer certain questions, and if you refuse, then he can hold you in contempt of court for not answering, for disobeying him. Now, I've never known an 11-year-old kid to be held in contempt, but if you were an adult and you refused to answer the judge's question, then you'd go to jail for contempt. But I'm a kid. Yes, but I don't think he'll allow you to go free if you refuse to answer the questions. You see, Mark, the law is very clear in this area. A person who has knowledge of information crucial to a criminal investigation cannot withhold this information because he feels threatened. In other words, you can't keep quiet because you're afraid of what might happen to you or your family. That's a stupid law. I don't really agree with it either, but that's not important. It is the law, and there are no exceptions, not even for kids. So I get thrown in jail for contempt? It's very possible. Can we sue the judge or do something else to get me out? No, you can't sue the judge. And Judge Roosevelt is a very good and fair man. I can't wait to meet him. It won't be long now. Mark thought about all this. His chair rocked methodically against the wall. How long would I be in jail? Assuming, of course, you're sent there, probably until you decide to comply with the judge's orders. Until you talk. Okay. What if I decide not to talk? How long will I stay in jail? A month? A year? Ten years? I can't answer that, Mark. No one knows. The judge doesn't know? No. If he sends you to jail for contempt, I doubt if he has any idea how long he'll make you stay. Another long pause. He'd spent three hours in Doreen's little room, and it wasn't such a bad place. He'd seen movies about prison in which gangs fought and rampaged and homemade weapons were used to kill snitches. Guards tortured inmates. Inmates attacked each other. Hollywood at its finest. But this place wasn't so bad. And look at the alternative. With no place to call home, the Sway family now lived in room 943 of St. Peter's Charity Hospital. But the thought of Ricky and his mother all alone and struggling without him was unbearable. Have you talked to my mother? he asked. No, not yet. I will after the hearing. I'm worried about Ricky. Do you want your mother present in the courtroom when we have this hearing? She needs to be here. No. She's got enough stuff on her mind. You and I can handle this mess. She touched his knee and wanted to cry. Someone knocked on the door and she said loudly, Just a minute. The judge is ready, came the reply. Mark breathed deeply and stared at her hand on his knee. Can I just take the Fifth Amendment? No. It won't work, Mark. I've already thought about it. The questions will not be asked to incriminate you. 
They will be asked for the purpose of gathering information you may have. I don't understand. I don't blame you. Listen to me carefully, Mark. I'll try to explain it. They want to know what Jerome Clifford told you before he died. They will ask you some very specific questions about the events immediately before the suicide. They will ask you, what if anything Clifford told you about Senator Boyette? Nothing you tell them with your answers will in any way incriminate you in the murder of Senator Boyette. Understand? You had nothing to do with it. And you had nothing to do with the suicide of Jerome Clifford. You broke no laws, okay? You're not a suspect in any crime or wrongdoing. Your answers cannot incriminate you. So you cannot hide under the protection of the Fifth Amendment. She paused and watched him closely. Understand? No. If I didn't do anything wrong, why was I picked up by the cops and taken to jail? Why am I sitting here waiting for a hearing? You're here because they think you know something valuable. And because, as I stated, every person has a duty to assist law enforcement officials in the course of their investigation. I still say it's a stupid law. Maybe so, but we can't change it today. He rocked forward and sat the chair on all fours. I need to know something, Reggie. Why can't I just tell them I know nothing? Why can't I say that me and old Romy talked about suicide and going to heaven and hell? You know, stuff like that. Tell lies? Yeah. It'll work, you know. Nobody knows the truth but Romy, me, and you, right? And Romy, bless his heart, ain't talking. You can't lie in court, Mark. She said this with all the sincerity she could muster. Hours of sleep had been lost trying to formulate the answer to this inevitable question. She wanted so badly to say, yes, that's it. Lie, Mark, lie. Her stomach ached and her hands almost shook, but she held firm. I cannot allow you to lie to the court. You'll be under oath, so you must tell the truth. Then it was a mistake to hire you, wasn't it? I don't think so. Sure it was. You're making me tell the truth, and in this case the truth might get me killed. If you weren't around, I'd march in there and lie my little butt off, and me and Mom and Ricky would all be safe. You can fire me if you like. The court will appoint another lawyer. He stood and walked to the darkest corner of the room and began crying. She watched his head sink and his shoulders sag. He covered his eyes with the back of his right hand and sobbed loudly. Though she'd seen it many times, the sight of a child, scared and suffering, was unbearable. She couldn't keep from crying, too. Chapter 24 Two deputies escorted him into the courtroom from a side door, away from the main hallway where the curious were known to lurk, but Slick Moeller anticipated this little maneuver and watched it all from behind a newspaper just a few feet away. Reggie followed her client and the deputies. Clint waited outside. It was almost a quarter afternoon, and the jungle of juvenile court had quieted a bit for lunch. The courtroom was of a shape and design Mark had never seen on television. It was so small and empty. There were no benches or seats for spectators. The judge sat behind an elevated structure between two flags with the wall just behind him. Two tables were in the center of the room facing the judge, and one was already occupied with men in dark suits. To the judge's right was a tiny table where an older woman was flipping through a stack of papers, very bored with it all, it seemed, until he entered the room. A gorgeous young lady sat ready with a stenographic machine directly in front of the judge's bench. She wore a short skirt, and her legs were attracting a lot of attention. She couldn't be older than sixteen, he thought, as he followed Reggie to their table. A bailiff with a gun on his hip was the final actor in the play. Mark took his seat, very much aware that everyone was staring at him. His two deputies left the room, and when the door closed behind them, the judge picked up the file again and flipped through it. They had been waiting on the juvenile and his lawyer, and now it was time for everyone to wait for the judge again. Rules of courtroom etiquette must be followed. Reggie pulled a single legal pad from a briefcase and began writing notes. She held a tissue in one hand and dabbed her eyes with it. 
Mark stared at the table, eyes still wet, but determined to suck it up and be tough through this ordeal. People were watching. Fink and Ord stared at the court reporter's legs. The skirt was halfway between knee and hip. It was tight and seemed to slide upward just a fraction of an inch every minute or so. The tripod holding her recording machine sat firmly between her knees. In the coziness of Harry's courtroom, she was fewer than ten feet away, and the last thing they needed was a distraction. But they kept staring. There. It slipped up with another quarter of an inch. Baxter L. McLemore, a young attorney fresh from law school, sat nervously at the table with Mr. Fink and Mr. Ord. He was a lowly assistant with the county attorney general's office, and it had fallen to his lot to prosecute on this day in juvenile court. This was certainly not the glamorous end of prosecution, but sitting next to George Ord was quite a thrill. He knew nothing about the Sway case, and Mr. Ord had explained in the hallway just minutes earlier that Mr. Fink would handle the hearing. With the court's permission, of course. Baxter was expected to sit there and look nice and keep his mouth shut. "'Is the door locked?' the judge finally asked in the general direction of the bailiff. "'Yes, sir.' "'Very well. "'I have reviewed the petition, and I am ready to proceed. "'For the record, I note the child is present along with counsel, "'and that the child's mother, who is alleged to be his custodial parent, "'was served with a copy of this petition and a summons this morning. "'However, the child's mother is not present in the courtroom, "'and this concerns me.' Harry paused for a moment and seemed to read from the file. Fink decided this was the appropriate time to establish himself in this matter, and he stood slowly, buttoning his jacket, and addressed the court. "'Your Honor, if I may, for the record, I'm Thomas Fink, Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Louisiana.' Harry's gaze slowly left the file and settled on Fink, who was standing stiff-backed, very formal, frowning intelligently as he spoke, still fiddling with the top button of his jacket. Fink continued, "'I am one of the petitioners in this matter, and if I may, I would like to address the issue of the presence of the child's mother.' Harry said nothing, just stared, as if in disbelief. Reggie couldn't help but smile. She winked at Baxter McLemore. Harry leaned forward and rested on his elbows as if intrigued by these great words of wisdom flowing from this gifted legal mind. Fink had found an audience. "'Your Honor, it is our position, the position of the petitioners, that this matter is of a nature so urgent that this hearing must take place immediately. The child is represented by counsel, quite competent counsel, I might add, and none of the child's legal rights will be prejudiced by the absence of his mother.' From what we understand, the mother's presence is required by the bedside of her youngest son. And so, well, who knows when she might be able to attend a hearing. We just think it's important, Your Honor, to proceed immediately with this hearing. You don't say, Harry asked. Yes, sir, this is our position. Your position, Mr. Fink, Harry said very slowly and very loudly with a pointed finger is in that chair right there. Please sit and listen to me very carefully, because I will only say this once. And if I have to say it again, I will do so as they are putting the handcuffs on you and taking you away for a night in our splendid jail. Fink fell into his chair, mouth open, gaping in disbelief. Harry scowled over his reading glasses and looked straight down at Thomas Fink. "'Listen to me, Mr. Fink. This is not some fancy courtroom in New Orleans, and I am not one of your federal judges. This is my little private courtroom, and I make the rules, Mr. Fink. Rule number one is that you speak only in my courtroom when you are first spoken to by me. Rule number two is that you do not grace his honor with unsolicited speeches, comments, or remarks. Rule number three is that his honor does not like to hear the voices of lawyers. His honor has been hearing these voices for twenty years, and his honor knows how lawyers love to hear themselves talk. Rule number four is that you do not stand in my courtroom. You sit 
at that table and say as little as possible. Do you understand these rules, Mr. Fink? Fink stared blankly at Harry and tried to nod. Harry wasn't finished. This is a tiny courtroom, Mr. Fink, designed by myself a long time ago for private hearings. We can all see and hear each other just fine. So you just keep your mouth shut and your butt in your seat, and we'll get along fine. Fink was still trying to nod. He gripped the arms of the chair, determined never to rise again. Behind him, Macthune, the lawyer-hater, barely suppressed a smile. Mr. McLemore, I understand Mr. Fink wants to handle this case for the prosecution. Is this agreeable? Okay with me, Your Honor. I'll allow it, but try and keep him in his seat. Mark was terrified. He had hoped for a kind, gentle old man with lots of love and sympathy, not this. He glanced at Mr. Fink, whose neck was crimson and whose breathing was loud and heavy, and he almost felt sorry for him. "'Miss Love,' the judge said, suddenly very warm and compassionate, "'I understand you may have an objection on behalf of the child.' "'Yes, Your Honor. She leaned forward and spoke deliberately in the direction of the court reporter. "'We have several objections we'd like to make at this time, and I want them in the record.' "'Certainly,' Harry said, as if Reggie Love could have anything she wanted. Fink sank lower and felt even dumber, so much for impressing the court with an initial burst of eloquence. Reggie glanced at her notes. Your Honor, I request the transcript of these proceedings be typed and prepared as soon as possible to facilitate an emergency appeal if necessary. So ordered. I object to this hearing on several grounds. First, inadequate notice has been given to the child, his mother, and to his lawyer. About three hours have passed since the petition was served upon the child's mother, and though I have represented the child for three days now, and everyone involved has known this, I was not notified of this hearing until seventy-five minutes ago. This is unfair, absurd, and an abuse of discretion by the court. When would you like to have the hearing, Miss Love? Harry asked. Today's Thursday, she said. What about Tuesday or Wednesday of next week? That's fine. Say Tuesday at nine. Harry looked at Fink, who still hadn't moved and was afraid to respond to this. Of course, Miss Love, the child will remain in custody until then. The child does not belong in custody, Your Honor. But I've signed a custody order, and I will not rescind it while we wait on the hearing. Our laws, Miss Love, provide for the immediate taking of alleged delinquents, and your client is being treated no differently from others. Plus, there are other considerations for Mark's way, and I'm sure these will be discussed shortly. Then I cannot agree on a continuance if my client will remain in custody. Very well, His Honor said properly. Let the record reflect a continuance was offered by the court and declined by the child. And let the record also reflect the child declined a continuance because the child does not wish to remain in the juvenile detention center any longer than he has to? So noted, Harry said with a slight grin. Please proceed, Miss Love. We also object to this hearing because the child's mother is not present. Due to extreme circumstances, her presence is not possible at this time. And keep in mind, Your Honor, the poor woman was first notified barely three hours ago. The child here is eleven years old and deserves the assistance of his mother. As you know, Your Honor, our laws strongly favor the presence of the parents in these hearings, and to proceed without Mark's mother is unfair. When can Miss Way be available? No one knows, Your Honor. She is literally confined to the hospital room with a son who's suffering from post-traumatic stress. Her doctor allows her out of the room only for minutes at a time. It could be weeks before she's available. So, you want to postpone this hearing indefinitely? Yes, sir. All right, you've got it. Of course, the child will remain in custody pending the hearing. The child does not belong in custody. The child will make himself available any time the court wants. There's nothing to be gained by keeping the child locked up until a hearing. There are complicating factors in this case, Miss Love, and I'm not inclined to release this child before we have this hearing, and it's determined how much he knows. It's that simple. I'm afraid to release him at this time. 
If I did so, and if something happened to him, I'd carry the guilt to my grave. You understand this, Miss Love? She understood, though she wouldn't admit it. I'm afraid you're making this decision based on facts not in evidence. Maybe so. But I have wide discretion in these matters, and until I hear the proof, I'm not inclined to release him. That'll look good on appeal, she snapped, and Harry didn't like it. Let the record reflect a continuance was offered to the child until his mother could be present, and the continuance was declined by the child. To which Reggie quickly responded, and also let the record reflect the child declined the continuance because the child does not wish to remain in the juvenile detention centre any longer than he has to. So noted, Miss Love. Please continue. The child moves this court to dismiss the petition filed against him on the grounds that the allegations are without merit and the petition has been filed in an effort to explore things the child might know. The petitioner's Fink and Fultrig are using this hearing as a fishing expedition for their desperate criminal investigation. Their petition is a hopeless mishmash of maybes and what-ifs, and filed under oath without the slightest hint of the real truth. They are desperate, Your Honor, and they are here shooting in the dark, hoping they hit something. The petition should be dismissed, and we should all go home. Harry glared down at Fink and said, I'm inclined to agree with her, Mr. Fink. What about it? Fink had settled into his chair and watched with comfort as Reggie's first two objections had been shot down by his honor. His breathing almost returned to normal, and his face had gone from crimson to pink, when suddenly the judge was agreeing with her and staring at him. Fink bolted to the edge of his chair, almost stood, but caught himself, and started stuttering. "'Well, uh, Your Honor, we, uh, can prove our allegations if given the chance.' We, uh, believe what we've said in the petition. I certainly hope so, Harry sneered. Yes, sir, and we know that this child is impeding an investigation. Yes, sir, we are confident we can prove what we've alleged. And if you can't? Well, I, we feel sure that you realize, Mr. Fink, that if I hear the proof in this case and find you're playing games, I can hold you in contempt and knowing Miss Love the way I do, I'm sure there will be retribution from the child. We intend to file suit first thing in the morning, Your Honor, Reggie added helpfully. Against both Mr. Fink and Roar Foltrick, they're abusing this court and the juvenile laws of the state of Tennessee. My staff is working on the lawsuit right now. Her staff was sitting outside in the hallway eating a Snickers bar and sipping a Diet Cola, but the threat sounded ominous in the courtroom. Fink glanced at George Ord, his co-counsel, who was sitting next to him, making a list of things to do that afternoon, and nothing on the list had anything to do with Mark Sway or Roy Fultrick. Ord supervised 28 lawyers working thousands of cases, and he just didn't care about Barry Muldano and the body of Boyd Boyette. It wasn't in his jurisdiction. Ord was a busy man, too busy to waste valuable time playing gopher for Roy Fultrick. But Fink was no featherweight. He'd seen his share of nasty trials and hostile judges and skeptical juries. He was rallying quite nicely. Your Honor, the petition is much like an indictment. Its truth cannot be ascertained without a hearing, and if we can get on with it, we can prove our allegations. Harry turned to Reggie. I'll take this motion to dismiss under advisement, and I'll hear the petitioner's proof. If it falls short, then I'll grant the motion, and we'll go from there. Reggie shrugged as if she expected this. Anything else, Miss Love? Not at this time. Call your first witness, Mr. Fink, Harry said, and make it brief. Get right to the point. If you waste time, I'll jump in with both feet and speed things along. Yes, sir. Sergeant Milo Hardy of the Memphis Police is our first witness. Mark had not moved during these preliminary skirmishes. He wasn't sure if Reggie had won them all or lost them all, and for some reason he didn't care. There was something unfair about a system in which a little kid was brought into a courtroom and surrounded by lawyers arguing and sniping at each other under the scornful eye of a judge, the referee, and somehow in the midst of this barrage of laws and code sections and motions and legal talk, 
The kid was supposed to know what was happening to him. It was hopelessly unfair. And so he just sat and stared at the floor near the court reporter. His eyes were still wet, and he couldn't make them stay dry. The courtroom was silent as Sergeant Hardy was fetched. His honor relaxed in his chair and removed his reading glasses. I want this on the record, he said. He glared at Fink again. This is a private and confidential matter. His hearing is closed for a reason. I defy anyone to repeat any word uttered in this room today or to discuss any aspect of this proceeding. Now, Mr. Fink, I realize you must report to the U.S. Attorney in New Orleans, and I realize Mr. Fultrick is a petitioner and has the right to know what happens here. And when you talk to him, please explain that I am very upset by his absence. He signed the petition, and he should be here. You may explain these proceedings to him and only to him, no one else. And you are to tell him to keep his big mouth shut. Do you understand, Mr. Fink? Yes, Your Honor. Will you explain to Mr. Fultrig that if I get wind of any breach in the confidentiality of these proceedings, that I will issue a contempt order and attempt to have him jailed? Yes, Your Honor. He was suddenly staring at Macthune and K.O. Lewis. They were seated immediately behind Fink and Ord. Mr. Macthune and Mr. Lewis, you may now leave the courtroom, Harry said abruptly. They grabbed the armrests as their feet hit the floor. Fink turned and stared at them, then looked at the judge. Uh, Your Honor, would it be possible for these gentlemen to remain in the— I told them to leave, Mr. Fink, Harry said loudly. If they're going to be witnesses, we'll call them later. If they're not witnesses, they have no business here, and they can wait in the hall with the rest of the herd. Now move along, gentlemen. Macthune was practically jogging for the door without the slightest hint of wounded pride, but K.O. Lewis was pissed. He buttoned his jacket and stared at his honor, but only for a second. No one had ever won a staring contest with Harry Roosevelt, and K.O. Lewis was not about to try. He strutted for the door, which was already open as Macthune dashed through it. Seconds later, Sergeant Hardy entered and sat in the witness chair. He was in full uniform. He shifted his wide ass in the padded seat and waited. Fink was frozen, afraid to begin without being told to do so. Judge Roosevelt rolled his chair to the end of the bench and peered down at Hardy. Something had caught his attention, and Hardy sat like a fat toad on a stool until he realized his honor was just inches away. "'Why are you wearing that gun?' Harry asked. Hardy looked up, startled then jerked his head to his right hip as if the gun was a complete surprise to him also. He stared at it as if the damn thing had somehow stuck itself to his body. "'Well, uh, are you on duty or off, Sergeant Hardy?' "'Well, off. Then why are you wearing a uniform, and why in the world are you wearing a gun in my courtroom?' Mark smiled for the first time in hours. The bailiff had caught on and was rapidly approaching the witness stand as Hardy jerked at his belt and removed the holster. The bailiff carried it away as if it were a murder weapon. "'Have you ever testified in court?' Harry asked. Hardy smiled like a child and said, "'Yes, sir, many times.' "'You have?' "'Yes, sir, many times.' "'And how many times have you testified while wearing your gun?' "'Sorry, Your Honor.' Harry relaxed, looked at Fink and waved at Hardy as if it was now permissible to get on with it. Fink had spent many hours in courtrooms during the past twenty years and took great pride in his trial skills. His record was impressive. He was glib and smooth, quick on his feet. But he was slow on his ass, and this sitting while interrogating a witness was such a radical way of finding truth. He almost stood again, caught himself again, and grabbed his legal pad. His frustration was apparent. "'Would you state your name for the record?' he asked in a short, rapid burst. "'Sergeant Milo Hardy, Memphis Police Department. "'And what is your address?' "'Harry held up a hand to cut off Hardy. "'Mr. Fink, why do you need to know where this man lives?' "'Fink stared in disbelief. "'I guess, Your Honor, it's just a routine question. "'Do you know how much I hate routine questions, Mr. Fink?' 
I'm beginning to understand. Routine questions lead us nowhere, Mr. Fink. Routine questions waste hours and hours of valuable time. I do not want to hear another routine question. Please. Yes, Your Honor, I'll try. I know it's hard. Fink looked at Hardy and tried desperately to think of a brilliantly original question. Last Monday, Sergeant, were you dispatched to the scene of a shooting? Harry held up his hand again, and Fink slumped in his seat. Mr. Fink, I don't know how you folks do things in New Orleans, but here in Memphis we make our witnesses swear to tell the truth before they start testifying. It's called placing them under oath. Does that sound familiar? Fink rubbed his temples and said, Yes, sir. Could the witness please be sworn? The elderly woman at the desk suddenly came to life. She sprang to her feet and yelled at Hardy, who was less than fifteen feet away. Raise your right hand. Hardy did this and was sworn to tell the truth. She returned to her seat and to her nap. Now, Mr. Fink, you may proceed, Harry said with a nasty little smile, very pleased that he'd caught Fink with his pants down. He relaxed in his massive seat and listened intently to the rapid question-and-answer routine that followed. Hardy spoke in a chatty voice, eager to help, full of little details. He described the scene of the suicide, the position of the body, the condition of the car. There were photographs, if His Honor would like to see them. His Honor declined. They were completely irrelevant. Hardy produced a typed transcript of the 911 call made by Mark and offered to play the recording if His Honor would like to hear it. No, His Honor said. Then Hardy explained with great joy the capture of young Mark in the woods near the scene and of their ensuing conversations in his car, at the Sway trailer, en route to the hospital and over dinner in the cafeteria. He described his gut feelings that young Mark was not telling the complete truth. The kid's story was flimsy, and through skillful interrogation, with just the right touch of subtlety, he, Hardy, was able to poke all sorts of holes in it. The lies were pathetic. The kid said he and his brother stumbled upon the car in the dead body, that they did not hear any gunshots, that they were just a couple of kids playing in the woods, minding their own business, and somehow they found this body. Of course, none of Mark's story was true, and Hardy was quick to catch on. With great detail, Hardy described the condition of Mark's face, the swollen eye and puppy lip, the blood around the mouth. Kid said he'd been in a fight at school. Another sad little lie. After thirty minutes, Harry grew restless, and Fink took the hint. Reggie had no cross-examination, and when Hardy stepped down and left the room, there was no doubt that Mark Sway was a liar who tried to deceive the cops. Things would get worse. When His Honor had asked Reggie if she had any questions for Sergeant Hardy, she simply said, I've had no time to prepare for this witness. Macthune was called as the next witness. He gave his oath to tell the truth and sat in the witness chair. Reggie slowly reached into her briefcase and withdrew a cassette tape. She held it casually in her hand, and when Macthune glanced at her, she tapped it softly on her legal pad. He closed his eyes. She carefully placed the tape on the pad and began tracing its edges with her pen. Fink was quick, to the point, and by now fairly adept at avoiding even vaguely routine questions. It was a new experience for him, this efficient use of words, and the more he did it, the more he liked it. Macthune was as dry as cornmeal. He explained the fingerprints they found all over the car, and on the gun, and the bottle, and on the rear bumper. He speculated about the kids and the garden hose, and showed Harry the Virginia Slim cigarette butts found under the tree. He also showed Harry the suicide note left behind by Clifford, and again gave his thoughts about the additional words— added by a different pen. He showed Harry the big pen found in the car and said there was no doubt Mr. Clifford had used this pen to scroll these words. He talked about the speck of blood found on Clifford's hand. It wasn't Clifford's blood, but was of the same type as Mark Sway's, who just happened to have a busted lip and a couple of wounds from the affair. "'You think Mr. Clifford struck the child at some point during all this?' Harry asked. "'I think so, Your Honor.' Macthune's thoughts and opinions and speculations were objectionable, but Reggie kept quiet. 
She'd been through many of these hearings with Harry, and she knew he would hear it all and decide what to believe. Objecting would do no good. Harry asked how the FBI obtained a fingerprint from the child to match those found in the car. Macthune took a deep breath and told about the Sprite can at the hospital, but was quick to point out that they were not investigating the child as a suspect when this happened, just as a witness, and so, therefore, they felt it was okay to lift the print. Harry didn't like this at all, but said nothing. Macthune emphasized that if the child had been an actual suspect, they would never have dreamed of stealing a print. Never. Of course you wouldn't, Harry said, with enough sarcasm to make Macthune blush. Fink walked him through the events of Tuesday, the day after the suicide, when young Mark hired a lawyer. They tried desperately to talk with him, then to his lawyer, and things just deteriorated. Macthune behaved himself and stuck to the facts. He left the room in a quick dash for the door, and he left behind the undeniable fact that young Mark was quite a liar. From time to time, Harry watched Mark during the testimony of Hardy and Macthune. The kid was impassive, hard to read, preoccupied with an invisible spot somewhere on the floor. He sat low in his seat and ignored Reggie for the most part. His eyes were wet, but he was not crying. He looked tired and sad, and occasionally glanced at the witnesses when his lies were emphasized. Harry had watched Reggie many times under these circumstances, and she usually sat very close to her young clients and whispered to them as the hearings progressed. She would pat them, squeeze their arms, give reassurances, lecture them if necessary. Normally she was in constant motion, protecting her clients from the harsh reality of a legal system run by adults. But not today. She glanced at her client occasionally, as if waiting for a signal, but he ignored her. "'Call your next witness,' Harry said to Fink, who was resting on his elbows, trying not to stand. He looked at Ord for help, then at his honor. "'Well, Your Honor, this may sound a bit strange, but I'd like to testify next.' Harry ripped off his reading glasses and glared at Fink. "'You're confused, Mr. Fink. You're the lawyer, not the witness.' "'I know that, sir, but I'm also the petitioner, and I know this may be a bit out of order, but I think my testimony could be important.' "'Thomas Fink. Petitioner. Lawyer. Witness. You want to play bailiff, Mr. Fink? Maybe take down a bit of stenography? Perhaps wear my robe for a while?' This is not a courtroom, Mr. Fink. It's a theater. Why don't you just choose any role you like? Fink stared blankly at the bench without making eye contact with his honor. I can explain, sir, he said meekly. You don't have to explain, Mr. Fink. I'm not blind. You boys have rushed in here half-ass prepared. Mr. Fultrig should be here, but he's not, and now you need him. "'You figured you could throw together a petition, "'bring in some FBI brass, hook in Mr. Ord here, "'and I'd be so impressed I'd just roll over and do anything you asked. "'Can I tell you something, Mr. Fink?' "'Fink nodded. "'I'm not impressed. "'I've seen better work at high school mock trial competitions.' Half the first-year law students at Memphis State could kick your butt, and the other half could kick Mr. Fultrick's. Fink was not agreeing, but he kept nodding for some reason. Ord slid his chair a few inches away from Fink's. "'What about it, Miss Love?' Harry asked. "'Your Honor, our rules of procedure and ethics are quite clear. An attorney trying a case cannot participate in the same trial as a witness. It's simple.' She sounded bored and frustrated, as if everyone should know this. Mr. Fink? Fink was regaining himself. Your Honor, I would like to tell the court under oath certain facts regarding Mr. Clifford's actions prior to the suicide. I apologize for this request, but under the circumstances it cannot be helped. There was a knock on the door, and the bailiff opened it slightly. Marcia entered, carrying a plate covered with a thick roast beef sandwich and a tall plastic glass of iced tea. She sat it before his honor, who thanked her, and she was gone. It was almost one o'clock, and suddenly everyone was starving. 
the roast beef and horseradish and pickles and the side order of onion rings emitted an appetizing aroma that wafted around the room. All eyes were on the Kaiser roll, and as Harry picked it up to take a huge bite, he saw young Mark Sway watching his every move. He stopped the sandwich in midair and noticed that Fink and Ord and Reggie and even the bailiff were staring in helpless anticipation. Harry placed the sandwich onto the plate and slid it to one side. Mr. Fink, he said, jabbing a finger in Fink's direction, stay where you are. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. You'd better. You're now under oath. You have five minutes to tell me what's bugging you. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. You're so welcome. You see, Jerome Clifford and I were in law school together, and we knew each other for many years. We had many cases together, always on opposite sides, of course. Of course. After Barry Muldano was indicted, the pressure began to mount, and Jerome began acting strange. Looking back, I think he was slowly cracking up, but at the time, I didn't think much about it. I mean, you see, Jerome was always a strange one. I see. I was working on the case every day, many hours a day, and I talked to Jerome Clifford several times a week. We had preliminary motions and such, so I saw him in court occasionally. He looked awful. He gained a lot of weight and was drinking too much. He was always late for meetings, rarely bathed. Often he failed to return phone calls, which was unusual for Jerome. About a week before he died, he called me at home one night, really drunk, and rambled on for almost an hour. He was crazy. Then he called me at the office first thing the next morning and apologized, but he wouldn't get off the phone. He kept fishing around as if he was afraid he'd said too much the night before. At least twice he mentioned the boy at body, and I became convinced Jerome knew where it was. Fink paused to allow this to sink in, but Harry was waiting impatiently. Well, he called me several times after that, kept talking about the body. I led him on. I implied that he'd said too much when he was drunk. I told him that we were considering an indictment against him for obstruction of justice. Seems to be one of your favorites, Harry said dryly. Anyway, Jerome was drinking heavily and acting bizarre. I confessed to him that the FBI was trailing him around the clock, which was not altogether true, but he seemed to believe it. He grew very paranoid and called me several times a day. He'd get drunk and call me late at night. He wanted to talk about the body, but was afraid to tell everything. During our last phone conversation, I suggested that maybe we could cut a deal. If he'd tell us where the body was, then we'd help him bail out with no record, no conviction, nothing. He was terrified of his client, and he never once denied knowing where the body was. Your Honor, Reggie interrupted, this, of course, is pure hearsay and quite self-serving. There's no way to verify any of this. You don't believe me? Fink snapped at her. No, I don't. I'm not sure I do either, Mr. Fink, Harry said. Nor am I sure why any of this has any relevance to this hearing. My point, Your Honor, is that Jerome Clifford knew about the body, and he was talking about it, plus he was cracking up. I'll say he cracked up, Mr. Fink. He put a gun in his mouth. Sounds crazy to me. Fink sort of hung in the air with his mouth open, uncertain if he should say anything else. Any more witnesses, Mr. Fink? Harry asked. No, sir. We do, however, Your Honor, feel that due to the unusual circumstances of this case, the child should take the stand and testify. Harry ripped off the reading glasses again and leaned toward Fink. If he could have reached him, he might have gone for his neck. You what? We, uh, feel that... Mr. Fink, have you studied the juvenile laws for this jurisdiction? I have. Great. Will you please tell us, sir, under which code section the petitioner has the right to force the child to testify? I was merely stating our request. That's great. Under which code section is the petitioner allowed to make such a request? Fink dropped his head a few inches and found something on his legal pad to examine. This is not a kangaroo court, Mr. Fink. We do not create new rules as we go. The child cannot be forced to testify, same as any other criminal or juvenile court proceeding. Surely you understand this. 
Fink studied the legal pad with great intensity. Ten minute recess, his honor barked. Everyone out of the courtroom except Miss Love. Bailiff, take Mark to a witness room. Harry was standing as he growled these instructions. Fink, afraid to stand, but nonetheless trying, hesitated for a split second too long, and this upset the judge. Out of here, Mr. Fink, he said rudely, pointing to the door. Fink and Ord stumbled over each other as they clawed for the door. The court reporter and clerk followed them. The bailiff escorted Mark away, and when he closed the door, Harry unzipped his robe and threw it on a table. He took his lunch and set it on the table before Reggie. "'Shall we dine?' he said, tearing the sandwich into two and placing half of it on a napkin for her. He slid the onion rings next to her legal pad. She took one and nibbled around the edges. "'Are you going to allow the kid to testify?' he asked, with a mouth full of roast beef. "'I don't know, Harry. What do you think?' "'I think Fink's a dumbass. That's what I think.' Reggie took a small bite of the sandwich and wiped her mouth. "'If you put him on,' Harry said, crunching, "'Fink will ask him some very pointed questions "'about what happened in the car with Clifford. "'I know. That's what worries me. "'How will the kid answer the questions?' "'I honestly don't know. "'I've advised him fully. "'We've talked about it at length, "'and I have no idea what he'll do.' "'Harry took a deep breath "'and realized the iced tea was still on the bench. "'He took two paper cups from Fink's table "'and poured them full of tea.' It's obvious, Reggie, that he knows something. Why did he tell so many lies? He's a kid, Harry. He was scared to death. He heard more than he should have. He saw Clifford blow his brains out. It scared him to death. Look at his poor little brother. It was a terrible thing to witness, and I think Mark initially thought he might get in trouble, so he lied. I don't really blame him, Harry said, taking an onion ring. Reggie bit into a pickle. "'What are you thinking?' she asked. "'He wiped his mouth and thought about this for a long time. "'The child was now his, one of Harry's kids, "'and each decision from now on would be based on what was best for Mark's way. "'If I can assume the child knows something very relevant "'to the investigation in New Orleans, then several things might happen. First, if you put him on the stand and he gives the information Fink wants, then this matter is closed as far as my jurisdiction is concerned. The kid walks out of here, but he's in great danger. Second, if you put him on the stand and he refuses to answer Fink's questions, then I will be forced to make him answer. If he refuses, you'll be in contempt. He cannot remain silent if he has crucial information. Either way, if this hearing is concluded here today without satisfactory answers by the child, I strongly suspect Mr. Foltrig will move quickly. He'll get a grand jury subpoena for Mark, and away you go to New Orleans. If he refuses to talk to the grand jury, he'll certainly be held in contempt by the federal judge, and I suspect he'll be incarcerated. Reggie nodded. She was in complete agreement. So, what do we do, Harry? If the kid goes to New Orleans, I lose control of him. I'd rather keep him here. If I were you, I'd put him on the stand and advise him not to answer the crucial questions, at least not for now. He can always do it later. He can do it tomorrow or the next day. I'd advise him to withstand the pressure from the judge and keep his mouth shut, at least for now. He'll go back to our juvenile detention center, which is probably much safer than anything in New Orleans. By doing this, you protect the child from the New Orleans thugs who scare even me until the feds can arrange something better. Then you buy yourself some time to see what Mr. Foltrig will do in New Orleans. You think he's in great danger? Yes. And even if I didn't, I wouldn't take chances. If he spills his guts now, he could get hurt. I'm not inclined to release him today under any circumstances. What if Mark refuses to talk and Foltrick presents him with a grand jury subpoena? I won't allow him to go. Reggie's appetite was gone. She sipped her tea from the paper cup and closed her eyes. This is so unfair to this boy, Harry. He deserves more from the system. I agree. I'm open to suggestions. What if I don't put him on the stand? I'm not going to release him, Reggie, at least not today. 
maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day. This is happening awfully fast, and I suggest we take the safest route and see what happens in New Orleans. You didn't answer my question. What if I don't put him on the stand? Well, based on the proof I've heard, I'll have no choice but to find him to be a delinquent, and I'll send him back to Doreen. Of course, I could reverse myself tomorrow, or the next day. He is not a delinquent, maybe not. But if he knows something, and he refuses to tell, then he's obstructing justice. There was a long pause. How much does he know, Reggie? If you'll tell me, I'll be in a better position to help him. I can't tell you, Harry. It's privileged. Oh, of course it is, he said with a smile. But it's rather obvious he knows plenty. Yes, I guess it is. He leaned forward and touched her arm. Listen to me, dear. Our little pal is in a world of trouble, so let's get him out of it. I say we take it one day at a time, keep him in a safe place where we call the shots, and in the meantime start talking to the feds about their witness protection program. If that falls into place for the kid and his family, then he can tell these awful secrets and be protected. I'll talk to him. Chapter 25 Under the stern supervision of the bailiff, a man named Grinder, they were reassembled and directed to their positions. Fink glanced about fearfully, uncertain whether to sit, stand, speak, or crawl under the table. Ord picked at the cuticle on a thumb. Baxter McLemore had moved his chair as far away from Fink as possible. His honor sipped the remains of the tea and waited until all was still. On the record, he said in the general direction of the court reporter. Miss Love, I need to know if young Mark will testify. She was sitting a foot behind her client, and she looked at the side of his face. His eyes were still wet. Under the circumstances, she said, he doesn't have much of a choice. Is that a yes or a no? I will allow him to testify, she said, but I will not tolerate abusive questioning by Mr. Fink. Your Honor, please, Fink said, Quiet, Mr. Fink. Remember rule number one? Don't speak until spoken to. Fink glared at Reggie. A cheap shot, he snarled. Knock it off, Mr. Fink, Harry said. All was quiet. His honor was suddenly all warmth and smiles. Mark, I want you to remain in your seat next to your lawyer. "'Well, I ask you some questions.' "'Fink winked at Ord. "'Finally the kid would talk. "'This could be the moment. "'Raise your right hand, Mark,' his honor said, "'and Mark slowly obeyed. "'The right hand as well as the left was trembling. "'The elderly lady stood in front of Mark "'and properly swore him. "'He did not stand, but inched closer to Reggie. "'Now, Mark, I am going to ask you some questions.' If you don't understand anything, I ask, please feel free to talk to your lawyer, okay? Yes, sir. I'll try to keep the questions clear and simple. If you need a break to step outside and talk to Reggie, Miss Love, just let me know, okay? Yes, sir. Fink turned his chair to face Mark and sat like a hungry puppy awaiting his outpo. Ord finished his nails and was ready with his pen and legal pad. Harry reviewed his notes for a second, then smiled down at the witness. Now, Mark, I want you to explain to me exactly how you and your brother discovered Mr. Clifford on Monday. Mark gripped the arms of his chair and cleared his throat. This was not what he expected. He'd never seen a movie in which the judge asked the questions. We sneaked off into the woods behind the trailer park to smoke a cigarette, he began and slowly led to the point where Romy stuck the water hose in the tailpipe the first time and got in the car. "'What did you do then?' his honor asked anxiously. "'I took it out,' he said, and told the story about his trips through the weeds to remove Romy's suicide device. Although he told this before, once or twice to his mother and Dr. Greenway, and once or twice to Reggie, it had never seemed amusing to him." But as he told it now, the judge's eyes began to sparkle and his smile widened. He chuckled softly. The bailiff thought it was funny. 
The court reporter, always non-committal, was enjoying it. Even the old woman at the clerk's desk was listening with her first smile of the proceedings. But the humor turned sour as Mr. Clifford grabbed him, slapped him around, and threw him in the car. Mark relived this with a straight face, staring at the brown pumps of the court reporter. "'So you were in the car with Mr. Clifford before he died?' his honor asked cautiously, very serious now. "'Yes, sir.' "'And what did he do once he got you in the car?' He slapped me some more, yelled at me a few times, threatened me. And Mark told all that he remembered about the gun, the whiskey bottle, the pills. The small courtroom was deathly still, and the smiles were long gone. Mark's words were deliberate. His eyes avoided all others. He spoke as if in a trance. "'Did he fire the gun?' Judge Roosevelt asked. "'Yes, sir,' he answered, and told them all about it. When he finished this part of the story, he waited for the next question. Harry thought about it for a long minute. Where was Ricky? Hiding in the bushes. I saw him sneak through the weeds, and I sort of figured he'd remove the water hose again. He did, I found out later. Mr. Clifford kept saying he could feel the gas, and he asked me over and over if I could feel it. I said yes, twice, I think, but I knew Ricky'd come through. And he didn't know about Ricky. It was a throwaway question, irrelevant but asked because Harry couldn't think of a better one at the moment. No, sir. Another long pause. So you talked with Mr. Clifford while you were in the car? Mark knew what was coming, as did everyone in the courtroom, so he jumped in quickly in an attempt to divert it. Yes, sir. He was out of his mind, kept talking about floating off to see the Wizard of Oz, off to La La Land, then he would yell at me for crying, then he apologized for hitting me. There was a pause as Harry waited to see if he was finished. Is that all he said? Mark glanced at Reggie, who was watching him carefully. Fink inched closer. The court reporter was frozen. What do you mean? Mark asked, stalling. Did Mr. Clifford say anything else? Mark thought about this for a second and decided he hated Reggie. He could simply say no and the ball game was over. No, sir, Mr. Clifford did not say anything. He just rambled on like an idiot for about five minutes, then fell asleep, and I ran like hell. If he'd never met Reggie and had not heard her lecture about being under oath and telling the truth, then he would simply say no, sir, and go home or back to the hospital or wherever. Or would he? One day in the fourth grade, the cops put on a show about police work, and one of them demonstrated a polygraph. He wired up Joey McDermott, the biggest liar in the class, and they watched as the needle went berserk every time Joey opened his mouth. We catch criminals lying every time, the cop had boasted. With cops and FBI agents swarming around him, could the polygraph be far away? He lied so much since Romy killed himself, and he was really tired of it. Mark, I asked you if Mr. Clifford said anything else. Like what? Like, did he mention anything about Senator Boyd Boyette? Who? Harry flashed a sweet little smile, then it was gone. Mark, did Mr. Clifford mention anything about a case of his in New Orleans involving a Mr. Barry Muldano or the late Senator Boyd Boyette? A tiny spider was crawling next to the court reporter's brown pumps, and Mark watched it until it disappeared under the tripod. He thought about that damp polygraph again. Reggie said she would fight to keep it away from him, but what if the judge ordered it? The long pause before his response said it all. Fink's heart was laboring, and his pulse had tripled. Ah, ha, the little bastard does know. I don't think I want to answer that question, he said, staring at the floor, waiting for the spider to reappear. Fink looked hopefully at the judge. Mark, look at me, Harry said like a gentle grandfather. I want you to answer the question. Did Mr. Clifford mention Barry Muldano or Boyd Boyette? Can I take the Fifth Amendment? No. Why not? It applies to kids, doesn't it? Yes, but not in this situation. You're not implicated in the death of Senator Boyette. You're not implicated in any crime. 
Then why did you put me in jail? I'm going to send you back there if you don't answer my questions. I take the Fifth Amendment anyway. They were glaring at each other, witness and judge, and the witness blinked first. His eyes watered and he sniffed twice. He bit his lip, fighting hard not to cry. He clenched the armrests and squeezed until his knuckles were white. Tears dropped onto his cheeks, but he kept staring up into the dark eyes of the Honorable Harry Roosevelt. The tears of an innocent little boy. Harry turned to his side and pulled a tissue from a drawer under the bench. His eyes were wet, too. Would you like to talk to your attorney in private? he asked. We've already talked, he said in a fading voice. He wiped his cheeks with a sleeve. Fink was near cardiac arrest. He had so much to say, so many questions for this brat, so many suggestions for the court on how to handle this matter. This kid knew, damn it. Let's make him talk. Mark, I don't like to do this, but you must answer my questions. If you refuse, then you're in contempt of court. Do you understand this? Yes, sir. Reggie's explained it to me. And did she explain that if you're in contempt, then I can send you back to the juvenile detention center? Yes, sir. You can call it jail if you like. It doesn't bother me. Thank you. Do you want to go back to jail? Not really. But I have no place else to go. His voice was stronger and the tears had stopped. The thought of jail was not as frightening now that he'd seen the inside of it. He could tough it out for a few days. In fact, he figured he could take the heat longer than the judge. He was certain his name would appear in the paper again in the very near future, and the reporters would undoubtedly learn he was locked up by Harry Roosevelt for not talking, and surely the judge would catch hell for locking up a little kid who'd done nothing wrong. Reggie told him he could change his mind any time he got tired of jail. Did Mr. Clifford mention the name Barry Muldano to you? Take the fifth. Did Mr. Clifford mention the name Boyd Boyette to you? Take the fifth. Did Mr. Clifford say anything about the murder of Boyd Boyette? Take the fifth. Did Mr. Clifford say anything about the present location of the body of Boyd Boyette? Take the fifth. Harry removed his reading glasses for the tenth time and rubbed his face. You can't take the fifth, Mark. I just did. I'm ordering you to answer these questions. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Harry took a pen and began writing. Your Honor, Mark said, I respect you and what you're trying to do, but I cannot answer these questions because I'm afraid of what might happen to me and my family. I understand, Mark. But the law does not allow private citizens to withhold information that might be crucial to a criminal investigation. I'm following the law, not picking on you. I'm holding you in contempt. I'm not angry with you, but you leave me no choice. I'm ordering you to return to the juvenile detention center where you will remain as long as you're in contempt. How long will that be? It's up to you, Mark. What if I decide never to answer the questions? I don't know. Right now we'll take it one day at a time. Harry flipped through his calendar, found a spot, and made a note. We'll meet again at noon tomorrow, if that's agreeable with everyone. Fink was crushed. He stood and was about to speak when Ord grabbed his arm and pulled him down. Your Honor, I don't think I can be here tomorrow, he said. As you know, my office is in New Orleans and— Oh, you'll be here tomorrow, Mr. Fink. You and Mr. Fultrig together. You chose to file your petition here in Memphis in my court, and now I have jurisdiction over you. As soon as you leave here, I suggest you call Mr. Fultrick and tell him to be here at noon tomorrow. I want both petitioners, Fink and Fultrick, right here at twelve o'clock sharp tomorrow. And if you're not here, I'll hold you in contempt. And tomorrow it'll be you and your boss being hauled off to jail. Fink's mouth was open, but nothing came out. Ord spoke for the first time. Your Honor, I believe Mr. Fultrig has a hearing in federal court in the morning. Mr. Muldano has a new lawyer who's asking for a continuance, and the judge down there has set the hearing for tomorrow morning. Is that true, Mr. Fink? 
Yes, sir. Then tell Mr. Fultrig to fax me a copy of the judge's order setting the hearing for tomorrow. I'll excuse him. But as long as Mark is in jail for contempt, I intend to bring him back here every other day to see if he wants to talk. I'll expect both petitioners to be here. That's quite a hardship on us, Your Honor. Not as hard as it's going to be if you don't show up. You pick this for him, Mr. Fink. Now you got to live with it. Fink had flown to Memphis six hours earlier without a toothbrush or change of underwear. Now it appeared as though he might be forced to lease an apartment with bedrooms for himself and Fultrick. The bailiff had eased his way to the wall behind Reggie and Mark and was watching his honor and waiting for a signal. Mark, I'm going to excuse you now, Harry said, scribbling on a form, and I'll see you again tomorrow. If you have any problems in the detention center, you will inform me tomorrow and I'll take care of it, okay? Mark nodded. Reggie squeezed his arm and said, I'll talk to your mother and I'll come see you in the morning. Tell Mom I'm fine, he whispered in her ear. I'll try and call it tonight. He stood and left with the bailiff. Send in those FBI people, Harry said to the bailiff as he was closing the door. Are we excused, Your Honor? Fink asked. There was sweat on his forehead. He was anxious to leave this room and call Fultrig with the horrible news. What's the hurry, Mr. Fink? Uh, no hurry, Your Honor. Then relax. I want to talk off the record with you boys and the FBI people. Just take a minute. Harry excused the court reporter and the old woman. Macthune and Lewis entered and took their seats behind the lawyers. Harry unzipped his robe but did not remove it. He wiped his face with a tissue and sipped the last of the tea. They watched and waited. I do not intend to keep this child in jail, he said, looking at Reggie. Maybe for a few days, but not long. It's apparent to me that he has some crucial information, and he's duty-bound to divulge it. Fink started nodding. He's scared, and we can all certainly understand that. Perhaps we can convince him to talk, if we can guarantee his safety and that of his mother and brother. I'd like for Mr. Lewis to help us on this. I'm open to suggestions. K.O. Lewis was ready. Your Honor, we've taken preliminary steps to place him in our witness protection program. I've heard of it, Mr. Lewis, but I'm not familiar with the details. It's quite simple. We move the family to another city. We provide new identities. We find a good job for the mother and get them a nice place to live. Not a trailer or an apartment, but a house. We make sure the boys are in a good school. There's some cash up front, and we stay close by. Sounds tempting, Miss Love, Harry said. It certainly did. At the moment, the Sways had no home. Diane worked in a sweatshop. There were no relatives in Memphis. They're not mobile right now, she said. Ricky is confined to the hospital. We've already located a children's psychiatric hospital in Portland that can take him right away, Lewis explained. It's a private one, not a charity outfit like St. Peter's, and it's one of the best in the country. They'll take him whenever we ask, and, of course, we'll pay for it. After he's released, we'll move the family to another city. How long will it take to place the entire family into the program? Harry asked. Less than a week, Lewis answered. Director Voyles has given it top priority. The paperwork takes a few days. New driver's license, social security numbers, birth certificates, credit cards, things like this. The family has to make the decision to do it, and the mother must tell us where she wants to go. We'll take over from there. What do you think, Miss Love? Harry asked. Will Miss Sway go for it? I'll talk to her. She's under enormous stress right now. One kid in a coma, the other in jail, and she lost everything in the fire last night. The idea of running away in the middle of the night could be a hard sell, at least for now. But you'll try. I'll see. Do you think she could be in court tomorrow? I'd like to talk to her. I'll ask the doctor. Good. This meeting is adjourned. I'll see you folks at noon tomorrow. The bailiff handed Mark to two Memphis policemen in plain clothes, and they took him through a side door into the parking lot. When they were gone, the bailiff climbed the stairs to the second floor and darted into an empty restroom. Empty, except for Slick Moeller. They stood before the urinals side by side and stared at the graffiti. Are we alone? asked the bailiff. Yep, what happened? Slick had unzipped his pants and had both hands on his waist. 
Be quick. Kid wouldn't talk, so he's going back to jail. Contempt. What does he know? I'd say he knows everything. It's rather obvious. He said he was in the car with Clifford. They talked about this and that, and when Harry pressed him on the New Orleans stuff, the kid took the Fifth Amendment. Tough little bastard. But he knows. Oh, sure. But he's not telling. Judge wants him back tomorrow at noon to see if a night in the slammer changes his mind. Slick zipped his pants and stepped away from the urinal. He took a folded $100 bill from his pocket and handed it to the bailiff. You didn't hear it from me, the bailiff said. You trust me, don't you? Of course. And he did. Mole Moeller never revealed a source. Moeller had three photographers poised at various places around the juvenile court building. He knew the routines better than the cops themselves, and he figured they'd use the side door near the loading dock for a quick getaway with the kid. That's exactly what they did, and they almost made it to their unmarked car before a heavy woman in fatigues jumped from a parked van and nailed them straight on with a Nikon. The cops yelled at her and tried to hide the kid behind them, but it was too late. They rushed him to their car and pushed him into the back seat. Just great, thought Mark. It was not yet 2 p.m., and so far this day had brought the burning of their trailer, his arrest at the hospital, his new home at the jail, a hearing with Judge Roosevelt, and now another damn photographer shooting at him for what would undoubtedly be another front-page story. As the car squealed tires and raced away, he sunk low in the back seat. His stomach ached, not from hunger, but from fear. He was alone again. Chapter 26 Fultrig watched the traffic on Poydras Street and waited on the call from Memphis. He was tired of pacing and checking his watch. He had tried to return phone calls and dictate letters, but it was hopeless. His mind could not leave the wonderful image of Mark Sway sitting in a witness chair somewhere in Memphis, telling all his splendid secrets. Two hours had passed since the hearing was scheduled to start, and surely they'd take a recess along the way so Fink could dash to a phone and call him. Larry Truman was on standby waiting for the call so they could swing into action with a posse of corpse hunters. They'd become quite proficient in digging for bodies during the past eight months. They just hadn't found any. But today would be different. Roy would take the call, walk to Truman's office, and off they'd go to find the late boy Boyette. Fultrick talked to himself, not a whisper or a mumble, but a full-blown speech in which he addressed the media with the thrilling announcement that, yes, they had indeed found the senator, and, yes, he died of six bullet wounds to the head. The gun was a twenty-two, and the bullet fragments were definitely, without the slightest doubt, fired from the same handgun that had been so meticulously traced to the defendant, Mr. Barry Maldano. It would be a wonderful moment, this press conference. Someone knocked slightly, and the door opened before Roy could turn around. It was Wally Box, the only person allowed such casual entries. "'Heard anything?' Wally asked, walking to the window and standing next to his boss. "'No, not a word. I wish Fink would get to a phone. He has specific orders.' They stood in silence and watched the street. "'What's the grand jury doing?' Roy asked. "'The usual routine indictments. Who's in there?' Hoover. He's finishing up with the drug bust in Gretna. Should be through this afternoon. Are they scheduled to work tomorrow? No, they've had a hard week. We promised them yesterday they could take off tomorrow. What are you thinking? Fultrig shifted weight slightly and scratched his chin. His eyes had a far away look, and he watched the cars below him but didn't see them. Heavy thinking was sometimes painful for him. Think about this. If for some reason the kid doesn't talk, and if Fink drills a dry hole with a hearing, what do we do then? I say we go to the grand jury, get subpoenas for both the kid and his lawyer, and drag them down here. The kid's got to be scared right now, and he's still in Memphis. He'll be terrified when he has to come here. Why would you subpoena his lawyer? The scare up, pure harassment, shake them both up. We get the subpoenas today, keep them sealed, sit on them until late tomorrow afternoon when everything's closed for the weekend. Then we serve the kid and his lawyer. The subpoenas will require their presence before our grand jury at 10 a.m. Monday morning. They won't have a chance to run to court and quash the subpoenas because it's the weekend and everything's shut down and all the judges are out of town. 
They'll be too scared not to show up here Monday morning on our turf, Wally. Right down the hole here in our building. What if the kid doesn't know anything? Roy shook his head in frustration. They'd had this conversation a dozen times in the last 48 hours. I thought that was established. Maybe, and maybe the kid's talking right now. He probably is. A secretary squeaked through on the intercom and announced that Mr. Fink was holding on line one. Fultrig walked to his desk and grabbed the phone. Yes. The hearing's over, Roy, Fink reported. He sounded relieved and tired. Fultrig hit the switch for the speakerphone and fell into his chair. Wally perched his tiny butt on the corner of the desk. Wally is here with me, Tom. Tell us what happened. Nothing much. The kid's back in jail. He wouldn't talk, so the judge found him in contempt. What do you mean he wouldn't talk? He wouldn't talk. The judge handled both the direct and cross-examinations, and the kid admitted being in the car and talking with Clifford. But when the judge asked questions about Boyette and Moldano, the kid took the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment? That's right. He wouldn't budge. Said jail wasn't so bad after all, and then he had no other place to go. But he knows, doesn't it, Tom? The little punk knows. Oh, there's no question about it. Clifford told him everything. Fultrig slapped his hands together. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I've been telling you boys this for three days now. He jumped to his feet and squeezed his hands together. I knew it. Fink continued. The judge has scheduled another hearing for noon tomorrow. He wants the kid brought back in to see if he's changed his mind. I'm not too optimistic. I want you at that hearing, Tom. Yes, and the judge wants you too, Roy. I explained you had a hearing on the continuance motion in the morning, and he insisted that you fax him a copy of the hearing order. He said he'd excuse you under those circumstances. Is he some kind of nut? No, he's not a nut. He said he plans to hold these little hearings quite often next week, and he expects both of us as petitioners to be there. Then he is a nut. Wally rolled his eyes and shook his head. These local judges could be such fools. After the hearing, the judge talked to us about placing the kid and his family in witness protection. He thinks he can convince the kid to talk if we can guarantee his safety. That could take weeks. I think so, too, but K.O. told the judge it could be done in a matter of days. Frankly, Roy, I don't think the kid will talk until we can make some guarantees. He's a tough little guy. What about his lawyer? She played it cool, didn't say much, but she and the judge are pretty tight. I got the impression the kid's getting a lot of advice. She's no dummy. Wally just had to say something. Tom, it's me, Wally. What do you think will happen over the weekend? Who knows? As I said, I don't think this kid will change his mind overnight, and I don't think the judge plans to release him. The judge knows about Gronky and the Waldano boys, and I get the impression he wants the kid locked up for his own protection. Tomorrow is Friday, so it looks like the kid will stay where he is over the weekend, and I'm sure the judge will call us back in on Monday for another chat. Are you coming in, Tom? Roy asked. Yeah, I'll catch a flight out in a couple of hours and fly back here in the morning. Fink's voice was now very tired. I'll be waiting for you here tonight, Tom. Good work. Yeah. Fink faded away, and Roy hit the switch. Get the grand jury ready, he snapped at Wally, who bounced off the desk and headed for the door. Tell Hoover to take a break. This won't take but a minute. Get me the Mark Sway file. Inform the clerk that the subpoenas will be sealed until they are served late tomorrow. Wally was walking through the door and gone. Fultrig returned to the window, mumbling to himself, I knew it. I just knew it. The cop in the suit signed Doreen's clipboard and left with his partner. Follow me, she said to Mark, as if he'd sinned again and her patience was wearing thin. He followed her, watching her wide rear end rock from side to side in a pair of tight black polyester pants. A thick, shiny belt squeezed her narrow waist and held an assortment of key rings, two black boxes, which he assumed to be pagers, and a pair of handcuffs. No gun. Her shirt was official white with markings up and down the sleeves and gold trim around the collar. The hall was empty as she opened his door and motioned for him to return to his little room. She followed him in and eased around the walls like a dope dog sniffing at the airport. "'Sort of surprised to see you back here,' she said, inspecting the toilet. 
He could think of nothing to say to this, and he was not in the mood for a conversation. As he watched her stoop and bend, he thought about her husband serving thirty years for bank robbery, and if she insisted on chatting, he might just bring this up. That would quiet her down and send her on her way. "'Must have upset Judge Roosevelt,' she said, looking through the windows. "'I guess so. How long are you in for?' "'He didn't say. I have to go back tomorrow.' She walked to the bunks and began patting the blanket. "'I've been reading about you and your little brother. Pretty strange case. How's he doing?' Mark stood by the door, hoping she would just go away. "'He's probably going to die,' he said sadly. "'No. Yeah, it's awful. He's in a coma, you know, sucking his thumb, grunting and slobbering every now and then. His eyes are rolled back into his head. Won't eat. I'm sorry I asked. Her heavily decorated eyes were wide open, and she'd stopped touching everything. Yeah, I'll bet you're sorry you asked, Mark thought. I need to be there with him, Mark said. My mom's there, but she's all stressed out, taking a lot of pills, you know. I'm so sorry. It's awful. I've been feeling dizzy myself. Who knows? I could end up like my brother. Can I get you anything? No, I just need to lie down. He walked to the bottom bunk and fell into it. Doreen knelt beside him, deeply troubled now. Anything you want, honey, you just let me know, okay? Okay. Some pizza would be nice. She stood and thought about this for a second. He closed his eyes as if in deep pain. I'll see what I can do. I haven't had lunch, you know. I'll be right back, she said, and she left. The door clicked loudly behind her. Mark bolted to his feet and listened to it. Good. Chapter 27 The room was dark as usual. The lights off, the door shut, the blinds drawn, the only illumination the moving blue shadows of the muted television high on the wall. Diane was mentally drained and physically beat from lying in bed with Ricky for eight hours, patting and hugging and cooing, and trying to be strong in this damp, dark little cell. Reggie had stopped by two hours ago, and they'd sat on the edge of the fold-away bed and talked for thirty minutes. She explained the hearing, assured her Mark was being fed and in no physical danger, described his room at the detention center because she'd seen one before, told her he was safer there than here, and talked about Judge Roosevelt and the FBI and their witness protection program. At first, and under the circumstances, the idea was attractive. They would simply move to a new city with new names and a new job and a decent place to live. They could run from this mess and start over. They could pick a large city with big schools, and the boys would get lost in the crowd. But the more she lay there curled on one side and stared above Ricky's little head at the wall, the less she liked the idea. In fact, it was a horrible idea, living on the run forever, always afraid of an unexpected knock on the door, always in a panic when one of the boys was late getting home, always lying about their past. This little plan was forever. What if, she began asking herself, one day, say five or ten years from now, long after the trial in New Orleans, some person she's never met lets something slip and it's heard by the wrong ears, and their trails are quickly traced. And when Mark is, say, a senior in high school, somebody waits on him after a ball game and sticks a gun to his head. His name wouldn't be Mark, but he would be dead nonetheless. She'd almost decided to veto the idea of witness protection when Mark called her from the jail. He said he'd just finished a large pizza, was feeling great, nice place and all, was enjoying it more than the hospital, food was better, and he chatted so eagerly, she knew he was lying. He said he was already plotting his escape and would soon be out. They talked about Ricky and the trailer and the hearing today and the hearing tomorrow. He said he was trusting Reggie's advice, and Diane agreed this was best. He apologized for not being there to help with Ricky, and she fought tears when he tried to sound so mature. He apologized again for all this mess. Their conversation had been brief. She found it difficult to talk to him. 
She had little motherly advice and felt like a failure because her 11-year-old son was in jail and she couldn't get him out. She couldn't go see him. She couldn't go talk to the judge. She couldn't tell him to talk or to remain quiet because she was scared too. She couldn't do a damned thing but stay here in this narrow bed and stare at the walls and pray that she would wake up and the nightmare would be over. It was 6 p.m., time for the local news. She watched the silent face of the anchor person and hoped it wouldn't happen, but it didn't take long. After two dead bodies were carried from a landfill, a black-and-white steel photo of Mark and the cop she'd slapped this morning was suddenly on the screen. She turned up the volume. The anchor person gave the basics about the taking of Mark's way, careful not to call it an arrest, then went to a reporter standing in front of the juvenile court building. He rattled on a few seconds about a hearing he knew nothing about, gushed breathlessly that the child Mark Sway had been taken back to the juvenile detention center and that another hearing would be held tomorrow in Judge Roosevelt's courtroom. Back in the studio, the anchor person brought him up to date on young Mark and the tragic suicide of Jerome Clifford. They ran a quick clip of the mourners leaving the chapel that morning in New Orleans and had a second or two of Roy Fultrig talking to a reporter under an umbrella. Back quickly to the anchor person who began quoting Slick Moller's stories and the suspicion mounted. No comments from the Memphis police, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, or the Shelby County Juvenile Court. The ice got thinner as she skated into the vast murky world of unnamed sources, all of whom were short on facts but long on speculation. When she mercifully finished and broke for a commercial, the uninformed could easily believe that young Mark Sway had shot not only Jerome Clifford but Boyd Boyette as well. Diane's stomach ached and she hit the power button. The room was even darker. She had not taken a single bite of food in ten hours. Ricky twitched and grunted and this irritated her. She eased from the bed, frustrated with him, frustrated with Greenway for the lack of progress, sick of this hospital with its dungeon-like decor and lighting, horrified at a system that allowed children to be jailed for being children, and above all, scared of these lurking shadows who'd threatened Mark and burned the trailer and obviously were quite willing to do more. She closed the bathroom door behind her, sat on the edge of the bathtub and smoked a Virginia Slim. Her hands trembled and her thoughts were a blur. A migraine was forming at the base of her skull and by midnight she would be paralyzed. Maybe the pills would help. She flushed the skinny cigarette butt and sat on the edge of Ricky's bed. She had vowed to get through this ordeal one day at a time, but damned if the days weren't getting worse. She couldn't take much more. Barry the Blade had picked this dumpy little bar because it was quiet, dark, and he remembered it from his teenage years as a young and aspiring hoodlum on the streets of New Orleans. It was not one he routinely frequented, but it was deep in the quarter, which meant he could park off Canal and dart through the tourists on Bourbon and Royal, and there was no way the feds could follow him. He found a tiny table in the back and sipped a vodka gimlet while waiting for Gronky. He wanted to be in Memphis himself, but he was out on bond, and his movements were restricted. Permission was required before he could leave the state, and he knew better than to ask. Communication with Gronky had been difficult. The paranoia was eating him alive. For eight months now, every curious stare was another cop watching his every move. A stranger behind him on the sidewalk was another fibby hiding in the darkness. His phones were tapped, his car and house were bugged. He was afraid to speak half the time because he could almost feel the sensors and hidden mics. He finished the gimlet and ordered another one, a double. Gronky arrived twenty minutes late and crowded his bulky frame into a chair in the corner. The ceiling was seven feet above them. Nice place, Gronky said. How you doing? Okay, Barry snapped his fingers and the waiter walked over. Beer. Grolsch, Gronky said. Do they follow you? Barry asked. I don't think so. I've zigzagged through half the quarter, you know. What's happening up there? Memphis? No, Milwaukee, you dumbass, Barry said with a smile. What's happening with the kid? He's in jail and he ain't talking. They took him in this morning. Had some kind of hearing at lunch before the youth court, then took him back to jail. 
The bartender carried a heavy tray of dirty beer mugs through the swinging doors into the dirty, cramped kitchen, and when he cleared the doors, two FBI agents in jeans stopped him. One flashed a badge while the other took the tray. "'What the hell?' the bartender asked, backing to the wall, while staring at the badge just inches from the tip of his wide nose. "'FBI, need a favor," said Special Agent Scherf, calmly, all business. The other agent pressed forward. The bartender owned two felony convictions and had been enjoying his freedom for less than six months. He became eager. "'Sure, anything.' "'What's your name?' asked Scherf. Uh, "'Dole, Link Dole.' He'd used so many names over the years it was difficult keeping them straight. The agent inched forward even more, and Link began to fear an attack. "'Okay, Link. Can you help us?' Link nodded rapidly. The cook stirred a pot of rice with a cigarette barely hanging from his lips. He glanced their way once, but had other things on his mind. "'There are two men out there having a drink in the rear corner on the right side where the ceiling's low.' "'Yeah, okay, sure. I'm not involved, am I?' "'No, Link, just listen.' "'Sheriff pulled a matching set of salt and pepper shakers from his pocket. "'Put these on a tray with a bottle of ketchup. "'Go to the table, just routine, you know, "'and switch these with the ones sitting there now. "'Ask these guys if they want something to eat or another drink. "'You understand?' "'Link was nodding, but not understanding. "'Uh, what's in these?' "'Salt and pepper,' Sheriff said.' and a little bug that allows us to hear what these guys are saying. They're criminals, okay, Link, and we have them under surveillance. I really don't want to get involved, Link said, knowing full well that if they threatened even slightly, he'd bust his ass to get involved. Don't make me angry, Sheriff said, waving the shakers. Okay, okay. A waiter kicked open the swinging doors and shuffled behind them with a stack of dirty dishes. Link took the shakers. Don't tell anyone, he said, trembling. It's a deal, Link. This is our little secret. Now, is there an empty closet around here? Sheriff asked this while looking around the cramped and cluttered kitchen. The answer was obvious. There had not been an empty square foot in this dump in fifty years. Link thought a second or two, very anxious to help his new friends. No, but there's a little office right over the bar. Great, Link. Go exchange these, and we'll set up some equipment in the office. Link held them gingerly, as if they might explode, and returned to the bar. A waiter placed a heavy green bottle of Grolsch in front of Gronky and disappeared. The little bastard knows something, doesn't he? The blade said. Of course, otherwise this wouldn't be happening. Why would he get himself a lawyer? Why would he clam up like this? Gronky drained half his Grolsch with one thirsty gulp. Link approached them with a tray loaded with a dozen salt and pepper shakers and bottles of ketchup and mustard. "'Guys eating dinner?' he asked old business as he swapped the shakers and bottles on their table. Barry waved him off, Gronky said no, and Link was gone. Fewer than thirty feet away, Sheriff and three more agents crowded over a small desk and flipped open heavy briefcases. One of the agents grabbed earphones and stuck them to his head. He smiled. "'This kid scares me, man,' Barry said. "'He's told his lawyer, so that makes two more who know.' Yeah, but he ain't talking, Barry. Think about it. We got to him. I showed him the picture. We took care of the trailer. The kid's scared to death. I don't know. Is there any way to get to him? Not right now. I mean, hell, the cops have him. He's locked up. There are ways, you know. I doubt if security is tied to the jail for kids. Yeah, but the cops are scared, too. They're all over the hospital. Got guards sitting in the hallway. Fibbies dressed like doctors running all over the place. These people are terrified of us. But they can make him talk. They can put him in the mouse program, throw a bunch of money at his mother, hell, buy them a fancy new house trailer, maybe a double wide or something. I'm just nervous as hell, Paul. If this kid was clean, we would never heard about him. We can't hit the kid, Barry. Why not? Because he's a kid. Because everybody's watching him right now. Because if we do, a million cops will hound us to our graves. It won't work. What about his mother or his brother? Gronky took another shot of beer and shook his head in frustration. He was a tough thug who could threaten with the best of them, but unlike his friend, he was not a killer. This random search for victims scared him. He said nothing. What about his lawyer? Barry asked. Why would you kill her? Maybe I hate lawyers. Maybe it'll scare the kid so bad he'll go into a coma like his brother. I don't know. 
and maybe killing innocent people in Memphis is not such a good idea. The kid will just get another lawyer. We'll kill the next one, too. Think about it, Paul. This could do wonders for the legal profession, Barry said with a loud laugh. Then he leaned forward as if a terribly private thought hit him. His chin was inches from the salt shaker. Think about it, Paul. If we knock off the kid's lawyer, then no lawyer in his right mind would represent him. Get it? You're losing it, Barry. You're cracking up. Yeah, I know. But it's a great thought, ain't it? Smoker, and the kid won't talk to his own mother. What's her name? Raleigh or Ralphie? Reggie. Reggie Love. What the hell kind of name is that for a broad? Don't ask me. Barry drained his glass and snapped again for the waiter. What you saying on the phone, he asked, in low again, just above the shaker. Don't know. We couldn't go in last night. The blade was suddenly angry. You what? The wicked eyes were fierce and glowing. A man is doing it tonight if all goes well. What kind of place has you got? Small office in a tall building downtown. It should be easy. Sheriff pressed the earphone closer to his head. Two of his pals did likewise. The only sound in the room was a slight clicking noise from the recorder. Are these guys any good? Nance is pretty smooth and cool under pressure. His partner, Cal Sisson's a loose cannon, afraid of his shadow. I want the phones fixed tonight. It'll be done. Barry lit an unfiltered camel and blew smoke at the ceiling. Are they protecting the lawyer? He asked this as his eyes narrowed. Grunky looked away. I don't think so. Where does she live? What kind of place? She's got a cute little apartment behind her mother's house. She live alone? I think so. She'd be easy, wouldn't she? Break in, take her out, steal a few things. Just another house burglary gone sour. What do you think? Gronky shook his head and studied a young blonde at the bar. What do you think? Barry repeated. Yeah, it'd be easy. Then let's do it. Are you listening to me, Paul? Paul was listening, but avoiding the evil eyes. I'm not in the mood to kill anyone, he said, still staring at the blonde. That's fine. I'll get Perini to do it. Several years earlier, a detainee, as they're called in the juvenile detention center, a 12-year-old, died in the room next to Marx from an epileptic seizure. A ton of bad press and a nasty lawsuit followed. And though Doreen had not been on duty when it happened, she'd nonetheless been shaken by it. An investigation followed. Two people were terminated, and a new set of regulations came down. Doreen's shift ended at five, and the last thing she did was check on Mark. She'd stopped by on the hour throughout the afternoon and watched with growing concern as his condition worsened. He was withdrawing before her very eyes, saying less with each visit, just lying there in bed, staring at the ceiling. At five, she brought a county paramedic with her. Mark was given a quick physical and pronounced alive and well. Vital signs were strong. When she left, she rubbed his temples like a sweet little grandmother and promised to return bright and early tomorrow, Friday. And she sent more pizza. Mark told her he thought he could make it until then. He'd try to survive the night. Evidently, she left instructions because the next floor supervisor, a short, plump little woman named Telda, immediately knocked on his door and introduced herself. For the next four hours, Telda knocked repeatedly and entered the room, staring wildly at his eyes as if he were crazy and something was about to snap. Mark watched television, no cable, until the news started at ten, then brushed his teeth and turned off the lights. The bed was quite comfortable, and he thought of his mother trying to sleep on that rickety cot the nurses had rolled into Ricky's room. The pizza was from Domino's, not some leathery slab of cheese someone threw in a microwave, but a real pizza Doreen had probably paid for. The bed was warm, the pizza was real, and the door was locked. He felt safe, not only from the other inmates and the gangs and violence certain to be close by, but especially from the man with the switchblade who knew his name and had the picture the man who'd burned the trailer. He'd thought about this guy every moment of every hour since he dashed from the elevator early yesterday morning. He'd thought about him on Mama Love's porch last night and sitting in the courtroom this afternoon, listening to Hardy and Macthune. He'd worried about him hanging around the hospital where Diane was unaware. 
sitting in a parked car on 3rd Street in downtown Memphis at midnight was not Cal Sisson's idea of safe fun. But the doors were locked and there was a gun under the seat. His felony convictions forbade him from owning or possessing a firearm, but this was Jack Nance's car. It was parked behind a delivery van near Madison, a couple of blocks from the Sterrick building. There was nothing suspicious about the car. Traffic was light. Two uniformed cops on foot strolled along the sidewalk and stopped fewer than five feet from Cal. They stared at him. He glanced in the mirror and saw another pair. Four cops. One of them sat on the trunk and the car shook. Had the parking meter run out on him? No, he'd paid for an hour and been here less than ten minutes. Nance said it was a thirty-minute job. Two more cops joined the two on the sidewalk, and Cal started sweating. The gun worried him, but a good lawyer could convince his probation officer that the gun was not his. He was merely driving for Nance. An unmarked police car parked behind him, and two cops in plain clothes joined the others. Eight cops. One in jeans and a sweatshirt bent at the waist and stuck his badge to Cal's window. There was a radio on the seat next to his leg, and thirty seconds ago he should have punched the blue button and warned Nance, but now it was too late. The cops had materialized from nowhere. He slowly rolled down his window. The cop leaned forward, and their faces were inches apart. Evening, Cal. I'm Lieutenant Byrd, Memphis PD. The fact that he called him Cal made him shudder. He tried to remain calm. What can I do for you, officer? Where's Jack? Cal's heart stopped and sweat popped through his skin. Jack who? Jack who? Byrd glanced over his shoulder and smiled at his partner. The uniformed cops had surrounded the car. Jack Nance, your good friend. Where is he? I haven't seen him. Well, that's a coincidence. I haven't seen him either, at least not for the past 15 minutes. In fact, the last time I saw Jack was at the corner of Union and Second less than half an hour ago when he was getting out of this car here, and you drove away. And, surprise, here you are. Cal was breathing, but it was difficult. I don't know what you're talking about. Bird unlocked the door and opened it. Get out, Cal, he demanded, and Cal complied. Bird slammed the door and shoved him against it. Four of the cops surrounded him. The other three were looking in the direction of the Sterrick building. Bird was in his face. Listen to me, Cal. Accomplice to break in and enter and carry seven years. You have three prior convictions, so you'll be charged as a habitual offender. And guess how much time you're looking at? His teeth were chattering and his body was shaking. He shook his head no as if he didn't understand and wanted Bird to tell him. Thirty years, no parole. He rolled his eyes and slumped. His breathing was heavy. Now, Bird continued, very cool, very cruel. We're not worried about Jack Nance. When he finishes with Ms. Love's phones, we've got some boys waiting for him outside the building. He'll be arrested, booked, and in due course sent away. But we don't figure he'll talk much, you follow? Cal nodded quickly. But Cal... We figure you might want to cut a deal. Help us a little, know what I mean? He was still nodding, only faster. We figure you'll tell us what we need to know, and in return, we'll let you walk. Cal stared at him desperately. His mouth was open, his chest pounding away. Bird pointed to the sidewalk on the other side of Madison. You see that sidewalk, Cal? Cal took a long, hopeful look at the empty sidewalk. Yeah? he said eagerly. Well, it's all yours. Tell me what I want to hear, and you walk, okay? I'm offering you 30 years of freedom, Cal. Don't be stupid. Okay. When does Gronke return from New Orleans? In the morning, around 10. Where's he staying? Holiday in Crown Plaza. Room number. It's 782. Where are Bono and Perini? I don't know. Please, Cal, we're not idiots. Where are they? They're in 783 and 784. Who else from New Orleans is here? That's it. That's all I know. Can we expect more people from New Orleans? I swear, I don't know. Do they have any plans to hit the boy, his family, or his lawyer? It's been discussed, but no definite plans. I wouldn't be a part of it, you know. I know, Cal. Any plans to bug more phones? No. 
I don't think so. Just a lawyer. What about a lawyer's house? No, not to my knowledge. No other bugs or wires or phone taps? Not to my knowledge. No plans to kill anybody? No. If you're lying, I'll come get you, Cal. And it's 30 years. I swear it. Suddenly, Bird slapped him on the left side of his face, then grabbed his collar and squeezed it together. Cal's mouth was open and his eyes showed absolute terror. Who burned the trailer? Bird snarled at him as he pushed him harder against the car. Bono and Perini, he said without the slightest hesitation. Were you in on it, Cal? No, I swear. Any more fires planned? Not to my knowledge. Then what the hell are they doing here, Cal? They're just waiting, listening, you know, just in case they're needed for something else. Depends on what the kid does. Bird squeezed tighter. He showed him his teeth and twisted the collar. One lie, Cal, and I'm all over your ass, okay? I'm not lying, I swear, Cal said in a shrill voice. Bird turned him loose and nodded at the sidewalk. Go and sin no more. The wall of cops opened and Cal walked through them and into the street. He hit the sidewalk at full stride and was last seen jogging into the darkness. Chapter 28 Friday morning Reggie sipped strong black coffee in the darkness of pre-dawn and waited for another unpredictable day as counsel for Mark's way. It was a cool, clear morning, the first of many in September, and the first hint that the hot, sticky days of the Memphis summer were coming to an end. She sat in a wicker rocker on the small balcony stuck to the rear of her apartment and tried to unscramble the past five hours of her life. The cops had called her at one thirty and said there was an emergency at her office and asked her to come down. She'd called Clint, and together they'd gone to her office where a half-dozen cops were waiting. They had allowed Jack Nance to finish his dirty work and leave the building before they nailed him. They showed Reggie and Clint the three phones and the tiny transmitters glued into the receivers, and they said Nance did pretty good work. As she watched, they carefully removed the transmitters and kept them for evidence. They explained how Nance entered, and more than once they commented on her lack of security. She said she wasn't that concerned about security. There were no real assets in the office. She checked her files, and everything appeared to be in order. The Mark Sway file was in her briefcase at home, and she kept it there when she slept. Clint examined his desk and said there was a chance Nance went through his files, but Clint's desk was not well organized to begin with, so he couldn't be certain. The police had known Nance was coming, they had explained, but they wouldn't say how they knew. He was allowed easy access into the building, unlocked doors, absent security guards, etc., and they had a dozen men watching him. He was in custody now and so far had said nothing. One cop had taken her aside and in hushed confidence explained about Nance's connection to Gronky and to Bono and Perini. They had been unable to find the latter two. Their hotel rooms had been abandoned. Gronky was in New Orleans and they had him under surveillance. Nance would serve a couple of years, maybe more. For an instant she had wanted the death penalty. The cops had gradually left. Around three, she and Clint were left alone with the empty offices and the startling knowledge that a professional had entered in ladies' traps. A man hired by killers had been there, gathering information so there could be more killings if necessary. The place made her nervous, and she and Clint had left shortly after the cops and found a coffee shop in Midtown. And so, with three hours sleep and a nerve-wracking day about to begin, she sipped her coffee and watched the eastern sky turn orange. She thought about Mark and how he'd arrived in her office on Wednesday, barely two days ago, wet from the rain and scared to death, and told her about being threatened by a man with a switchblade. This man was big and ugly and waved the knife and produced a photo of the Sway family. She listened with horror as this small, shivering child described the switchblade. It was a frightening event to hear about, but it had happened to someone else. She was not directly involved. The knife was not pointed at her. But that was Wednesday, and this was Friday, and the same bunch of thugs had now violated her, and things were a hell of a lot more dangerous. Her little client was safely tucked away in a nice jail with security guards at his beck and call, and here she was, sitting alone in the darkness, thinking about Bono and Perini and who knew who else might be out there. 
Though it couldn't be seen from Mama Love's house, an unmarked car was parked in the street not far away. Two FBI agents were on guard just in case. Reggie had agreed to this. She pictured a hotel room, clouds of cigarette smoke hanging along the ceiling, empty beer bottles littering the floor, curtains drawn, and a small group of badly dressed hoodlums hovering over a small table listening to a tape recorder. She was on the tape recorder talking to clients, to Dr. Levin, to Mama Love, just chatting away as if everything were private. The hoods were bored for the most part, but occasionally one would chuckle and grunt. Mark didn't use her office phones, and the strategy of bugging them was ridiculous. These people obviously believed Mark knew about Boyette and that he and his lawyer were stupid enough to discuss this knowledge over the phone. The phone in the kitchen rang, and Reggie jumped. She checked her watch. 6.20. It had to be more trouble, because no one called at this hour. She walked inside and caught it after the fourth ring. Hello? It was Harry Roosevelt. Good morning, Reggie. Sorry to wake you. I was awake. Have you seen the paper? She swallowed hard. No. What is it? It's a front-page spread with two big pictures of Mark. One as he's leaving the hospital, under arrest, as it says, and the other as he's leaving court yesterday. Cops on both sides. Slick Mola wrote it, and he knows all about the hearing. He's got his facts straight for a change. He says Mark refused to answer my questions about his knowledge of Boyette and such, and then I found him in contempt and sent him to jail. Makes me sound like Hitler. But how does he know this? Cites unnamed sources. She was counting the people in the courtroom during the hearing. Was it Fink? I doubt it. Fink would have nothing to gain by leaking this, and the risks are too great. It has to be someone who's not too bright. That's why I said Fink. Good point. But I doubt it was a lawyer. I plan to issue a subpoena for Mr. Moller to appear in my court at noon today. I'll demand he give me his source or I'll throw him in jail for contempt. Wonderful idea. It shouldn't take long. We'll have Mark's little hearing afterward, okay? Sure, Harry. Listen, there's something you should know. It's been a long night. I'm listening, he said. Reggie gave him the quick version of the bugging of her office with particular emphasis on Bono and Perini and the fact that they had not been found. Good Lord, he said. These people are crazy. And dangerous. Are you scared? Of course I'm scared. I've been violated, Harry, and it's frightening to know they've been watching. There was a long pause on the other end. Reggie, I'm not going to release Mark under any circumstances, not today anyway. Let's see what happens over the weekend. He's much safer where he is. I agree. Have you talked to his mother? Yesterday. She was lukewarm on the idea of witness protection. It might take some time. Poor thing is nothing but ragged nerves. Work on her. Can she be present in court today? I'd like to see her. I'll try. See you at noon. She poured another cup of coffee and returned to the balcony. Axel slept under the rocker. The first light of dawn crept through the trees. She held the warm mug with both hands and tucked her bare feet under the heavy bathrobe. She sniffed the aroma and thought about how much she despised the press. So now the world would know about the hearing. So much for confidentiality. Her little client was suddenly more vulnerable. It was obvious now, the fact that he knew something he shouldn't know. If not, why wouldn't he simply have talked when the judge instructed him to? The game was growing more dangerous by the hour, and she, Reggie Love, attorney and counselor at law, was supposed to have all the answers and dispense perfect advice. Mark would look at her with those scared blue eyes and ask what to do next. How the hell was she supposed to know? They were after her, too. Doreen woke Mark early. She'd fixed blueberry muffins for him, and she nibbled on one and watched him with great concern. Mark sat in a chair, holding a muffin but not eating it, just staring blankly at the floor. He slowly raised the muffin to his mouth, took a tiny bite, then lowered it to his lap. Doreen watched every move. "'Are you okay, sweetheart?' she asked him. Mark nodded slowly. "'Oh, I'm fine,' he said in a hollow, hoarse voice. Doreen patted his knee, then his shoulder. Her eyes were narrow, and she was very troubled. "'Well, I'll be around all day,' she said as she stood and walked to the door, "'and I'll be checking on you.' 
Mark ignored her and took another small bite of his muffin. The door slammed and clicked, and suddenly he crammed the rest of it in his mouth and reached for another. He turned on the television, but with no cable he was forced to watch Bryant Gumble. No cartoons, no old movies, just Willard in a hat eating corn on the cob and sweet potato sticks. Doreen returned twenty minutes later. The keys jangled outside, the lock popped, and the door opened. "'Mark, come with me,' she said. "'You have a visitor.' He was suddenly still again, detached, lost in another world. He moved slowly. "'Who?' he said in that voice. "'Your lawyer.' He stood and followed her into the hallway. "'Are you sure you're okay?' she asked, squatting in front of him. He nodded slowly, and they walked to the stairs. Reggie was sitting in a small conference room, one floor below. She and Doreen exchanged pleasantries, old acquaintances, and the door was locked. They sat on opposite sides of a small round table. "'Are we buddies?' she asked with a smile. "'Yeah, I'm sorry about yesterday. You don't need to apologize, Mark. Believe me, I understand. Did you sleep well?' "'Yeah, much better than at the hospital. Doreen says she's worried about you. I'm fine.' I'm much better off than Doreen. Good. Reggie pulled a newspaper from her briefcase and placed the front page on the table. He read it very slowly. You've made the front page three days in a row, she said, trying to coax a smile. It's getting old. I thought the hearing was private. Supposed to be. Judge Roosevelt called me early this morning. He's very upset about the story. He plans to bring in the reporter and grill him about it. It's too late for that, Reggie. The story is right here in print. Everybody sees it. It's pretty obvious I'm the kid who knows too much. Right. She waited as he read it again and studied the pictures of himself. Have you talked to your mother? She asked. Yes, ma'am. Yesterday afternoon around five. She sounded tired. She is. I saw her before you called, and she's hanging in there. Ricky had a bad day. Yeah, thanks to those stupid cops. Let's sue them. Maybe later. We need to talk about something. After you left the courtroom yesterday, Judge Roosevelt talked to the lawyers and the FBI. He wants you, your mother, and Ricky placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program. He thinks it's the best way to protect you, and I tend to agree. What is it? The FBI moves you to a new location, a very secret one, far away from here, and you have new names, new schools, new everything. Your mother has a new job, one that pays a lot more than $6 an hour. After a few years there, they might move you again just to be safe. They'll place Ricky in a much better hospital until he's better. Government pays for everything, of course. Do I get a new bike? Sure. Just kidding. I saw this once in a movie, a mafia movie. This informant ratted on the mafia, and the FBI helped him vanish. He had plastic surgery. They found him a new wife. You know, the works. Sent him off to Brazil or someplace. What happened? It took them about a year to find him. They killed his wife, too. It was just a movie, Mark. You really have no choice. It's the safest thing to do. Of course, I have to tell them everything before they do all these wonderful things for us. That's part of the deal. The mafia never forgets, Reggie. You've watched too many movies, Mark, maybe so. But has the FBI ever lost a witness in this program? The answer was yes, but she couldn't cite a specific example. I don't know, but we'll meet with them, and you can ask all the questions you want. What if I don't want to meet with them? What if I want to stay in my little cell here until I'm twenty years old and Judge Roosevelt finally dies? Then can I get out? Fine. What about your mother and Ricky? What happens to them when he's released from the hospital and they have no place to go? They can move in with me. Doreen will take care of us. Damn, he was quick for an eleven-year-old. She paused for a moment and smiled at him. He glared at her. Listen, Mark, do you trust me? Yes, Reggie, I do trust you. You're the only person in the world I trust right now. So please, help me. There's no easy way out, okay? I know that. Your safety is my only concern. The safety of you and your family. Judge Roosevelt feels the same way. Now, it'll take a few days to work out the details of the witness program. The judge instructed the FBI yesterday to start working on it immediately, and I think it's the best thing to do. Did you discuss it with my mother? Yes. 
She wants to talk about it some more. I think she liked the idea. But how do you know it'll work, Reggie? Is it totally safe? Nothing is totally safe, Ma. There are no guarantees. Wonderful. Maybe they'll find us, maybe they won't. That'll make life exciting, won't it? Do you have a better idea? Sure. It's very simple. We collect the insurance money from the trailer. We'll find another one and we move into it. I keep my mouth shut and we live happily ever after. I don't really care if they ever find this body, Reggie. I just don't care. I'm sorry, Mark, but that can't happen. Why not? Because you happen to be very unlucky. You have some important information and you'll be in trouble until you give it up. And then I could be dead. I don't think so, Mark. He crossed his arms over his chest and closed his eyes. There was a slight bruise high on his left cheek and it was turning brown. This was Friday. He'd been slapped by Clifford on Monday, and though it seemed like weeks ago, the bruise reminded her that things were happening much too fast. The poor kid still bore the wounds of the attack. Where would we go? he asked softly, his eyes still closed. Far away. Mr. Lewis, with the FBI, mentioned a children's psychiatric hospital in Portland that's supposed to be one of the best. They'll place Ricky in it with the best of everything. Can't they follow us? The FBI can handle it. He stared at her. Why do you suddenly trust the FBI? Because there's no one else to trust. How long will all this take? There are two problems. The first is the paperwork and details. Mr. Lewis said it could be done within a week. The second is Ricky. It might be a few days before Dr. Greenway will allow him to be moved, so I'm in jail for another week. Looks like it. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, Reggie. I can handle this place. In fact, I could stay here for a long time if they leave me alone. They're not going to leave you alone. I need to talk to my mother. She might be at the hearing today. Judge Roosevelt wants her there. I suspect he'll have a meeting off the record with the FBI people and discuss the witness protection program. If I'm going to stay in jail, why have the hearing? In contempt matters, the judge is required to bring you back into court periodically to allow you to purge yourself of contempt. In other words, to do what he wants you to do. The law stinks, Reggie. It's silly, isn't it? Oftentimes, yes. I had a wild thought last night as I was trying to go to sleep. I thought, what if the body is not where Clifford said it is? What if Clifford was just crazy and talking out of his head? Have you thought about that, Reggie? Yes, many times. What of all this is a big joke. We can't take that chance, Mark. He rubbed his eyes and slid his chair back. He began walking around the small room, suddenly very nervous. So we just pack up and leave our lives behind, right? That's easy for you to say, Reggie. You're not the one who'll have the nightmares. You'll go on like nothing ever happened. You and Clint, Mama Love, nice little law office, lots of clients. But not us. We live in fear for the rest of our lives. I don't think so. But you don't know, Reggie. It's easy to sit here and say everything will be fine. Your neck's not on the line. You have no choice, Mark. Yes, I do. I could lie. It was just a motion for a continuance. Normally a rather boring and routine legal skirmish, but nothing was boring when Barry the Blade Muldano was the defendant and Willis Upchurch was the mouthpiece. Throw in the enormous ego of the Reverend Roy Fultrig and the press manipulation skills of Wally Box, and this innocuous little hearing for a continuance took on the air of an execution. The courtroom of the Honorable James Lamond was crowded with the curious, the press, and a small army of jealous lawyers who had more important things to do, but just happened to be in the neighborhood. They milled about and spoke in grave tones while keeping anxious eyes on the media. Cameras and reporters attract lawyers like blood attracts sharks. Beyond the railing that separated the players from the spectators, Fultrig stood in the center of a tight circle of his assistants and whispered, frowning as if they were planning an invasion. He was decked out in his Sunday best, dark three-piece suit, white shirt, red and blue silk tie, hair perfect, shoes shined to a glow. 
He faced the audience, but of course was much too preoccupied to notice anyone. Across the way, Moldano sat with his back to the gaggle of onlookers and pretended to ignore everyone. He was dressed in black. The ponytail was perfect and arched down to the bottom of his collar. Willis Upchurch sat on the edge of the defense table, also facing the press, while engaging himself in a highly animated conversation with a paralegal. If it was humanly possible, Upchurch loved the attention more than Fultrick. Moldano did not yet know of the arrest of Jack Nance eight hours earlier in Memphis. He did not know Cal Sisson had spilled his guts. He had not heard from either Bono or Perini, and he had sent Gronky back to Memphis this morning in complete ignorance of the night's events. Fultrig, on the other hand, was feeling quite smug. Based on the taped conversation gathered from the salt shaker, he would obtain on Monday indictments against Moldano and Gronky for obstruction of justice. Convictions would be easy. He had them in the bag. He had Moldano facing five years. But Roy didn't have the body. And trying Barry the Blade on obstruction charges would not generate anywhere near the publicity of a nasty murder trial, complete with color glossies of the decomposed corpse and pathologists' reports about bullet entries and trajectories and exits. Such a trial would last for weeks, and Roy would shine on the evening news every night. He could just see it. He'd sent Fink back to Memphis early this morning with the grand jury subpoenas for the kid and his lawyer, that should liven things up a bit. He should have the kid talking by Monday afternoon, and maybe with just a little luck he'd have the remains of Boyette by Monday night. This thought had kept him at the office until three in the morning. He strutted to the clerk's desk for nothing in particular, then strutted back, glaring at Muldano, who ignored him. The courtroom deputy stopped in front of the bench and yelled instructions for all to sit. Court was now in session, the Honorable James Lamond presiding. Lamond appeared from a side door and was escorted to the bench by an assistant carrying a stack of heavy files. In his early fifties, Lamond was a baby among federal judges. One of countless Reagan appointees, he was typical. All business, no smiles. Cut the crap and let's get on with it. He had been the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Louisiana immediately prior to Roy Fultrick, and he hated his successor as much as anyone. Six months after taking the job, Fultrig had embarked upon a speaking tour of the district, in which he presented charts and graphs to Rotarians and Civitans and declared with statistical evidence that his office was now much more efficient than it had been in prior years. Indictments were up, dope dealers were behind bars, public officials were running scared, crime was in trouble, and the public's interest was now being fiercely protected— because he, Roy Fultrig, was now the chief federal prosecutor in the district. It was a stupid thing to do, because it insulted Lamond and angered the other judges. They had little use for the reverend. Lamond gazed at the crowded courtroom. Everyone was seated. My goodness, he started. I'm delighted at the interest shown here today, but honestly, it's just a hearing on a simple motion. He glared at Fultrig, who sat in the middle of six assistants. Upchurch had a local lawyer on each side and two paralegals sitting behind him. The court is ready to proceed upon the motion of the defendant Barry Muldano for a continuance. The court notes that this matter is set for trial three weeks from next Monday. Mr. Upchurch, you filed the motion, so you may proceed. Please be brief. To the surprise of everyone, Upchurch was indeed brief. He simply stated what was common knowledge about the late Jerome Clifford and explained to the court that he had a trial in federal court in St. Louis beginning three weeks from Monday. He was glib, relaxed, and completely at home in this strange courtroom. A continuance was necessary, he explained, with remarkable efficiency, because he needed time to prepare a defense for what would undoubtedly be a long trial. He finished in ten minutes. How much time do you need? Lamond asked. "'Your Honor, I have a busy trial calendar, and I'll be happy to show it to you. "'In all fairness, six months would be a reasonable delay. "'Thank you. Anything else?' "'No, sir. Thank you, Your Honor.' "'Upchurch took his seat as Fultrig was leaving his "'and headed for the podium directly in front of the bench. "'He glanced at his notes and was about to speak when Lamond beat him to it. "'Mr. Fultrig, surely you don't deny that the defense is entitled to more time "'in light of the circumstances?' "'No, Your Honor, I don't deny this, but I think six months is entirely too much time. "'So how much would you suggest?' 
a month or two. You see, Your Honor, I, I'm not going to sit up here and listen to a haggle over two months or six or three or four, Mr. Fultrick. If you concede the defendant is entitled to a delay, then I'll take this matter under advisement and set this case for trial whenever my calendar will allow. Lamond knew Fultrick needed a delay worse than Muldano. He just couldn't ask for it. Justice must always be on the attack. Prosecutors are incapable of asking for more time. Well, yes, Your Honor, Fultrick said loudly, but it's our position that needless delays should be avoided. This matter has dragged on long enough. Are you suggesting this court is dragging its feet, Mr. Fultrick? No, Your Honor, but the defendant is. He's filed every frivolous motion known to American jurisprudence to stall this prosecution. He has tried every tactic, every— Mr. Fultrick, Mr. Clifford is dead. He can't file any more motions. And now the defendant has a new lawyer who, as I see it, has only filed one motion. Fultrick looked at his notes and started a slow burn. He had not expected to prevail in this little matter, but he certainly hadn't expected to get kicked in the teeth. "'Do you have anything relevant to say?' his honor asked, as if Fultrick had yet to say anything of substance. He grabbed his legal pad and stormed back to his seat. A rather pitiful performance. He should have sent an underling. "'Anything else, Mr. Upchurch?' Lamond asked. "'No, sir.' "'Very well. Thanks to all of you for your interest in this matter. Sorry it has been so brief. Maybe we'll do more next time. An order for a new trial setting will be forthcoming.' Lamond stood just minutes after he'd sat and was gone. The reporters filed out and, of course, were followed by Fultrig and Upchurch, who walked to opposite ends of the hallway and held impromptu press conferences. Chapter 29 Though Slick Moeller had reported jailhouse riots, rapes, and beatings, and though he'd stood on the safe side of the doors and bars, he'd never actually, physically, been inside a jail cell. And though this thought was heavy on his mind, he kept his cool and projected the aura of the sure-footed reporter and confident believer in the First Amendment. He had a lawyer on each side, high-paid studs from a hundred-man firm that had represented the Memphis press for decades— and they'd assured him a dozen times in the past two hours that the Constitution of the United States of America was his friend, and on this day would be his shield. Slick wore jeans, a safari jacket, and hiking boots, very much the weather-beaten reporter. Harry was not impressed with the aura being projected by this weasel, nor was he impressed with the silk-stocking, blue-blooded Republican mouthpieces who had never before darkened the doors to his courtroom. Harry was upset. He sat on his bench and read for the tenth time Slick's morning story. He also reviewed applicable First Amendment cases dealing with reporters and their confidential sources, and he took his time so Slick would sweat. The doors were locked. The bailiff, Slick's friend, Grinder, stood quite nervously by the bench. Following the judge's order, two uniformed deputies sat directly behind Slick and his lawyers and seemed poised and ready for action. This bothered Slick and his lawyers, but they tried not to show it. The same court reporter, with an even shorter skirt, filed her nails and waited for the words to start flowing. The same grouchy old woman sat at her table and flipped through the National Enquirer. They waited and waited. It was almost twelve-thirty. As usual, the docket was packed and things were behind schedule. Marcia had a club sandwich waiting for Harry between hearings. The Sway hearing was next. He leaned forward on his elbows and glared down at Slick, who at a hundred and thirty pounds weighed probably a third of what Harry did. On the record, he barked at the stenographer, and she started pecking away. Cool as he was, Slick jerked with these first words and sat upright. "'Mr. Moeller, I brought you here under summons because you violated a section of the Tennessee Code regarding the confidentiality of my proceedings.' This is a very grave matter because we're dealing with the safety and well-being of a small child. Unfortunately, the law does not provide criminal penalties, only contempt. He removed his reading glasses and began rubbing them with a handkerchief. Now, Mr. Moeller, he said like a frustrated grandfather, as upset as I am with you and your story, I am much more troubled by the fact that someone leaked this information to you. 
someone who was in this courtroom during the hearing yesterday. Your source troubles me greatly. Grinder leaned against the wall and pressed his calves against it to keep his knees from shaking. He would not look at Slick. His first heart attack had been only six years ago, and if he didn't control himself, this might be the big one. "'Please sit in the witness chair, Mr. Moeller. Harry instructed with a sweep of the hand. "'Be my guest.' Slick was sworn by the old grouch. He placed one hiking boot on one knee and looked at his attorneys for reassurance. They were not looking at him. Grinder studied the ceiling tiles. "'You are under oath, Mr. Moeller.' Harry reminded him just seconds after he'd been sworn. "'Yes, sir,' he uttered, and feebly attempted to smile at this huge man, who was sitting high above him and peering down over the railing of the bench. "'Did you, in fact, write the story in today's paper with your name on it?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Did you write it by yourself, or did someone assist you?' "'Well, Your Honor, I wrote every word, if that's what you mean. "'That's what I mean.' "'Now,' In the fourth paragraph of this story, you write, and I quote, Mark Sway refused to answer questions about Barry Moldano or Boyd Boyette, end quote. Did you write that, Mr. Moeller? Yes, sir. And were you present during the hearing yesterday when the child testified? No, sir. Were you in this building? Uh, yes, sir, I was. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Be quiet, Mr. Moeller. I'll ask the questions, and you answer them. Do you understand the relationship here? Yes, sir. Slick pleaded with his eyes to his lawyers, but both were deep into reading at this moment. He felt alone. So you weren't present. Now, Mr. Moeller, how did you learn that the child refused to answer my questions about Barry Moldano or Boyd Boyette? I had a source. Grinder had never thought of himself as a source. He was just a low-paid courtroom bailiff with a uniform and a gun and bills to pay. He was about to be sued by Sears for his wife's credit card. He wanted to wipe the sweat from his forehead, but was afraid to move. A source, Harry repeated, mocking Slick. Of course you had a source, Mr. Moeller. I assumed this. You weren't here. Someone told you. This means you had a source. Now who was your source? The lawyer with the grayest hair quickly stood to speak. He was dressed in standard, big, firm attire. Charcoal suit, white button-down, red tie, but with a daring yellow stripe on it, and black shoes. His name was Elephant. He was a partner who normally avoided courtrooms. "'Your Honor, if I may,' Harry grimaced, and he slowly turned from the witness. His mouth was open, as if he were shocked at this daring interruption. He scowled at Elephant, who repeated himself. "'If I may, Your Honor, Harry let him hang there for an eternity, then said, "'You haven't been in my courtroom before, have you, Mr. Elephant?' "'No, sir,' he answered, still standing. "'I didn't think so. Not one of your usual hangouts. "'How many lawyers are in your firm, Mr. Elephant?' "'A hundred and seven at last count.' Harry whistled and shook his head. That's a bunch of lawyers. Do any of them practice in juvenile court? Well, I'm sure some do, Your Honor. Which ones? Elephant stuck one hand in one pocket while running a loose finger along the edge of his legal pad. He did not belong here. His legal world was one of boardrooms and thick documents, of fat retainers and fancy lunches, he was rich because he billed $300 an hour and had 30 partners doing the same. His firm prospered because it paid 70 associates 50000 a year and expected them to bill five times that. He was here ostensibly because he was chief counsel for the paper, but actually because no one in the firm's litigation section could make the hearing on two hours' notice. Harry despised him, his firm, and their ilk. He did not trust the corporate types who came down from the tall buildings to mingle with the lower class only when necessary. They were arrogant and afraid to get their hands dirty. "'Sit down, Mr. Elephant,' he said, pointing. "'You do not stand in my courtroom. Sit.' Elephant awkwardly backed into his chair. "'Now, what are you trying to say, Mr. Elephant?' 
Well, Your Honor, we object to these questions, and we object to the court's interrogation of Mr. Moeller on the grounds that his story is protected free speech under the First Amendment of the Constitution. Now, Mr. Elephant, have you read the applicable code section dealing with closed hearings in juvenile matters? Surely you have. Yes, I have. And frankly, Your Honor, I have some real problems with this section. Oh, you do? Go on. Yes, sir. It's my opinion that this code section is unconstitutional as written. I have some cases here from other unconstitutional, Harry asked with raised eyebrows. Yes, sir, Elephant answered firmly. Do you know who wrote the code section, Mr. Elephant? Elephant turned to his associate as if he knew everything, but he shook his head. I wrote it, Mr. Elephant, Harry said loudly. Me, moi, yours truly. And if you knew anything about juvenile law in this state, you would know that I am the expert because I wrote the law. Now, what can you say about that? Slick slid down in his chair. He'd covered a thousand trials. He'd seen lawyers hammered by angry judges, and he knew their clients usually suffered. "'I contend it's unconstitutional, Your Honor,' Elephant said gallantly. "'And the last thing I intend to do, Mr. Elephant, is to get into a long, hot-air debate with you about the First Amendment. If you don't like the law, then take it up on appeal and get it changed. I honestly don't care.' But right now, while I'm missing lunch, I want your client to answer the question. He turned back to Slick, who was waiting in terror. Now, Mr. Mola, who was your source? Grinder was about to vomit. He stuck his thumbs under his belt and pressed against his stomach. By reputation, Slick was a man of his word. He always protected his sources. I cannot reveal my source, Slick said, in an effort at great drama. The martyr willing to face death, Grinder took a deep breath. Such sweet words. Harry immediately motioned for the two deputies. I find you in contempt, Mr. Mola, and order you to jail. The deputies stood beside Slick, who looked around wildly for help. Your Honor, Elephant said, standing without thinking, we object to this. You cannot, Harry ignored Elephant. He spoke to the deputies. Take him to the city jail. No special treatment, no favors. I'll bring him back Monday for another try. They yanked Slick up and handcuffed him. Do something, he yelled at Elephant, who was saying, This is protected speech, Your Honor. You can't do this. I'm doing it, Mr. Elephant, Harry yelled. And if you don't sit down, you'll be in the same cell with your client. Elephant dropped into his chair. They dragged Slick to the door, and as they opened it, Harry had one final thing to say. Mr. Moeller, if I read one word in your paper written by you while in jail, I'll let you sit there for a month before I bring you back. You understand? Slick couldn't speak. We'll appeal, Slick, Elephant promised as they shoved him through and closed the door. We'll appeal. Diane Sway sat in a heavy wood chair holding her oldest son, and watching the sunlight filter through the dusty broken blinds of witness room B. The tears were gone, and words had failed them. After five days and four nights of involuntary confinement in the psychiatric ward, she at first had been happy to leave it. But happiness these days came in tiny spurts, and now she longed to return to Ricky's bed. Now that she'd seen Mark and held him and cried with him, she knew he was safe. Under the circumstances, that was all a mother could ask. She didn't trust her instincts or judgments. Five days in a cave takes away any sense of reality. The endless series of shocks had left her drained and stunned. The drugs, pills to sleep and pills to wake up and pills to get through it, deadened the mind so that her life was a series of snapshots thrown on the table one at a time. The brain worked, but in slow motion. They want us to go to Portland, she said, rubbing his arm. Reggie you talk to you about it? Yes, we had a long talk yesterday. There's a good place for Ricky out there, and we can start over. Sounds good, but it scares me. Scares me too, Mark. 
I don't want to live the next forty years looking over my shoulder. I read a story one time in some magazine about a mafia informant who helped the FBI, and they agreed to hide him, just like they want us to do. I think it took two years before the mafia found him and blew him up in his car. I think I saw the movie. I can't live like that, Mark. Can we get another trailer? I think so. I talked to Mr. Tucker this morning, and he says he had the trailer covered with plenty of insurance. He said he had another one for us, and I still have my job. In fact, they delivered my paycheck at the hospital this morning. Mark smiled at the thought of returning to the trailer park and hanging out with the kids. He even missed school. These people are deadly, Mark. I know. I've met them. She thought for a second, then asked, You what? I guess it's something else I forgot to tell you. I'd like to hear it. It happened a couple of days ago at the hospital. I don't know which day. They're all running together. He took a deep breath. He told her about his encounter with the man and the switchblade and their family portrait. Normally, she or any mother would have been shocked. But for Diane, it was just another event in this horrible week. Why didn't you tell me? she asked. Because I didn't want to worry you. You know, we might not be in this trouble if you told me everything up front. Don't fuss at me, Mom. I can't take it. She couldn't take it either, so she dropped it. Reggie knocked on the door, and it opened. We need to go, she said. The judge is waiting. They followed her through the hall and around a corner. Two deputies trailed behind. Are you nervous? Diane whispered. No, it's no big deal, Mom. Harry was munching on the sandwich and flipping through the file when they entered the courtroom. Fink, Ord, and Baxter McLemore, the juvenile court prosecutor of the day, were all seated together at their table, all quiet and subdued, all bored, and waiting for what would undoubtedly be a quick appearance by the kid. Fink and Ord were captivated by the court reporter's legs and skirt. Her figure was obscene, tiny waist, healthy breasts, slender legs— she was the only redeeming element in this rinky-dink courtroom, and Fink had to admit to himself that he'd thought about her on the flight to New Orleans yesterday, and he'd thought about her all the way back to Memphis. She was not disappointing him. The skirt was at mid-thigh and inching upward. Harry looked at Diane and gave his best smile. His large teeth were perfect and his eyes were warm. "'Hello, Miss Way,' he said sweetly. She nodded and tried to smile. It is a pleasure meeting you, and I'm sorry it has to be under these circumstances. Thank you, Your Honor, she said softly to the man who'd ordered her son to jail. Harry looked at Fink with contempt. I trust everyone has read this morning's Memphis Press. It has a fascinating story about our proceedings yesterday, and the man who wrote the story is now in jail. I intend to investigate this matter further, and I am confident I will find the leak. Grinder by the door was suddenly ill again. And when I find it, I intend to fix it with a contempt order. So, ladies and gentlemen, keep your mouths shut. Not a word to anyone. He took the file. Now, Mr. Fink, where's Mr. Fultrick? Sitting firmly in place, Fink answered, "'He's in New Orleans, Your Honor. I have a copy of the court order you requested.' "'Fine. I'll take your word for it. Madam Clerk, swear the witness.' Madam Clerk threw her hand in the air and barked at Mark. "'Raise your right hand.' Mark stood awkwardly and was sworn. "'You can remain in your seat,' Harry said. Reggie was on his right, Diane on the left. "'Mark, I'm going to ask you some questions, okay?' "'Yes, sir.' Prior to his death, did Mr. Clifford say anything to you about a Mr. Barry Muldano? I'm not going to answer that. Did Mr. Clifford mention the name of Boyd Boyette? I'm not going to answer that. Did Mr. Clifford say anything about the murder of Boyd Boyette? I'm not going to answer that. Did Mr. Clifford say anything about the present location of the body of Boyd Boyette? I'm not going to answer that. Harry paused and looked at his notes. Diane had stopped breathing and was staring blankly at Mark. "'It's okay, Mom,' he whispered to her. "'Your Honor,' he said in a strong, confident voice, 
I want you to understand that I'm not answering for the same reasons I gave yesterday. I'm just scared, that's all. Harry nodded but gave no expression. He was neither angry nor pleased. Mr. Bailiff, take Mark back to the witness room and keep him there until we finish. He can talk to his mother before he's transported to the detention center. Grinder's knees were putty, but he managed to lead Mark from the courtroom. Harry unzipped his robe. Let's go off the record. Madam Clerk, you and Miss Gregg can go to lunch. It was not an offer, but a demand. Harry wanted fewer ears in the courtroom. Miss Gregg swung her legs toward Fink, and his heart stopped. He and Ord watched with their mouths open as she stood, took her purse, and pranced from the courtroom. Get the FBI, Mr. Fink, Harry instructed. Maxune and a weary K.O. Lewis were fetched and took seats behind Ord. Lewis was a busy man with a thousand important items stacked on his desk in Washington, and he'd asked himself a hundred times in the past twenty-four hours why he'd come to Memphis. Of course, Director Voyles wanted him here, which clarified his priorities immensely. Mr. Fink, you indicated before the hearing there is an urgent matter that I should know about. Yes, sir. Mr. Lewis would like to address it. Mr. Lewis, please be brief. Yes, Your Honor. We've had Barry Muldano under surveillance for several months, and yesterday we obtained, by electronic means, a conversation between Muldano and Paul Gronke. It took place in a bar in the French Quarter, and I think you need to hear it. You have the tape. Yes, sir. Then let it roll. Harry was suddenly unconcerned with time. Maxune quickly assembled a tape player and speaker on the desk in front of Fink, and Lewis inserted a microcassette. The first voice you'll hear is that of Muldano, he explained, like a chemist preparing a demonstration. Then Gronke. The courtroom was still and quiet as the scratchy but very clear voices squawked from the speaker. The entire conversation was captured. The suggestion by Muldano of hitting the kid and Gronky's doubts about getting to him. The idea of hitting the kid's mother or brother and Gronky's protests of killing innocent people. Muldano's talk of killing his lawyer and the laughter about it doing wonders for the legal profession. The boasting of Gronky about taking care of the trailer, and finally the plans to bug the lawyer's phones that night. It was chilling. Fink and Ord had heard it ten times already, so they were noncommittal. Reggie closed her eyes when the taking of her life was so nonchalantly bantered about. Diane was rigid with fear. Harry stared at the speaker as if he could see their faces, and when the tape was finished and Lewis punched the button, he simply said, Play it again. They listened to it the second time, and the shock began to wear off. Diane was trembling. Reggie held her arm and tried to be brave, but the easy talk of killing the kid's lawyer made her blood run cold. Diane's skin broke out in goose pimples, and her eyes began to water. She thought of Ricky, who at this moment was being watched by Greenway and a nurse, and prayed he was safe. I've heard enough, Harry said when the tape stopped. Lewis took his seat, and they waited for his honor to give direction. He wiped his eyes with a handkerchief, then took a long drink of iced tea. He smiled at Diane. Now, Miss Sway, do you understand why we've placed Mark in the detention center? I think so. Two reasons. The first is that he refused to answer my questions, but at the moment that's not nearly as important as the second. He's in great danger, as you've just heard. What would you like for me to do next? It was an unfair question posed to a scared, deeply troubled, and irrational person, and she didn't like him asking it. She just shook her head. I don't know, she mumbled. Harry spoke slowly, and there was no doubt he knew exactly what should be done next. Reggie has told me that she's discussed the witness protection program with you. Tell me what you think. Diane raised her head and bit her lip. She thought for a few seconds and tried to focus on the tape recorder. I do not want those people, she said deliberately, nodding at the recorder, following me and my children for the rest of our lives, and I'm afraid that will happen if Mark gives you what you want. You will have the protection of the FBI and every necessary agency of the U.S. government, but no one can completely guarantee our safety. 
These are my children, Your Honor, and I'm a single parent. There's no one else. If I make a mistake, I could lose... Well, I can't even imagine it. I think you'll be safe, Mrs. Sway. There are thousands of government witnesses now being protected. But some have been found, haven't they? It was a quiet question that hit hard. Neither Macthune nor Lewis could deny the fact that witnesses had been lost. There was a long silence. Well, Mrs. Sway, Harry finally said with a great deal of compassion, what's the alternative? Why can't you arrest these people? Lock them up somewhere. I mean, it looks as if they're just Roman free terrorizing me and my family, and also Reggie here. What are the damn cops doing? It's my understanding, Mrs. Sway, that one arrest was made last night. The police here are looking for the two men who burned your trailer, two thugs from New Orleans named Bono and Perini, but they haven't found them. Is that correct, Mr. Lewis? Yes, sir. We think they're still in the city, and I might add, Your Honor, that the U.S. attorney in New Orleans intends to indict Muldano and Gronke early next week on charges of obstruction of justice, so they'll be in custody very soon. But this is the mafia, isn't it? Diane asked. Every idiot who could read the newspapers knew it was the mafia. It was a mafia killing by a mafia gunman whose family had been mafia hoods in New Orleans for four decades. Her question was so simple, yet it implied the obvious. The mafia is an invisible army with plenty of soldiers. Lewis did not wish to answer the question, so he waited for his honor, who likewise hoped it would simply go away. There was a long, awkward silence. Diane cleared her throat and spoke in a much stronger voice. Your Honor, when you guys can show me a way to completely protect my children, then I'll help you, but not until then. So you want him to stay in jail, Fink blurted. She turned and glared at Fink, less than ten feet away. Sir, I'd rather have him in a detention center than in a grave. Fink slumped in his chair and stared at the floor. Seconds ticked away. Harry looked at his watch and zipped his robe. I suggest we meet again Monday at noon. Let's take things one day at a time. Chapter 30 Paul Gronke finished his unexpected trip to Minneapolis as the Northwest 727 lifted off the runway and started for Atlanta. From Atlanta, he hoped to catch a direct flight to New Orleans, and once home, he had no plans to leave for a long time, maybe years. Regardless of his friendship with Moldano, Gronke was tired of this mess. He could break a thumb or a leg when necessary, and he could huff and puff and scare almost anybody. But he did not particularly enjoy stalking little kids and waving switchblades at them. He made a nice living off his clubs and beer joints, and if the blade needed help, he'd just have to lean on his family. Gronky was not family, he was not mafia, and he was not going to kill anyone for Barry Muldano. He'd made two phone calls this morning as soon as his flight arrived at the Memphis airport. The first call spooked him because no one answered. Then he dialed a backup number for a recorded message, and again there was no answer. He walked quickly to the Northwest ticket counter and paid cash for a one-way ticket to Minneapolis. Then he found the Delta counter and paid cash for a one-way ticket to Dallas-Fort Worth. Then he bought a ticket to Chicago on United. He roamed the concourses for an hour, watching his back and seeing nothing, and at the last second hopped on Northwest. Bono and Perini had strict instructions. The two phone calls meant one of two things. Either the cops had them, or they were forced to pull up stakes and haul ass. Neither thought was comforting. The flight attendant brought two beers. It was a few minutes after one, too early to start drinking, but he was edgy. And what the hell, it was 5 p.m. somewhere. Muldano would flip out and start throwing things. He'd run to his uncle and borrow some more thugs. They'd descend upon Memphis and start hurting people. Finesse was not Barry's long suit. Their friendship had started in high school, in the 10th grade, their last year of formal education, before they dropped out and began hustling on the streets of New Orleans. Barry's route to crime was preordained by family. Gronke's was a bit more complicated. Their first venture had been a fencing operation that had been wildly successful. 
The profits, however, were siphoned off by Barry and sent to the family. They peddled some drugs, ran some numbers, managed a whorehouse, all cash-rich ventures, but Gronky saw little of the cash. After ten years of this lopsided partnership, he told Barry he wanted a place of his own. Barry helped him buy a topless bar, then a porno house. Gronky made money and was able to keep it. At about this point in their careers, Barry started his killing, and Gronky established more distance between them. But they remained friends. A month or so after Boyette disappeared, the two of them spent a long weekend at Johnny Solari's house in Acapulco with a couple of strippers. After the girls had passed out one night, they went for a long walk on the beach. Barry was drinking tequila and talking more than usual. His name had just surfaced as a suspect. He bragged to his friend about the killing. The landfill in the Fush Parish was worth millions to the Solari family. Johnny's scheme was to eventually route most of the garbage from New Orleans to it. Senator Boyette had been an unexpected enemy. His antics had attracted lots of negative publicity for the dump, and the more ink Boyette received, the crazier he'd become. He'd launched federal investigations. He'd called in dozens of EPA bureaucrats who'd prepared massive volumes of studies, most of which condemned the landfill. In Washington, he'd hounded the Justice Department until it initiated its own investigation into the allegations of mob involvement. Senator Boyette became the biggest obstacle to Johnny's gold mine. The decision had been made to hit Boyette. Sipping from a bottle of Cuervo gold, Barry laughed about the killing. He stalked Boyette for six months and was pleasantly surprised to learn that the senator, who was divorced, had an affinity for young women cheap young women, the kind he could find in a bordello and buy for fifty bucks. His favorite place was a seedy roadhouse halfway between New Orleans and Homa, the site of the landfill. It was in oil country and frequented by offshore roustabouts and the cute little whores they attracted. Evidently, the senator knew the owner and had a special arrangement. He always parked behind a garbage dumpster away from the gravel lot crowded with monster pickups and Harleys. He always used the rear entrance by the kitchen. The senator's trips to Homa became more frequent. He was raising hell in town meetings and holding press conferences every week, and he enjoyed the drives back to New Orleans with his little quickies at the roadhouse. The hit was easy, Barry said as they sat on the beach with foamy salt water rushing around them. He trailed Boyette for twenty miles after a rowdy landfill meeting in Homa and waited patiently in the darkness behind the roadhouse. When Boyette emerged after his little liaison, he hit him in the head with a nightstick and quickly threw him in the back seat. He stopped a few miles down the road and pumped four bullets in his head. The body was wrapped in garbage bags and placed in the trunk. Imagine that, Barry had marveled, a U.S. senator snatched from the darkness of a run-down bordello. He'd served for twenty-one years, chaired powerful committees, eaten at the White House, trotted around the globe searching for ways to spend taxpayers' money, had eighteen assistants and gophers working for him, and bam, just like that, got caught with his pants down. Barry thought it was hilarious. One of his easiest jobs, he said, as if there'd been hundreds. A state trooper had stopped Barry for speeding ten miles outside of New Orleans. Imagine that, he said, chatting with a cop with a warm body in the trunk. He talked football and avoided a ticket. But then he panicked and decided to hide the body in a different place. Grunky was tempted to ask where, but thought better of it. The case against him was shaky. The trooper's records placed Barry in the vicinity at the time of the disappearance. But with no body, there was no proof of the time of death. One of the prostitutes saw a man who resembled Barry in the shadows of the parking lot while the senator was being entertained. She was now under government protection, but not expected to make a good witness. Barry's car had been cleaned and sanitized. No blood samples, no fibers or hair. The star of the government's case was a mafia informant, a man who'd spent twenty of his forty-two years in jail and who was not expected to live to testify. A twenty-two caliber Ruger had been seized from the apartment of one of Barry's girlfriends, but again, with no corpse, it was impossible to determine the cause of death. Barry's fingerprints were on the gun. It was a gift, said the girlfriend. Juries are hesitant to convict without first knowing for certain that the victim is indeed dead, 
And Boyette was such an eccentric character that rumors and gossip had produced all sorts of wild speculation about his disappearance. One published report detailed his recent history of psychiatric problems and thus had given rise to a popular theory that he'd gone nuts and run off with a teenage hooker. He had gambling debts, he drank too much, his ex-wife had sued him for fraud in the divorce, and on and on. Boyette had plenty of reasons to disappear. And now, an eleven-year-old kid in Memphis knew where he was buried. Gronky opened the second beer. Doreen held Mark's arm and walked him to his room. His steps were measured, and he stared at the floor in front of them as if he'd just witnessed a car bomb in a crowded marketplace. "'Are you okay, baby?' she asked, the wrinkles around her eyes bunched together with terrible concern. He nodded and plodded along. She quickly unlocked the door and placed him on the bottom bunk. "'Lie right there, sweetheart,' she said, pulling back the covers and swinging his legs onto the bed. She knelt beside him and searched his eyes for answers. "'Are you sure you're okay?' He nodded, but could say nothing. "'Do you want me to call a doctor?' "'No,' he managed to say in a hollow voice. "'I'm fine.' "'I think I'll get a doctor,' he said. He grabbed her arm and squeezed tightly. "'I just need some rest,' he mumbled. "'That's all.' She unlocked the door with a key and slowly eased out, her eyes never leaving Mark. When the door closed and clicked, he swung his feet to the floor. At three Friday afternoon, Harry Roosevelt's legendary patience was gone. His weekend would be spent in the Ozarks, fishing with his two sons, and as he sat on the bench and looked at the courtroom, still crowded with deadbeat dads awaiting sentencing for non-payment, his mind kept wandering to thoughts of long, sleepy mornings in cool mountain streams. At least two dozen men filled the pews of the main courtroom, and most had either current wives or current girlfriends sitting anxiously at their elbows. A few had brought their lawyers, though there was no legal relief available at this moment. All of them would soon be serving weekend sentences at the Shelby County Penal Farm for failing to pay child support. Harry wanted to adjourn by four, but it looked doubtful. His two sons waited in the back row. Outside, the jeep was packed, and when the gavel finally rapped for the last time, they would rush his honor from the building and whisk him away to the Buffalo River. That was the plan, anyway. They were bored, but they had been here before many times. In spite of the chaos in front of the courtroom, clerks holding bundles of files in and out, lawyers whispering as they waited, deputies standing by, defendants being shuffled to the bench, then out the door, Harry's assembly line moved with determined efficiency. He glared at each dead beat, scolded a bit, sometimes a quick lecture, then he signed an order and moved on to the next one. Reggie eased into the courtroom and made her way to the clerk seated next to the bench. They whispered for a minute, with Reggie pointing to a document she'd brought with her. She laughed at something that was probably not that funny, but Harry heard her and motioned her to the bench. "'Something wrong?' he asked, with his hand over the microphone. "'No, Mark's fine, I guess. I need a quick favor. It's another case.' Harry smiled and turned off the mic. Typical Reggie. Her cases were always the most important and needed immediate attention." "'What is it?' he asked. The clerk handed Harry the file while Reggie handed him an order. "'It's another snatch and run by the welfare department,' she said in a low voice. No one was listening. No one cared. "'Who's the kid?' he asked, flipping through the file. "'Ronald Allen Thomas III, also known as Trip Thomas. He was taken into custody last night by welfare and placed in a foster home. His mother hired me an hour ago.' "'Says here he's been abandoned and neglected.' "'Not true, Harry.' It's a long story, but I assure you this kid has good parents and a clean home. And you want the kid released? Immediately. I'll pick him up myself and take him home to Mama Love if I have to. And feed him lasagna? Of course. Harry scanned the order and signed his name at the bottom. I'll have to trust you, Reggie. You always do. I saw Damon and Al back there. They look rather bored. Harry handed the order to the clerk, who stamped it. So am I. When I get this riffraff cleared from my courtroom, we're going fishing. Good luck. I'll see you Monday. Have a nice weekend, Reggie. You'll check on Mark, won't you? Of course. Try and talk some sense into his mother. The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced these people must cooperate with the feds and enter the witness program. Hell, they have nothing to lose by starting over. Convince her they'll be protected. I'll try. I'll spend some time with her this weekend. Maybe we can wrap it up Monday. I'll see you then. 
Reggie winked at him and backed away from the bench. The clerk handed her a copy of the order, and she left the courtroom. Chapter 31 Thomas Fink, fresh from another exciting flight from Memphis, entered Fultrig's office at 4.30 Friday afternoon. Wally Box sat like a faithful lapdog on the sofa, writing what Fink presumed to be another speech for their boss, or perhaps a press release for upcoming indictments. Roy's shoeless feet were on his desk, and the phone was cradled on his shoulder. He was listening with his eyes closed. The day had been a disaster. Lamond had embarrassed him in a crowded courtroom. Roosevelt had failed to make the kid talk. He'd had it with judges. Fink removed his jacket and sat down. Fultrig ended his phone chat and hung up. "'Where are the grand jury subpoenas?' he asked. "'I hand-delivered them to the U.S. Marshal in Memphis "'and gave him strict instructions not to serve them until he heard from you.' Box left the sofa and sat next to Fink. It would be a shame if he were excluded from a conversation. Roy rubbed his eyes and ran his fingers through his hair. Frustrating. Very frustrating. "'So what's the kid gonna do, Thomas?' You were there. You saw the kid's mother. You heard a voice. What's going to happen? I don't know. It's obvious the kid has no plans to talk any time soon. He and his mother are terrified. They watch too much television, seen too many mafia informants blown to bits. She's convinced they won't be safe in witness protection. She's really scared. The woman's been through hell this week. That's real touching, Box mumbled. "'I have no choice but to use the subpoenas,' Fultrig said gravely, pretending to be troubled by this thought. "'They leave me no choice. We were fair and reasonable. We asked the youth court in Memphis to help us with the kid, and it simply has not worked. "'It's time we got these people down here on our turf and our courtroom in front of our people and made them talk. Don't you agree, Thomas?' Fink was not in full agreement.' "'Jurisdiction worries me. "'The kid is under the jurisdiction of the juvenile court up there, "'and I'm not sure what'll happen when he gets the subpoena.' "'Roy was smiling. "'That's right. "'But the court is closed for the weekend. "'We've done some research, and I think federal law supersedes state law on this one. "'Don't you, Wally?' "'I think so, yes,' said Wally. "'And I've talked to the marshal's office here. "'I've told them I want the boys in Memphis to pick the kid up tomorrow "'and bring him here so he can face the grand jury Monday.' I don't think the locals in Memphis will interfere with the U.S. Marshal's office. We've made arrangements to house him here in the juvenile wing at City Jail. Should be a piece of cake. What about the lawyer? asked Fink. You can't make her testify. If she knows anything, she learned it in the course of her representation of the kid. It's privileged. Pure harassment, Fultrig admitted with a smile. She and the kid will be scared to death on Monday. We'll be calling the shots, Thomas. Speaking of Monday... Judge Roosevelt wants us in his courtroom at noon. Roy and Wally had a good laugh at this. He'll be a lonely judge, won't he? Fultrig said with a chuckle. You, me, the kid, and the kid's lawyer will all be down here. What a fool! Fink did not join their laughter. At five, Doreen knocked on the door and rattled keys until it opened. Mark was on the floor playing checkers against himself and immediately became a zombie. He sat on his feet and stared at the checkerboard as if in a trance. "'Are you okay, Mark?' Mark didn't answer. "'Mark, honey, I'm really worried about you. I think I'll call the doctor. You might be going into shock just like your little brother.' He shook his head slowly and looked at her with mournful eyes. "'No, I'm okay. I just need some rest. Could you eat something? Maybe some pizza? Sure, baby, I'll get one ordered.' Look, honey, I get off duty in five minutes, but I'll tell Telda to watch you real close, okay? Will you be all right till I get back in the morning? Maybe, he moaned. Poor child, you got no business in here. I'll make it. Telda was much less concerned than Doreen. She checked on Mark twice. On her third visit to his room around eight o'clock, she brought visitors. She knocked and opened the door slowly, and Mark was about to do his trance routine when he saw the two large men in suits. "'Mark, these men are U.S. Marshals,' Telda said nervously. Mark stood near the toilet. The room was suddenly tiny. "'Hi, Mark,' said the first one. "'I'm Vern Dabosky, Deputy U.S. Marshal.' His words were crisp and precise, a Yankee, but that was all Mark noticed. He was holding some papers.' 
You are Mark's way. He nodded, unable to speak. Don't be afraid, Mark. We just have to give you these papers. He looked at Telda for help, but she was clueless. What are they? he asked nervously. It's a grand jury subpoena, and it means that you have to appear before a federal grand jury on Monday in New Orleans. Now don't worry. We're going to come get you tomorrow afternoon and drive you down. A nervous pain shot through his stomach, and he was weak. His mouth was dry. Why? he asked. We can't answer that, Mark. It's none of our business, really. We're just following orders. Mark stared at the papers Byrne was waving. New Orleans. Have you told my mother? Well, you see, Mark, we're required to give her a copy of these same papers. We'll explain everything to her, and we'll tell her you'll be fine. In fact, she can go with you if she wants. She can't go with me. She can't leave Ricky. The marshals looked at each other. Well, anyway, we'll explain everything to her. I have a lawyer, you know. Have you told her? No, we're not required to notify the attorneys, but you're welcome to call her if you like. Does he have access to a telephone? The second one asked Telda. Only if I bring him one, she said. You can wait thirty minutes, can't you? If you say so, Telda said. So, Mark, in about thirty minutes you can call your lawyer. Dubosky paused and looked at his sidekick. Well, good luck to you, Mark. Sorry if we scared you. They left him standing near the toilet, leaning on the wall for support, more confused than ever scared to death, and angry. The system was rotten. He was sick of laws and lawyers and courts, of cops and agents and marshals, of reporters and judges and jailers. Damn it! He yanked a paper towel from the wall and wiped his eyes, then sat on the toilet. He swore to the walls that he would not go to New Orleans. Two other deputy marshals would serve Diane, and two more would serve Ms. Reggie Love at home, and all this serving of subpoenas was carefully coordinated to happen at roughly the same time. In reality, one deputy marshal, or one unemployed concrete worker for that matter, could have served all three subpoenas at a leisurely pace and completed the job in an hour. But it was more fun to use six men in three cars with radios and telephones and guns, and to strike quickly under cover of darkness like a special forces assault unit. They knocked on Mama Love's kitchen door and waited until the porch light came on and she appeared behind the screen. She instantly knew they were trouble. During the nightmare of Reggie's divorce and commitments and legal warfare with Joe Cardoni, there had been several deputies and men in dark suits standing at her doorway at odd hours. These guys always brought trouble. "'Can I help you?' she asked with a forced smile. "'Yes, ma'am, we're looking for one Reggie Love.' They even talked like cops. "'And who are you?' she asked. "'I'm Mike Headley, and this is Terry Flagg. We're U.S. Marshals.' "'U.S. Marshals or Deputy U.S. Marshals? Let me see some ID.' This shocked them, and in perfect synchronization they reached into their pockets for their badges. "'We're Deputy U.S. Marshals, ma'am.' "'That's not what you said,' she said, examining the badges held up to the screen door. Reggie was sipping coffee on the tiny balcony of her apartment when she heard the car door slam. She was now peeking around the corner and looking down at the two men standing under the light. She could hear the voices, but could not understand what they were saying. "'Sorry, ma'am,' Headley said. "'Why do you want one, Reggie Love?' Mama Love asked with a suspicious frown. "'Does she live here? Maybe, maybe not. What do you want?' Headley and Flagg looked at each other. "'We're supposed to serve her with a subpoena. A subpoena for what?' "'May I ask who you are?' Flagg said. "'I'm her mother. Now what's the subpoena for?' "'It's a grand jury subpoena. She's supposed to appear before a grand jury in New Orleans on Monday. "'We can just leave it with you, if you like. "'I'm not accepting service of it,' she said, as if she fought with processed servers every week. "'You have to actually serve her, if I'm not mistaken. "'Where is she? She doesn't live here.' This irritated them. That's her car, Headley said, nodding at Reggie's monster. She doesn't live here, Mama Love repeated. Okay, but is she here now? No. Do you know where she is? Have you tried her office? She works all the time. But why is her car here? Sometimes she rides with Clint, her secretary. They may be having dinner or something. They gave each other frustrated stares. 
I think she's here, Headley said, suddenly aggressive. You're not paid to think, son. You're paid to serve those damn papers, and I'm telling you she's not here. Mama Love raised her voice when she said this, and Reggie heard it. Can we search the house? Flag asked. If you have a warrant, you can search the house. If you don't have a warrant, it's time to get off my property. They both took a step back and stopped. I hope you are not obstructing the service of a federal subpoena, Headley said gravely. It was supposed to have an ominous, dire ring to it, but Headley failed miserably. And I hope you're not trying to threaten an old woman. Her hands were on her hips and she was ready for combat. They surrendered and backed away. We'll be back, Headley promised as he opened his car door. I'll be here, she shouted angrily, opening the front door. She stood on the small porch and watched as they backed into the street. She waited for five minutes, and when she was certain they were gone, she went to Reggie's apartment over the garage. Diane took the subpoena from the polite and apologetic gentleman without comment. She read it by the light of the dim lamp next to Ricky's bed. It contained no instructions, just a command for Mark to appear before the grand jury at 10 a.m. at the address below. There was no hint of how he was to get there, no clue as to when he might return, no warning of what could happen if he failed to comply or failed to talk. She called Reggie, but there was no answer. Though Clint's apartment was only fifteen minutes away, the drive took almost an hour. She zigzagged through Midtown, then raced around the interstate, going nowhere in particular, and when she was certain she was not being followed, she parked on a street crowded with empty cars. She walked four blocks to his apartment. His nine o'clock date had been abruptly cancelled, and it was a date with a lot of promise. I'm sorry, Reggie said as he opened the door, and she eased through it. That's okay. Are you all right? He took her bag and waved at the sofa. Sit down. Reggie was no stranger to the apartment. She found a Diet Coke in the refrigerator and sat on a bar stool. It was the U.S. Marshal's office with a grand jury subpoena, ten o'clock Monday morning in New Orleans. But they didn't serve you? No, Mama Love ran them off. Then you're off the hook. Yeah, unless they find me. There's no law against dodging subpoenas. I need to call Diane. Clint handed her a phone, and she punched the numbers from memory. Relax, Reggie, he said, and kissed her gently on the cheek. He picked up stray magazines and turned on the stereo. Diane was on the phone, and Reggie managed three words before she was forced to listen. Subpoenas were everywhere, one for Reggie, one for Diane, and one for Mark. Reggie tried to calm her. Diane had called the detention center but couldn't get through to Mark. Phones were unavailable at this hour, she'd been told. They talked for five minutes. Reggie, badly shaken herself, tried to convince Diane everything was fine. She, Reggie, was in control. She promised to call her in the morning, then hung up. They can't take Mark, Clint said. He's under the jurisdiction of our juvenile court. I need to talk to Harry, but he's out of town. Where is he? Fishing somewhere with his sons. This is more important than fishing, Reggie. Let's find him. He can stop it, can't he? She was thinking of a hundred things at once. This is pretty slick, Clint. Think about it. Fultrick waits until late Friday to serve subpoenas for Monday morning. How can he do this? It's easy. He just did. In a criminal case like this, a federal grand jury can subpoena any witness from anywhere, regardless of time and distance, and the witness must appear unless he or she can first quash the subpoena. How do you quash one? You file a motion in federal court to void the subpoena. Let me guess. Federal court in New Orleans. That's right. We're forced to find the trial judge early Monday morning in New Orleans and beg him to allow an emergency hearing to quash the subpoena. It won't work, Reggie. Of course it won't work. That's the way Fultrick planned it. She gulped the Diet Coke. Do you have any coffee? Sure. He began opening drawers. Reggie was thinking out loud. If I can dodge the subpoena until Monday, Fultrick will be forced to issue another one. Then maybe I'll have time to quash. The problem is Mark. They are not after me because they know they can't force me to talk. Do you know where the damn body is, Reggie? No. Does Mark? Yes. He froze for a moment, then ran water in the pot. We'll have to figure out a way to keep Mark here, Clint. We can't allow him to go to New Orleans. Call Harry. Harry's fishing in the mountains. Then call Harry's wife. Find out where he's fishing in the mountains. I'll go get him if necessary. He'll write. 
She grabbed the phone and started calling. Chapter 32 Final room check at the juvenile detention center was 10 p.m. when they made sure all lights and televisions were off. Mark heard Tilda rattling keys and giving commands across the hall. His shirt was soaked, unbuttoned, and sweat ran to his navel and puddled around the zipper of his jeans. The television was off. His breathing was heavy. His thick hair was watery, and rows of sweat ran to his eyebrows and dripped from the tip of his nose. She was next door. His face was crimson and hot. Telda knocked, then unlocked Mark's door. The light was on, and this immediately irritated her. She took a step inside, glanced at the bunks, but he wasn't there. Then she saw his feet beside the toilet. He was curled tightly with his knees on his chest, motionless except for rapid, heavy breathing. His eyes were closed, and his left thumb was in his mouth. Mark! she shouted, suddenly terrified. Mark! Oh, my God! She ran from the room to get help and was back within seconds with Denny, her partner, who took a quick look. Doreen was worried about this, Denny said, touching the sweat on Mark's stomach. Damn, he's soaking wet. Telda was pinching his wrist. His pulse is crazy. Look at him, Bree. Call an ambulance. The poor kid's in shock, isn't he? Go call an ambulance. Denny lumbered from the room and the floor shook. Telda picked Mark up and carefully placed him on the bottom bunk where he curled again and brought his knees to his chest. The thumb never left his mouth. Denny was back with a clipboard. This must be Doreen's handwriting. Says here to check on him every half hour, and if there's any doubt, to rush him to St. Peter's and call Dr. Greenway. This is all my fault, Telda said. I shouldn't have allowed those damn marshals in here, scared the poor boy to death. Denny knelt beside her and with a thick thumb peeled back the right eyelid. Damn, his eyes have rolled back. This kid's in trouble, he said with all the gravity of a brain surgeon. Get a washcloth over here, Telda said, and Denny did as told. Doreen was telling me this is what happened to his little brother. They saw that shooting on Monday, both of them, and the little one's been in shock ever since. Denny handed her the cloth, and she wiped Mark's forehead. Damn, his heart's gonna explode, Denny said, on his knees again next to Telda. He's breathing like crazy. Poor kid, I should have run those marshals off, Telda said. I would have. They got no rat coming on this floor. He jabbed another thumb into the left eye, and Mark groaned and twitched. Then he started the moaning, just like Ricky, and this scared them even more. A low, dull, pitchless sound from deep in the throat. He sucked hard on the thumb. A paramedic from the main jail three floors down ran into the room, followed by another jailer. "'What's up?' he asked as Telda and Denny moved. "'I think it's called traumatic shock or stress or something,' Telda said." He's been acting strange all day. Then about an hour ago, two U.S. Marshals were here to give him a subpoena. The paramedic was not listening. He gripped a wrist and found the pulse. Telda rattled on. They scared him to death, and I think sent him into shock. I should have watched him after that, but I got busy. I would have run those damn marshals off, Denny said. They stood side by side behind the paramedic. This is what happened to his little brother, you know, the one who's been in the newspapers all week, the shooting and all. He's got to go, the paramedic said, standing, frowning, and talking into his radio. Hurry up with the stretcher to the fourth floor, he barked into it. Got a kid in bad shape. Denny stuck the clipboard in front of the paramedic. Says here to take him to St. Peter's, Dr. Greenway. That's where his brother is, Tilda added. Doreen told me all about it. She was worried this might happen. Said she almost sent for an ambulance this afternoon. Said he's been slipping away all day. I should have been more careful. The stretcher arrived with two more paramedics. Mark was quickly laid on it and covered with a blanket. A strap was placed across his thighs and another on his chest. His eyes never opened, but he managed to keep the thumb in his mouth. And he managed to emit the painful, monotonous groan that frightened the paramedics and sped the stretcher along. It rolled quickly past the front station and into an elevator. "'You ever seen this before?' one paramedic mumbled under his breath to the other. "'Not that I recall.' He's burning up. The skin's normally cool and clammy with shock. I've never seen this. Yeah, maybe traumatic shock's different. Check out that thumb. Is this a kid the mob's after? Yeah, front page today and yesterday. I guess he's going over the edge. The elevator stopped, and they pushed the stretcher hurriedly through a series of short hallways, all busy and filled with the usual Friday night madness of city jail. A set of double doors flew open, and they were at the ambulance. 
The ride to St. Peter's took less than ten minutes, half as long as the wait once they arrived. Three other ambulances were in the process of depositing their occupants. St. Peter's received the vast majority of Memphis knife wounds, gunshot victims, beaten wives, and mangled bodies from weekend car wrecks. The pace was hectic 24 hours a day, but from sunset Friday until late Sunday, the place was in chaos. They rolled him through the bay and onto the white tile floors, where the stretcher stopped and the paramedics waited and filled out forms. A small army of nurses and doctors scrambled around a new patient and all yelled at the same time. People ran in every direction. A half-dozen cops milled about. Three more stretchers were parked haphazardly in the wide hallway. A nurse ventured by, stopped for a second, and asked the paramedics, What is it? One of them handed her a form. So he's not bleeding, she said, as if nothing mattered except flowing blood. No, looks like stress or shock or something. Runs in the family. He can wait. Roll him to intake. I'll be back in a minute. And she was off. They wove the stretcher through heavy traffic and stopped in a small room off the main hallway. The forms were presented to another nurse who scribbled something without looking at Mark. "'Where's Dr. Greenway?' she asked the paramedics. They looked at each other and shrugged at the nurse. "'You haven't called him?' she asked. "'Well, no.' "'Well, no,' she repeated to herself and rolled her eyes. "'What a couple of dumb asses. "'Look, this is a war zone, okay? "'We're talking blood and guts. "'We've lost two people in that hallway right there in the past thirty minutes. "'Psychiatric emergencies do not get top priority around here.' "'You want us to shoot him? one of them said, nodding at Mark, "'and this really pissed her off. "'No, I want you to leave. "'I'll take care of him, but you guys just get the hell out of here. "'You sign the forms, lady. He's all yours.' They smiled at her and headed for the door. "'Is there a policeman with him?' she asked. "'Nope, he's just a juvenile.' They were gone. Mark managed to roll onto his left side and bring his knees to his chest. The straps were not tight. His eyes opened slightly. A black man was lying across three chairs in one corner of the room. An empty stretcher with blood on the sheets was by a green door next to a water fountain. The nurse answered the phone, said a few words, and left the room. Mark quickly unhooked the straps and jumped to the floor. There was no crime in walking around. He was a nutcase now, so what if they caught him on his feet? The forms she'd been holding were on the counter. He grabbed them and pushed the stretcher through the green door, which led to a cramped corridor with small rooms on both sides. He abandoned the stretcher and threw the forms in a garbage can. The exit signs led to a door with a window in it. It opened into the madhouse of admissions. Mark smiled to himself. He'd been here before. He watched the chaos through the window and picked the spot where he and Hardy had stood after Greenway and Diane disappeared with Ricky. He eased through the door and casually made his way through the snarled throng of sick and wounded, trying anxiously to get admitted. Running and darting might attract attention, so he played it cool. He rode his favorite escalator to the basement and found an empty wheelchair by the stairs. It was adult size, but he worked the wheels and rolled himself past the cafeteria to the morgue. Clint had fallen asleep on the sofa. Letterman was almost over when the phone rang. Reggie grabbed it. Hello? Hi, Reggie. It's me, Mark. Mark, how are you, dear? Doing great, Reggie. Just wonderful. How'd you find me? she asked, turning off the TV. I called Mama Love and woke her. She gave me this number. It's Clint's place, right? Right. How'd you get to a phone? It's awful late. Well, I'm not in jail anymore. She stood and walked to the snack bar. Where are you, dear? At the hospital. St. Peter's. I see, and how'd you get there? They brought me in an ambulance. Are you okay? Great. Why'd they take you in an ambulance? I had an attack of post-traumatic stress syndrome, and they rushed me over. Should I come see you? Maybe. What's his grand jury stuff? Nothing but an attempt to scare you into talking. Well, it worked. I'm more scared than ever. You sound fine. Nervous energy, Reggie. I'm scared to death. I mean, you don't sound like you're in shock or anything. I recovered real quick. I faked them out, Reggie, okay? I jogged in my little cell for half an hour, and when they found me, I was soaking wet and in bad shape, as they say. Clint sat up on the sofa and listened intently. "'Have you seen a doctor?' she asked, frowning at Clint. "'Not exactly. 
What does that mean? It means I walked out of the emergency room. It means I've escaped, Reggie. It was so easy. Oh, my God. Relax. I'm fine. I'm not going back to jail, Reggie, and I'm not going to see the grand jury in New Orleans. They'll just lock me up down there, won't they? Listen, Mark, you can't do this. You can't escape. You must. I've already escaped, Reggie. And you know something? What? I doubt if anyone knows it yet. This place is so crazy, I doubt if they've missed me yet. What about the cops? What cops? Didn't a cop go with you to the hospital? No, I'm just a kid, Reggie. I had two huge paramedics, but I'm just a little kid, and at the time, I was in a coma sucking my thumb, moaning and groaning just like Ricky. You'd have been proud. It was like something out of a movie. Once I got here, they turned their backs, and just like that, I walked away. You can't do this, Mark. It's done, okay, and I'm not going back. What about your mother? Oh, I talked to her about an hour ago, by phone, of course. She freaked out, but I convinced her I was fine. She didn't like it, told me to come to Ricky's room. We had a big fight over the phone, but she settled down. I think she's on pills again. But you're at the hospital? That's right. Where? In which room? Are you still my lawyer? Of course I'm your lawyer. Good. So if I tell you something, you can't repeat it, right? Right. Are you my friend, Reggie? Of course I'm your friend. That's good. Because right now, you're the only friend I have. Will you help me, Reggie? I'm really scared. I'll do anything, Mark. Where are you? In the morgue. There's a little office in the corner, and I'm hiding under the desk. The lights are off. If I hang up real quick, you'll know somebody walked in. They brought in two bodies while I've been here, but so far no one's come to the office. The morgue? Clint bolted to his feet and stood beside her. Yeah, hey, I've been here before. I know this place pretty well, remember? Sure. "'Who's in the morgue?' Clint whispered. She frowned at him and shook her head. "'Mom said they have a subpoena for you, too, Reggie. Is this true?' "'Yes, but they haven't served me. That's why I'm here at Clint's. If they don't hand me the subpoena, then I don't have to go.' "'So you're hiding, too?' "'I guess.' Suddenly his end clicked and the dial tone followed. She stared at the receiver, then quickly placed it on the phone. "'He hung up,' she said. "'What the hell's going on?' Clint asked. "'It's Mark. He's escaped from jail.' "'He what?' "'He's hiding in the morgue at St. Peter's.' She said this as if she didn't believe it. The phone rang and she snatched it. "'Hello?' "'Sorry about that. The door to the morgue opened then closed. I thought they were bringing in another body. "'Are you safe, Mark?' "'Hell no, I'm not safe, but I'm a kid, okay?' And now I'm a psychiatric case, so if they catch me, I'll just go into shock again and they'll put me in a room. Then I'll figure out another way to escape, maybe. You can't hide forever, neither can you. She marveled once again at his quick tongue. You're right, Mark. So what do we do? I don't know. I really would like to leave Memphis. I'm sick of cops and jails. Where do you want to go? Well, let me ask you something. If you come and get me and we leave town together, then you could get in trouble for helping me escape, right? Yes, I'd be an accomplice. What would they do to you? We'll worry about that later. I've done worse things, so you'll help me. Yes, Mark, I'll help you. And you won't tell anybody. We may need Clint. Okay, you can tell Clint, but nobody else, okay? You have my word. And you won't try to talk me into going back to jail. I promise. There was a long pause. Clint was near panic. Okay, Reggie. You know the main parking lot, the one next to that big green building? Yes. Drive into it just like you're looking for a place to park. Go real slow. I'll be hiding between some cars. That place is dark and dangerous, Mark. It's Friday night, Reggie. Everything around here is dark and dangerous. But there's a guard in the exit booth. That guard sleeps half the time. It's a guard, not a cop. I know what I'm doing, okay? Are you sure? No, but you said you'd help me. I will. When should I be there? As fast as you can. I'll be in Clint's car. It's a black Honda Accord. Good. Hurry. I'm on my way. Be careful, Mark. Relax, Reggie. This is just like the movies. She hung up and took a deep breath. My car? Clint asked. They're looking for me, too. You're crazy, Reggie. This is insane. You can't run away with an escaped... 
I don't know, whatever the hell he is. They'll arrest you for contributing. You'll be indicted. You'll lose your license. Where's my bag? In the bedroom. I need your keys and your credit cards. My credit cards? Look, Reggie, I love you, sweetheart, but my car and my plastic? How much cash do you have? Forty bucks. Give it here. I'll pay you back. She headed for the bedroom. You've lost your mind. I've lost it before, remember? Come on, Reggie. Get a grip, Clint. We're not blowing anything. I've got to help, Mark. He's sitting in a dark little office in the morgue at St. Peter's begging for help. What am I supposed to do? Well, hell, I think you should attack the place with a shotgun and blow people away. Anything for Mark's sway. She threw her toothbrush in a canvas bag. Give me the credit cards and the cash, Clint. I'm in a hurry. He reached in his pockets. You're nuts. This is ridiculous. Stay by the phone. Do not leave this place, okay? I'll call you later. She grabbed his keys, cash, and two credit cards, Visa and Texaco. He followed her to the door. Take it easy with the Visa. It's almost to the limit. Why am I not surprised? She kissed him on the cheek. Thanks, Clint. Take care of Mama Love. Call me, he said, thoroughly defeated. She eased through the door and disappeared in the darkness. Chapter 33 From the moment Mark jumped into the car and hid on the floor, Reggie became an accomplice to his escape. But unless he murdered someone before they were caught, it was doubtful her crime would be punishable by incarceration. She was thinking more along the lines of community service, perhaps a bit of restitution and forty years of probation. Hell, she'd give them all the probation they wanted. It would be her first offense. She and her lawyer could make a strong argument that the kid was being hunted by the mafia and he was all alone, and, well, damn it, somebody had to do something. She couldn't worry about legal niceties when her client was out there begging for help. Maybe she could pull some strings and keep her license to practice. She paid the parking guard fifty cents and refused eye contact. She had circled through the lot one time. The guard was in another world. Mark was rolled into a tight coil somewhere in the darkness under the dashboard, and he remained there until she turned on Union and headed for the river. "'Is it safe now?' he asked nervously. "'I think so.' He sprang into the seat and surveyed the landscape. The digital clock gave the time as twelve-fifty. The six lanes of Union Avenue were deserted. She drove three blocks, catching red lights at each one while waiting for Mark to speak. "'So where are we going?' she finally asked. "'The Alamo.' "'The Alamo,' she repeated, without a trace of a smile. He shook his head. Adults could be so dumb at times. It's a joke, Reggie. Sorry. I take it you haven't seen Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Is that a movie? Forget it. Just forget it. They waited for another red light. I like your car better, he said, rubbing his hand along the Accords console and taking a sudden interest in the radio. That's good, Mark. This street is about to stop at the river, and I think we should discuss exactly where it is you want to go. Well, right now, I just want to leave Memphis, okay? I really don't care where we go. I just want to get out of Dodge. And once we leave Memphis, where might we be going? A destination would be nice. Let's cross the bridge by the pyramid, okay? Fair enough. You want to go to Arkansas? Why not? Yeah, sure, let's go to Arkansas. Fair enough. With that decision out of the way, he leaned forward and carefully inspected the radio. He pushed a button, turned a knob and Reggie braced for a loud burst of rap or heavy metal. He made adjustments with both hands, just a kid with a new toy. He should be home in a warm bed, and he should sleep late since it's Saturday. And fresh from bed he should watch cartoons, then still in pajamas play Nintendo with all its buttons and gadgets, much like he was doing right then with the radio. The four tops finished a song. "'You listen to oldies?' she asked, genuinely surprised. "'Sometimes. I thought you'd like it. "'It's almost one o'clock in the morning, not the best time for the loud stuff, you know.' "'Why do you think I like oldies?' "'Well, Reggie, to be perfectly honest, I can't see you at a rap concert. "'And besides, the radio in your car was on this station last time I rode in it.' "'Union Avenue stopped at the river, and they sat at another red light. "'A police car stopped next to them, and the cop behind the wheel frowned at Mark.' Don't look at him, Reggie scolded. The light changed, and she turned right onto Riverside Drive. The cop followed. 
Don't turn around, she said under her breath. Just act normal. Damn, Reggie, why is he following us? I have no idea. Just be cool. He recognized me. My face has been plastered all over the newspapers this week, and the cop recognized me. This is just great, Reggie. We make our big escape, and ten minutes later, the cops nail us. Be quiet, Mark. I'm trying to drive and watch him at the same time. He eased downward, sliding slowly until his butt was on the edge of the seat and his head was just above the door handle. "'What's he doing?' he whispered. Her eyes darted back and forth from the mirror to the street. "'Just following. No, wait, here he comes.' The police car eased by them, then sped away. "'He's gone,' she said, and Mark breathed again. They entered I-40 at the downtown ramp and were on the bridge over the Mississippi River. He gazed at the brightly lit pyramid to the right, then spun around to admire the Memphis skyline fading in the distance. He stared in awe, as if he'd never seen it before. Reggie wondered if the poor child had ever left Memphis. An Elvis song started. "'You like Elvis?' he asked. Mark, believe it or not, when I was a teenager growing up in Memphis, a bunch of us girls would ride over to Elvis's house on Sundays and watch him play touch football. This was before he was really famous, and he still lived at home with his parents in a nice little house. He went to Hume's High School, which is now Northside. I live in North Memphis. At least I did. I don't know where I live now. We'd go to his concerts, and we'd see him hanging out around town. He was just an average guy at first. Then things changed. He got so famous he couldn't live a normal life. Just like me, Reggie, he said with a sudden smile. Think of it. Me and Elvis. Pictures on the front page. Photographers everywhere. All sorts of people looking for us. It's tough being famous. Yeah, and wait till tomorrow in the Sunday paper. I can see the headlines now. Big, bold letters. Sway escapes. It's great. And they'll have my smiling face on the front page again with cops all around me like I'm some kind of serial killer. And those same cops will sound so stupid trying to explain how an 11-year-old kid escaped from jail. I wonder if I'm the youngest kid to ever escape from jail. Probably. I do feel sorry for Doreen, though. You think she'll get in trouble? Was she on duty? No, it was Teldon and Denny. Wouldn't bother me if they got fired. Doreen's probably okay. She's been there a long time. I faked her out, you know. I started acting like I was going into shock. Just fading away to la-la land, as Romy called it. Every time she checked on me, I acted weirder and weirder. Quit talking to her, just stared at the ceiling and groaned. She knows all about Ricky, and she became convinced it was happening to me, too. Yesterday, she brought a medic in from the jail, and he examined me. Said I was fine, but Doreen was worried. I guess I used her. How'd you get out? Played like I was in shock, you know. I worked up a good sweat running around my little cell, then curled up in a ball and sucked my thumb. It scared them so bad they called the ambulance. I knew if I could make it to St. Peter's, I was home free. That place is a zoo. And you just disappeared? They had me on this stretcher, and when they turned their backs, I got up and, yeah, just disappeared. Look, Reggie, there were people dying right and left, so no one was concerned with me. It was easy. They were over the bridge and into Arkansas. The highway was flat and lined on both sides by truck stops and motels. He turned to admire the Memphis skyline once more, but it was gone. "'What are you looking for?' she asked. "'Memphis. I like to look at the tall buildings downtown. A teacher told me once that people actually live in those tall buildings. It's hard to believe. Why is it hard to believe? I saw a movie once about this little rich kid who lived in a tall building in a city, and he roamed around the streets just having a great time. He knew the cops by their first names. He stopped taxis when he wanted to go somewhere. And at night, he'd sit on the balcony and watch the streets below. I've always thought that would be a wonderful way to live. No cheap house trailers, no trashy neighborhoods, no pickups parked in the street in front of your house. You can have it, Mark. It's yours if you want it. He gave her a long look. How? Right now, the FBI will give you whatever you want. You can live in a tall building in a big city, or you can live in a cabin in the mountains. You pick the place. I've been thinking about that. You can live on a beach and play in the ocean, or you can live in Orlando and go to Disney World every day. That'd be okay for Ricky. I'm too old. I've heard the tickets are too expensive. You'd probably get a lifetime pass if you asked for it. Right now, Mark, you and your mom can get anything you want. 
Yeah, but Reggie, who wants it if you're afraid of your shadow? For three nights now, I've had nightmares about these people, Reggie. I don't want to be scared for the rest of my life. They'll get me one day. I know they will. So what do you do, Mark? I don't know, but I've been thinking real hard about something. I'm listening. One good thing about jail is that it allows you to think a lot. He placed one foot on one knee and wrapped his fingers around it. Think about this, Reggie. What if Romy told me a lie? He was drunk, taking pills, out of his mind. Maybe he was just talking to hear himself talk. I was there, remember? The man was crazy. Said all sorts of weird things, and at first I believed all of it. I was scared to death, and I wasn't thinking clearly. My head was hurting where it slapped me. But now, well, I'm not so sure. All week I've been remembering crazy stuff he said and did, and maybe I was too eager to believe everything. She was driving exactly fifty-five miles per hour and hanging on every word. She had no idea where he was going with this, and she had no idea where the car was going either. But I couldn't take a chance, right? I mean, what if I told the cops everything and they found the body right where Romy said? Everybody's happy but the mafia, and who knows what would happen to me? And what if I told the cops everything but Romy was lying and they found nobody? I'm off the hook, right, because in reality I didn't know anything at all? What a joker, that Romy. But it was too big of a risk. He paused for half a mile. The Beach Boys sang California Girls. So, I've had a brainstorm. By now, she could almost feel this brainstorm. Her heart stopped, and she managed to keep the wheels between the white lines of the right lane. And what might that be? she asked nervously. I think we should see if Romy was lying or not. She cleared her dry throat. You mean go find the body? That's right. She wanted to laugh at this innocent humor of a hyperactive mind, but at the moment she didn't have the strength. You must be kidding. Well, let's talk about it. You and I are both expected to be in New Orleans Monday morning, right? I guess. I haven't seen a subpoena. But I'm your client, and I've got a subpoena. So even if they didn't give you one, you'd still have to go with me, right? That's true. And now we're on the run, right? Just you and me. Bonnie and Clyde, running from the cops. I guess you could say that. Where's the last place they'd look for us? Think about it, Reggie. Where's the last place in the world they'd expect us to run to? New Orleans. Right. Now, I don't know anything about hiding out, but since you're dodging a subpoena and you're a lawyer and all and you deal with criminals all the time, I figure you could get us to New Orleans and no one would know it, right? I suppose so. She was beginning to agree with him and she was shocked by her own words. And if you can get us to New Orleans, then we'll find Romy's house. Why Romy's house? That's where the body's supposed to be. This was the last thing in the world she wanted to know. She slowly removed her glasses and rubbed her eyes. A slight headache was forming between her temples, and it would only get worse. Romy's house. The home of Jerome Clifford deceased. He had said this very slowly, and she'd heard it very slowly. She glared at taillights in front of them, but there was nothing but a red blur. Romy's house. The victim of the murder was buried at the home of the accused lawyer. This was beyond bizarre. Her mind raced wildly in circles, asking itself a hundred questions and answering none of them. She glanced in the mirror and was suddenly aware that he was staring at her with a curious smile. "'Now you know, Reggie,' he said. "'But how? Why? Don't ask, because I don't know. "'It's crazy, isn't it? That's why I think Romy could have made it up. "'A crazy mind created this weird story about the body being at his house. "'So you don't think it's really there?' she asked, seeking reassurance." We won't know until we look. If it's not there, I'm off the hook, and life returns to normal. But what if it is there? We'll worry about that when we find it. I don't like your brainstorm. Why not? Look, Mark, son, client, friend, if you think I'm going to New Orleans to dig up a dead body, then you're crazy. Of course I'm crazy. Me and Ricky are just a couple of nutcases. I won't do it. Why not, Reggie? It's much too dangerous, Mark. It's insane, and it could get us killed. I won't go, and I can't let you do it. 
Why is it dangerous? Well, it's just dangerous. I don't know. Think about it, Reggie. We check on the body, okay? Then if it's not where Romy said, I'm home free. We'll tell the cops to drop everything against us, and in return, I'll tell them what I know. And since I don't know where the body really is, the mafia couldn't care less about me. We walk. We walk. Too much television. And if we find the body? Good question. Think about this slowly, Reggie. Try and think like a kid. If we find the body, and then you call the FBI and tell them you know exactly where it is because you've seen it with your own eyes, then they'll give us anything we want. And what exactly do you want? Probably Australia. A nice house, plenty of money for my mother, new car, maybe some plastic surgery. I saw that once in a movie. They rearranged this guy's entire face. He was dog ugly to start with, and he snitched on some drug dealers just so he could get a new face. Looked like a movie star when it was over. About two years later, the drug dealers gave him another new face. You're serious? About the movie? No, about Australia. Maybe. He paused and looked out the window. Maybe. They listened to the radio and didn't speak for several miles. Traffic was light. Memphis was farther away. Let's make a deal, he said, looking out his window. Maybe. Let's go to New Orleans. I'm not digging for a body. Okay, okay, but let's go there. No one will expect us. We'll talk about the body when we get there. We've already talked about it. Just go to New Orleans, okay? The highway intersected another one, and they were on top of an overpass. She pointed to her right. Ten miles away, the Memphis skyline glowed and flickered under a half moon. Wow, he said in awe. It's beautiful. Neither of them could know that it would be his last look at Memphis. They stopped in Forest City, Arkansas, for gas and snacks. Reggie paid for cupcakes, a large coffee, and a Sprite, while Mark hid on the floor. Minutes later, they were back on the interstate, headed for Little Rock. Steam poured from the styrofoam cup as she drove and watched him inhale four cupcakes. He ate like a kid, crumbs on his pants and in the seat, cream filling on his fingers, which he licked as if he hadn't seen food in a month. It was almost 2.30, the road was empty except for convoys of tractor-trailer rigs. She set the cruise control on 65. "'You think they're chasing us yet?' he asked, finishing the last cupcake and opening the Sprite. There was a certain excitement in his voice. "'I doubt it. I'm sure the police are searching the hospital, but why would they suspect we are together?' "'I'm worried about Mom. I called her, you know, before I called you. Told her about the escape, and then I was hiding in the hospital.' She got real mad, but I think I convinced her I'm safe. I hope they don't give her a hard time. They won't, but she'll worry herself sick. I know, I don't mean to be cruel, but I think she can handle it. Look at what she's already been through. My mom's pretty tough. I'll tell Clint to call her later today. Are you going to tell Clint where we're going? I'm not sure where we're going. He thought about this as two trucks roared by and the Honda veered to the right. What would you do, Reggie? For starters, I don't think I would have escaped. That's a lie. I beg your pardon. Sure it is. You're dodging a subpoena, aren't you? I'm doing the same thing. So what's the difference? You don't want to face the grand jury. I don't want to face the grand jury. So here we are on the run. We're in the same boat, Reggie. There's only one difference. You were in jail and you escaped. That's a crime. I was in a jail for juveniles and juveniles do not commit crimes. Isn't that what you told me? Juveniles are rowdy or delinquent or in need of supervision, but juveniles do not commit crimes, right? If you say so. But it was wrong to escape. It's done. I can't undo it. It's wrong for you to dodge the law, too, isn't it? Absolutely not. There's no crime in avoiding a subpoena. I was doing fine until I picked you up. Then stopped the car and let me out. Oh, sure. Please be serious, Mark. I am serious. Right. And what'll you do when you get out? Oh, I don't know. I'll go as fast as I can, and if I get caught, then I'll just go into shock, and they'll send me back to Memphis. I claim I was crazy, and they'll never know you were involved. Just stop any time you feel it, and I'll get out. He leaned forward and punched the seek button on the radio. 
For five miles they listened to Conway Twitty and Tammy Wynette. I hate country music, she said, and he turned it off. Can I ask you something, she said. Sure. Suppose we go to New Orleans and find the body, and according to your plan, we then cut a deal with the FBI and you go into their witness protection plan. You, Diane, and Ricky then fly off into the sunset to Australia or wherever, right? I guess. Then why not cut a deal and tell them now? Now you're thinking, Reggie, he said patronizingly, as if she'd finally awakened and was beginning to see the light. Thank you so much, she said. It took me a while to figure it out. The answer's easy. I don't completely trust the FBI, do you? Not completely. And I'm not willing to give them what they want until me, my mother, and my brother are already far away. You're a good lawyer, Reggie, and you wouldn't allow your client to take any chances, would you? Go on. Before I tell these clients anything, I want to make sure we're safely put away somewhere. It'll take some time to move Ricky. If I told them now, the bad guys might find out before we can disappear. It's too risky. But what if you told them now and they didn't find the body? What if Clifford was, as you say, joking? I would never know, would I? I'd be undercover somewhere, getting a nose job, changing my name to Tommy or something, and all of it would be for nothing. It makes more sense to know now, Reggie, if Romy told me the truth. She shook her bewildered head. I'm not sure I follow you. I'm not sure I follow me either. But one thing is for certain. I'm not going to New Orleans with the U.S. Marshals. I'm not going to face the grand jury on Monday and refuse to answer questions so they can throw my little butt in jail down there. Good point. So how do we spend our weekend? How far is it to New Orleans? Five or six hours? Let's go. We can always chicken out once we get there. How much trouble will it be to find the body? Probably not much. Can I ask where it is at Clifford's house? Well, it's not hanging in a tree or lying in the bushes. It'll take a little work. This is completely crazy, Mark. I know. It's been a bad week. Chapter 34 So much for a quiet Saturday morning with the kids. Jason Maxoon studied his feet on the rug next to his bed and tried to focus on the clock on the wall by the bathroom door. It was almost six, still dark outside, and the cobwebs from a late-night bottle of wine blurred his eyes. His wife rolled over and grunted something he could not understand. Twenty minutes later he found her deep under the covers and kissed her goodbye. He might not be home for a week, he said, but doubted if she heard. Saturdays at work and days out of town were the norm, nothing unusual. But today would be unusual. He opened the door, and the dog ran into the backyard. How could an eleven-year-old kid simply disappear? The Memphis police had no idea. He just vanished, the lieutenant said. Not surprisingly, traffic was light in the pre-dawn hours as he headed for the federal building downtown. He punched numbers on his car phone. Agents Brenner, Latchy, and Durston were roused from sleep and instructed to meet him immediately. He flipped through his black book and found the Alexandria number for K.O. Lewis. K.O. was not asleep, but neither was he in the mood to be disturbed. He was eating his oatmeal, enjoying his coffee, chatting with his wife, and just how in the hell could an eleven-year-old kid disappear while in police custody, he demanded. Maxoon told him what he knew, which was nothing, and asked him to be ready to come to Memphis. It could be a long weekend. K.O. said he would make a couple of calls, find the jet, and call him back at the office. At the office, Maxoon called Larry Truman in New Orleans and was delighted when Truman answered the phone, disoriented and obviously trying to sleep. This was Truman's case, though Maxoon had worked on it all week. And just for fun, he called George Ord and asked him to come on down with the rest of the gang. Maxoon explained he was hungry and could George please bring some Egg McMuffins. By seven, Brenner, Latchy, and Durston were in his office gulping coffee and speculating wildly. Ord arrived next without the food. Then two uniformed Memphis policemen knocked on the door to the outer office. Ray Trimble, deputy chief of police and a legend in Memphis law enforcement, was with them. They assembled in Maxoon's office, and Trimble, in fluent cop talk, got right to the point. Subject was transported from the detention center by ambulance to St. Peter's around 10.30 last night. 
Subject was signed in by the paramedics at St. Peter's ER, at which time the paramedics left. Subject was not accompanied by Memphis police or jail personnel. Paramedics are certain. A nurse, one Gloria Watts, female, white, signed subject in, but no paperwork can be found. Ms. Watts has stated she had subject in ER intake room and was called out of room for an undetermined reason. She was absent for no more than 10 minutes, and upon her return, subject was gone. The paperwork was gone, too, and Ms. Watts assumed subject had been taken to ER for examination and treatment. Trimble slowed a bit and cleared his throat, as if this was somehow unpleasant. At approximately 5 this morning, Ms. Watts was evidently preparing to leave her shift, and she checked the intake records. She thought of the subject and began asking questions. Subject could not be found in ER, and admissions had no record of his arrival. Hospital security was called, then Memphis PD. At this time, a thorough search of the hospital is underway. Six hours, MacThune said in disbelief. I beg your pardon, Trimble said. It took six hours to realize the kid was missing. Yes, sir, but we don't run the hospital, you see. Why was the kid transported to the hospital without security? I can't answer that. An investigation will be undertaken. It looks like an oversight. Why was the kid taken to the hospital? Trimble took a file from a briefcase and handed MacThune a copy of Telda's report. He read it carefully. Says he went into shock after the U.S. Marshals left. What the hell were the Marshals doing there? Trimble opened the file again and handed MacThune the subpoena. He read it carefully, then handed it to George Ord. "'Anything else, Chief?' he said to Trimble, who had never taken a seat and had never stopped pacing slightly. He was anxious to leave. "'No, sir. We'll complete the search and call you immediately if we find anything. We've got about four dozen men there right now, and we've been checking for a little over an hour. Have you talked to the kid's mother? No, sir, not yet. She's still asleep. We're watching the room in case he tries to get to her.' I'll talk to her first, Chief. I'll be over in about an hour. Make sure no one sees her before I do. No problem. Thank you, Chief. Trimble clicked his heels together and for an instant looked as though he wanted to salute. He was gone, along with his officers. Macthoon looked at Brenner and Latchy. You guys call every available agent. Get them here right now. Immediately. They bolted from the room. What about the subpoena? He asked Ord, who was still holding it. I can't believe it. Foltrig's lost his mind. You knew nothing about it? Of course not. The kid is under the jurisdiction of the juvenile court. I wouldn't think of trying to reach him. Would you want to piss off Harry Roosevelt? I don't think so. We need to call him. I'll do it, and you call Reggie Love. I'd rather not talk to her. Lloyd left the room to find a phone. Call the U.S. Marshal, McThune snapped at Durston. Get the scoop on the subpoena. I want to know everything about it. Durston left, and suddenly MacThune was alone. He raced through a phone book until he found the Roosevelts. But there was no Harry. If he had a number, it was unlisted, and that was perfectly understandable, with no less than 50,000 single mothers trying to collect unpaid child support. MacThune made three quick calls to lawyers he knew, and the third one said that Harry lived on Kensington Street. He would send an agent when he could spare one. Ord returned, shaking his head. I talked to Reggie Love's mother, but she asked more questions than I did. I don't think she's there. I'll send two men as soon as possible. I guess you'd better call Fultrick, the dumbass. Yeah, I guess you're right. Ord turned and left the office again. At eight, MacThune left the elevator on the ninth floor of St. Peter's with Brenner and Durston following close behind. Three more agents decked out in a splendid variety of hospital garb met him at the elevator and walked with him to room 943. Three massive security guards stood near the door. MacThune knocked gently and motioned for his small squadron to back away. He didn't want to scare the poor woman. The door opened slightly. Yes, came a weak voice from the darkness. Miss Sway, I'm Jason McThune, Special Agent FBI. I saw you in court yesterday. The door opened wider and Diane stepped into the crack. She said nothing, just waited for his next words. Can I talk to you in private? She glanced to her left. Three security guards, two agents, and three men in scrubs and lab jackets. In private, she said. 
We can walk this way, he said, nodding toward the end of the hall. Is something the matter? she asked, as if nothing else could possibly go wrong. Yes, ma'am. She took a deep breath and disappeared. Seconds later, she eased through the door with her cigarettes and closed it gently behind her. They walked slowly in the center of the empty hall. I don't suppose you've talked to Mark, Maxune said. He called me yesterday afternoon from the jail, she said, sticking a cigarette between her lips. It was not a lie. Mark had indeed called her from the jail. Since then? No, she lied. Why? He's missing. She hesitated for a step, then continued. What do you mean he's missing? She was surprisingly calm. She's probably just numb to all this, Macthune thought. He gave her a quick version of Mark's disappearance. They stopped at the window and looked at downtown. "'My God, do you think the Mafia's got him?' she asked, and her eyes watered immediately. She held the cigarette with a trembling hand, unable to light it. Macthune shook his head confidently. "'No, they don't even know. We're keeping a lid on it. I think he just walked away. Right here in the hospital. We figured he might have tried to contact you. Have you searched this place? He knows it really well, you know.' They've been searching for three hours, but it looks doubtful. Where would he go? She finally lit the cigarette and took a long drag, then exhaled a small cloud. I have no idea. Well, let me ask you something. What do you know about Reggie Love? Is she in town this weekend? Was she planning a trip? Why? We can't find her either. She's not at home. Her mother ain't saying much. You received a subpoena last night, right? That's right. Well, Mark's got one, and they tried to serve one on Reggie Love, but they haven't found her yet. Is it possible Mark's with her? I hope so, Diane thought. She hadn't thought about this. In spite of the pills, she hadn't slept fifteen minutes since he'd called. But Mark on the loose with Reggie was a new idea, a much more pleasant idea. I don't know. It's possible, I guess. Where would they be, you know, the two of them together? How the hell am I supposed to know? You're the FBI. I hadn't thought about that until five seconds ago, and now you're asking me where they are? Give me a break. Macthune felt stupid. It was not a bright question, and she was not as frail as he thought. Diane puffed her cigarette and watched the cars crawl along the streets below. Knowing Mark, he was probably changing diapers in the nursery or assisting with surgery and orthopedics or maybe scrambling eggs in the kitchen. St. Peter's was the largest hospital in the state. There were thousands of people under its varied roofs. He'd roamed the halls and made dozens of friends, and it would take them days to find him. She expected him to call any minute. I need to get back, she said, sticking the filter in an ashtray. If he contacts you, I need to know it. Sure. And if you hear from Reggie Love, I'd appreciate a call. I'll leave two men here on this floor in case you need them. She walked away. By 8.30, Fultrick had assembled in his office the usual crew of Wally Box, Thomas Fink, and Larry Truman, who arrived last with his hair still wet from a quick shower. Fultrick was dressed like a fraternity pledge in his pressed chinos, starched cotton button-down, and shiny loafers. Truman wore a jogging suit. "'The lawyer's missing, too,' he announced as he poured coffee from a thermos. "'When did you hear this?' Fultrick asked. Five minutes ago on my car phone.' McThune called me. They went to her house to serve her around eight, but couldn't find her. She's disappeared. What else did McThune say? They're still searching the hospital. The kid spent three days there and knows it very well. I doubt if he's there, Fultrig said with his customary quick command of unknown facts. Does McThune think the kid's with the lawyer? Box asked. Who in hell knows? She'd be kind of stupid to help the kid escape, wouldn't she? She's not that brat. Fultrig said scornfully. Neither are you, thought Truman. You're the idiot who issued the subpoenas that started this latest episode. Maxoon's spoken twice this morning with K.O. Lewis. He's on standby. They plan to search the hospital until noon, then give up. If the kid's not found by then, Lewis will zip to Memphis. You think Moldano's involved? Fink asked. I doubt it. Looks like the kid strung them along until he got to the hospital, and at that point he was on home turf. I'll bet he called the lawyer, and now they're hiding somewhere in Memphis. I wonder if Moldano knows, Fink said, looking at Fultrick. 
His people are still in Memphis, Truman said. Gronky's here, but we haven't seen Bono or Perini. Hell, they might have a dozen boys up there by now. Has Macthune called in the dogs? Foltrick asked. Yeah, he's got everyone in his office working on it. They're watching her house, her secretary's apartment. They even sent two men to find Judge Roosevelt, who's fishing somewhere in the mountains. Memphis PD has the hospital choked off. What about the phones? Which phones? The phone's in the hospital room. He's a kid, Larry. You know we'll try to call his mother. It takes approval from the hospital. Macthune said they're working on it, but it's Saturday and the necessary people are not in. Fultrick stood behind his desk and walked to the window. The kid had six hours before anyone realized he was missing, right? That's what they said. Have they found the lawyer's car? No, they're still looking. I'll bet they don't find it in Memphis. I'll bet the kid and Miss Love are in the car. Oh, really? Yeah, hauling ass. And where might they be hauling ass to? Somewhere far away. At 9.30, a Memphis policeman called in the tag number of an illegally parked Mazda. It belonged to one Reggie Love. The message was quickly sent to Jason McThune at his office in the federal building. Ten minutes later, two FBI agents knocked on the door to apartment number 28 at Bellevue Gardens. They waited and knocked again. Clint hid in the bedroom. If they kicked the door down, then he would simply be sleeping on this lovely and peaceful Saturday morning. They knocked the third time, and the phone started to ring. It startled him, and he almost lunged for it, but his answering machine was on. If the cops would come to his apartment, then they would certainly not hesitate to call. After the tone, he heard Reggie's voice. He lifted the receiver and quickly whispered, Reggie, call me right back. He hung up. They knocked the fourth time and left. The lights were off, and the curtains covered every window. He stared at the phone for five minutes, and it finally rang. The answering machine gave its message, then the tone again. Again, it was Reggie. Hello, he said quickly. Good morning, Clint, she said cheerfully. How are things in Memphis? Oh, the usual. You know, cops watching my apartment, banging on the door. Typical Saturday. Cops? Yeah, for the past hour. I've been sitting in my closet watching my little television. The news is all over the place. They haven't mentioned you yet, but Mark's on every channel. Right now, it's simply a disappearance, not an escape. Have you talked to Diane? I called her about an hour ago. The FBI had just told her he was missing. I explained he was with you, and this calmed her a bit. Frankly, Reggie, she's been shocked so much, I don't think it registered. Where are you? We've checked into a hotel in Materi. I'm sorry, did you say Materi, as in Louisiana, right outside of New Orleans? That's the place. We drove all night. Why the hell are you down there, Reggie? Of all the places to hide, why did you pick a suburb of New Orleans? Why not Alaska? Because it's the last place we'd be expected. We're safe, Clint. I paid cash and registered under another name. We'll sleep a bit, then see the city. See the city? Come on, Reggie, what's going on? I'll explain it later. Have you talked to Mama Love? No, I'll call her right now. Do that. I'll call back this afternoon. You're crazy, Reggie. Do you know that? You've lost your mind. I know, but I've been crazy before. Goodbye now. Clint placed the phone on the table and stretched on the unmade bed. She had indeed been crazy before. Chapter 35 Barry the Blade entered the warehouse alone. Gone was the swaggering strut of the quickest gun in town. Gone was the smirking scowl of the cocky street hood. Gone were the flashy suit and Italian loafers. The earrings were in a pocket. The ponytail was tucked under his collar. He'd shaved just an hour ago. He climbed the rusted steps to the second level and thought about playing on these same stairs as a child. His father was alive then, and after school he'd hang around here until dark, watching containers come and go, listening to the stevedores, learning their language, smoking their cigarettes, looking at their magazines. It was a wonderful place to grow up, especially for a boy who wanted to be nothing but a gangster. Now the warehouse was not as busy. He walked along the runway next to the dirty painted windows overlooking the river. His steps echoed through the vast emptiness below. A few dusty containers were scattered about and hadn't been moved in years. His uncle's black Cadillacs were parked together near the docks. Tito, the faithful chauffeur, polished a fender. He glanced up at the sound of footsteps and waved at Barry. 
Though he was quite anxious, he walked deliberately, trying not to strut. Both hands were stuck deep in his pockets. He watched the river through the ancient windows. An imitation paddle-wheeler hauled tourists down river for a breathtaking tour of more warehouses and perhaps a barge or two. The runway stopped at a metal door. He pushed a button and looked directly into the camera above his head. A loud click and the door opened. Mo, a former stevedore who'd given him his first beer when he was twelve, stood there wearing a dreadful suit. Mo had at least four guns, either on him or within reach. He nodded at Barry and waved him on. Mo had been a friendly guy until he'd started wearing suits, which happened about the same time he saw the Godfather, and he hadn't smiled since. Barry walked through a room with two empty desks and knocked on a door. He took a deep breath. "'Come in,' a voice said gently, and he entered his uncle's office. Johnny Solari was aging nicely. A big man in his seventies, he stood straight and moved quickly. His hair was brilliantly gray, and not a fraction of the hairline had receded. His forehead was small, and the hair started two inches above the eyebrows and was slicked back in shiny waves. As usual, he wore a dark suit with a jacket hanging on a rack by the window. The tie was navy and terribly boring. The red suspenders were his trademark. He smiled at Barry and waved to a worn leather chair, the same one Barry had sat in as a child. Johnny was a gentleman, one of the last in a declining business being quickly overrun by younger men who were greedier and nastier, men like his nephew here. But it was a forced smile. This was not a social call. They'd talked more in the past three days than in the past three years. "'Bad news, Barry?' Johnny asked, knowing the answer. "'You might say so. The kids disappeared in Memphis.' Johnny stared icily at Barry, who for one of the few times in his life did not stare back. The eyes failed him. The lethal, legendary eyes of Barry the Blade Muldano were blinking and watching the floor. "'How could you be so stupid?' Johnny asked calmly. "'Stupid to leave the body around here. "'Stupid to tell your lawyer. "'Stupid, stupid, stupid.' "'The eyes blinked faster, and he shifted his weight. "'He nodded in agreement, now penitent. "'I need help, okay? "'Of course you need help. "'You've done a very stupid thing, "'and now you need someone to rescue you. "'It concerns all of us, I think.' Johnny's eyes flashed pure anger, but he controlled himself. He was always under control. Oh, really? Is that a threat, Barry? You're coming into my office to ask for help, and you're threatening me? Are you planning to do some talking? Come on, boy. If you're convicted, you'll take it to your grave. That's true, but I'd rather not be convicted, you know. There's still time. You're a dumbass, Barry. Have I ever told you that? I think so. You stalked the man for weeks. You caught him sneaking out of a dirty little whorehouse. All you had to do was hit him over the head, couple of bullets, clean out his pockets, leave the body for the whores to trip over, and the cops would say it's just another cheap murder. They would have never suspected anybody. But no, Barry, you're too dumb to keep it simple. Barry shifted again and watched the floor. Johnny glared at him and unwrapped a cigar. Answer my question slowly, okay? I don't want to know too much, you understand? Yeah. Is the body here in the city? Yeah. Johnny clipped the end of the cigar and licked it slowly. He shook his head in disgust. Ah, stupid... Is it easy to get to? Yeah. Have the feds been close to it? I don't think so. Is it underground? Yeah. How long will it take to dig it up or whatever you have to do? An hour, maybe two. So it's not in dirt. Concrete. Johnny lit the cigar with a match and relaxed the wrinkles above his eyes. Concrete, he repeated. Maybe the boy wasn't quite as stupid as he thought. Forget it. He was plenty stupid. How many men? Two or three. I can't do it. They're watching every move I make. If I go near the place, I'll just lead them to it. Plenty stupid, all right. He blew a smoke ring. 
a parking lot, a sidewalk, under a garage. Barry shifted again and kept his eyes on the floor. Johnny blew another smoke ring. A garage. A parking garage. A garage behind a house. He studied the thin layer of ashes at the end of the cigar, then slowly placed it between his teeth. He wasn't stupid. He was dumb. He puffed it twice. When you say house, do you mean a house on a street, with other houses near it? Yeah. At the time of the burial, Boyd Boyette had been in his trunk for twenty-five hours. Options were limited. He was near panic and afraid to leave the city. It wasn't such a bad idea at the time. And these other houses have people living in them, right? People with ears and eyes. I haven't met them, you know, but I would assume so. Don't get cute with me. Barry slid an inch in his chair. Sorry, he said. Johnny stood and walked slowly to the tinted windows directly above the river. He shook his head in disbelief and puffed his cigar in frustration. Then he turned and walked back to his seat. He placed the cigar in the ashtray and leaned forward on his elbows. Whose house? he asked, stone-faced and ready to explode. Barry swallowed hard and recrossed his legs. Jerome Clifford's. There was no eruption. Johnny was known to have ice water in his veins and took great pride in staying cool. He was a rarity in this profession, but his level head had made him lots of money and kept him alive. He placed his left hand completely over his mouth as if there was no way he could believe this. Jerome Clifford's house, he repeated. Barry nodded. At the time, Clifford had been skiing in Colorado, and Barry knew this because Clifford had invited him to go. He lived alone in a big house with dozens of shady trees. The garage was a separate structure sitting by itself in the backyard. It was a perfect place, he had thought, because no one would ever suspect it. And he'd been right, it was a perfect place. The feds hadn't been near it. It was not a mistake. He'd planned to move it later. The mistake had been to tell Clifford. And you want me to send in three men to dig it up without making a sound and dispose of it properly? Yes, sir. It could save my ass. Why do you say this? Because I'm afraid this kid knows where it is and he's disappeared. Who knows what he's doing? It's just too risky. We gotta move the body, Johnny. I'm begging you. I hate beggars, Barry. What if we get caught? What if a neighbor hears something and calls the cops and they show up just to check in on a prowler, you know? And son of a bitch, there's three boys digging up a corpse. They won't get caught. How do you know? How'd you do it? How'd you bury him in concrete without getting caught? I've done it before, okay? I want to know. Barry straightened himself a bit and recrossed his legs. The day after I hit him, I unloaded six bags of ready mix at the garage. I was in a truck with bogus tags dressed like a yard boy, you know. No one seemed to notice. The nearest house is a good thirty yards away, and there's trees everywhere. I went back at midnight in the same truck and unloaded the body in the garage. Then I left. There's a ditch behind the garage and a park on the other side of the ditch. I just walked through the trees, climbed across the ditch, and sneaked into the garage. Took about thirty minutes to dig a shallow grave, put the body in it, and mix the concrete. The floor of the garage is gravel, white rock, you know. I went back the next night after the stuff had dried and covered it with the gravel. He's got this old boat, and so I rolled the boat back over it. When I left, everything was perfect. Clifford never had a clue. Until you told him, of course. Yeah, until I told him. It was a mistake, I admit. Sounds like a lot of hard work. I've done it before, okay? It's easy. I was going to move it later, but then the feds got involved, and they followed me for eight months. Johnny was nervous now. He relit the cigar and returned to the window. You know, Barry, he said, looking at the water, You've got some talent, boy. But you're an idiot when it comes to removing the evidence. We've always used the golf out there. Whatever happened to barrels and chains and weights, 
I promise it won't happen again. Just help me now, and I'll never make this mistake again. There won't be a next time, Barry. If you somehow survive this, I'm going to let you drive a truck for a while, then maybe run a fence for a year or so. I don't know. Maybe you can go to Vegas and spend a little time with Rock. Barry stared at the back of the silver head. He'd lie for the moment, but he would not drive a truck or fence or kiss Rock's ass. Whatever you say, Johnny, just help me. Johnny returned to his seat behind the desk. He pinched the bridge of his nose. I guess it's urgent. Tonight. This kid's on the loose. He's scared, and it's just a matter of time before he tells someone. Johnny closed his eyes and shook his head. Barry continued. Give me three men. I'll tell them exactly how to do it, and I promise they won't get caught. It'll be easy. Johnny nodded, slowly, painfully. Okay. Okay. He stared at Barry. Now get the hell out of here. After seven hours of searching, Chief Trimble declared St. Peter's to be free of Mark's sway. He huddled in the lobby near admissions with his officers and pronounced the search over. They would continue to patrol the tunnels and walkways and corridors and stand guard at the elevators and stairwells, but they were all now convinced the kid had eluded them. Trimble called McThune at his office with the news. McThune was not surprised. He had been briefed periodically throughout the morning as the search fizzled, and there was no sign of Reggie. Mama Love had been bothered twice, and now she refused to answer the door. She told them to either produce a search warrant or get the hell off her property. There was no probable cause for a search warrant, and he suspected Mama Love knew this. The hospital had consented to the wiring of the phone in room 943. Less than thirty minutes earlier, two agents posing as orderlies had entered the room while Diane was down the hall talking to the Memphis police. Instead of inserting the device, they simply switched phones. They were in the room less than a minute. The child, they reported, was asleep and never moved. The line was direct to the outside, and tapping in through the hospital's switchboard would have taken at least two hours and involved other people. Clint had not been found, but there was no valid reason to obtain a search warrant for his apartment, so they simply watched it. Harry Roosevelt had been located in a rented boat somewhere along the Buffalo River in Arkansas. McThune had talked to him around eleven. Harry was livid, to say the least, and was now en route back to the city. Ord had called Fultrick twice during the morning, but uncharacteristically the great man had little to say. The brilliant strategy of ambush by subpoena had blown up in his face, and he was plotting some serious damage control. K.O. Lewis was already on board Director Voyle's jet, and two agents had been dispatched to meet him at the airport. He would arrive around two. An all-points bulletin for Mark Sway had been on the national wire since early morning. McThune was reluctant to add the name of Reggie Love to it. Though he hated lawyers, he found it difficult to believe one would actually help a child escape. But as the morning dragged on and there was no sign of her, he became convinced that their disappearances were more than coincidental. At eleven, he added her name to the APB, along with a physical description and a comment that she was probably traveling with Mark Sway. If they were in fact together, and if they'd crossed a state line, the offense would be federal and he'd have the pleasure of nailing her. There was little to do but wait. He and George Ord feasted on cold sandwiches and coffee for lunch. Another phone call, another reporter asking questions. No comment. Another phone call, and Agent Durston walked into the office and held up three fingers. Line three, he said. It's Brenner at the hospital. McThune hit the button. Yeah, he barked at the phone. Brenner was in room 945, next door to Ricky. He spoke in a guarded voice. Jason, listen. We just heard a call come from Clint Van Hooser to Diane Sway. He told her he'd just talked to Reggie, that she and Mark were in New Orleans and everything was fine. New Orleans? That's what he said. No indication of exactly where, just New Orleans. Diane said almost nothing, and the entire conversation lasted under two minutes. He said he was calling from his girlfriend's apartment in East Memphis, and he promised to call back later. Where in East Memphis? We can't determine that, and he didn't say... We'll try and trace it next time. He hung up too quick. I'll send the tape over. Do that. McThune punched another button and Brenner was gone. He immediately called Larry Truman in New Orleans. 
Chapter 36 The house was in the bend of an old shady street, and as they approached it, Mark instinctively slid downward in the seat until only his eyes and the top of his head were visible in the window. He was wearing a black and gold saint's cap Reggie had bought him at a Walmart, along with a pair of jeans and two sweatshirts. A street map was folded badly and stuffed beside the handbrake. "'It's a big house,' he said from under the cap as they drove through the bend without the slightest decrease in speed. Reggie saw as much as she could, but she was driving on a strange street and trying desperately not to appear suspicious. It was 3 p.m., hours before dark, and they could drive and look for the rest of the afternoon if they wished. She, too, wore a saint's cap, solid black, and it covered her short gray hair. Her eyes hid behind large sunglasses. She held her breath as they passed the mailbox with the name Clifford on the side in small gold stick-on lettering. It certainly was a big house, but nothing spectacular for this neighborhood. It was of English Tudor design, with dark wood and dark brick and ivy covering all of one side and most of the front. It was not particularly pretty, she thought, as she remembered the newspaper article in which Clifford was described as a divorced father of one. It was obvious to her, at least, that the house did not have the advantage of a woman living in it. Though she could glance at it only as she made the bend and cut her eyes in all directions, looking at once for neighbors, cops, thugs, the garage, and the house, she noticed there were no flowers in the beds and the hedges needed trimming. The windows were covered with dark, drab curtains. It was not pretty, but it was certainly peaceful. It sat in the center of a large lot with dozens of heavy oaks around it. The driveway ran along a thick hedge and disappeared somewhere around back. Though Clifford had been dead for five days, the grass was neatly trimmed. There was no clue that the house was now uninhabited. There was no hint of any suspicion. Perhaps it was the perfect place to hide a body. There's a garage, Mark said, peeking now. It was a separate structure, fifty or so feet from the house, obviously built much later. A small sidewalk led to the house. A red Triumph Spitfire was on blocks next to the garage. Mark jerked and stared at the house through the rear window as they eased down the street. What do you think, Reggie? Looks awfully quiet, doesn't it? Yeah. Is it what you expected? she asked. I don't know. I watch all those cop shows, you know, and for some reason I could just see Romy's house with yellow police line tapes strung all over the place. Why? No crime was committed here. It's just the home of a man who committed suicide. Why would the cops be interested? The house was out of sight, and Mark turned around and sat straight in the seat. Do you think they've searched it? he asked. Probably. I'm sure they got a search warrant for his house and office, but what could they find? He carried his little secret with him. They stopped at an intersection, then continued their tour of the neighborhood. "'What happens to his house?' Mark asked. "'I'm sure he had a will. His heirs will get the house and his assets.' "'Yeah. You know, Reggie, I guess I need a will, with everybody after me and all. What do you think? What exactly do you own? Well, now that I'm famous and all, I figure the Hollywood people will be knocking on my door.' I realize we don't have a door at the present time, but something's got to happen about that, Reggie, don't you think? I mean, we got to have a door of some sort. Anyway, they'll want to do this big movie about the kid who knew too much, and I hate to say this for obvious reasons, but if these goons put me away, then the movie will be huge and Mom and Ricky will be on Easy Street. Follow me? I think so. You want a will so Diane and Ricky will get the movie rights to your life story? Exactly. You don't need one. Why not? They'll get all your assets anyway. Just as well. Saves me attorney's fees. Could we talk about something other than wills and death? He shut up and watched the houses on his side of the street. He'd slept most of the night in the back seat, then napped for five hours in the motel room. She, on the other hand, had driven all night and napped less than two hours. She was tired, scared, and beginning to snap at him. They zigzagged at a leisurely pace through the tree-lined streets. The weather was warm and clear. At every house, people were either mowing grass or pulling weeds or painting shutters. Spanish moss hung from stately oaks. It was Reggie's first tour of New Orleans, and she wished the circumstances were better. 
Are you getting tired of me, Reggie? He asked without looking at her. Of course not. Are you tired of me? No, Reggie. Right now you're my only friend in the entire world. I just hope I'm not bugging you. I promise. Reggie had studied the street map for two hours. She completed a wide loop, and now they were on Romy's street again. They eased by the house without slowing, both gawking at the double garage with a pitched gable above the retractable doors. It needed painting. The concrete drive stopped twenty feet from the doors and turned to the rear of the house. A ragged hedgerow over six feet high ran along one side of the garage and blocked the view of the nearest house, which was at least a hundred feet away. Behind the garage, the small rear lawn stopped at a chain-link fence, and beyond the fence was a heavily wooded area. They said nothing during the second viewing of Romy's house. The black accord wandered aimlessly through the neighborhood and stopped near a tennis court in an open area called West Park. Reggie unfolded the street map and twisted and flipped it until it covered most of the front seat. Mark watched two heavy housewives engage in truly horrible tennis, but they were cute with their pink and green socks and matching sun visors. A biker approached on a narrow asphalt trail, then disappeared deep into the woods. Once again, Reggie attempted to fold the map. This is the place, she said. Do you want a chicken out? he asked. "'Sort of. What about you?' "'I don't know. We've come this far. Seems kind of silly to run away now. The garage looked harmless to me.' She was still holding the map. "'I guess we can try, and if we get spooked, we'll just run back here. Where are we now?' She opened her door. "'Let's go for a walk.' The bike trail ran beside a soccer field, then cut through a dense section of woods. The branches of the trees met above it, giving a tunnel-like darkness. The bright sunlight flickered through intermittently. An occasional biker forced them from the asphalt for a few seconds. The walk was refreshing. After three days in the hospital, two days in jail, seven hours in the car, and six hours in the motel, Mark could barely restrain himself as they rambled through the woods. He missed his bike, and he thought how nice it would be if he and Ricky were here on this trail, racing through the trees without a worry in the world, just kids again. He missed the crowded streets of the trailer park with kids running everywhere and games of all sorts materializing without a moment's notice. He missed the private little trails of his own woods around Tucker Wheel Estates and the long, solitary walks he had enjoyed all his life. And, strange as it seemed, he missed his hiding places under his own personal trees and beside creeks that belonged to him, where he could sit and think and, yes, sneak a cigarette or two. He hadn't touched one since Monday. "'What am I doing here?' he asked, barely audible. "'It was your idea,' she said, hands stuck deep in her new jeans, also from Walmart. "'It's been my favorite question this week. What am I doing here?' I've asked it everywhere. The hospital, the jail, the courtroom, everywhere. You want to go home, Mark? What's home? Memphis. I'll take you back to your mother. Yeah, but I won't stay with her, will I? In fact, we probably wouldn't even make it to Ricky's room before they grabbed me, and off I'd go back to jail, back to court, back to see Harry, who'd really be ticked, wouldn't he? Yeah, but I can work on Harry. Nobody worked on Harry, Mark had decided. He could see himself sitting in court trying to explain why he'd escaped. Harry would send him back to the detention center where his sweetheart, Doreen, would be a different person. No pizza, no television. They'd probably put leg chains on him and throw him in solitary. I can't go back, Reggie, not now. They had discussed their various options until both were tired of the subject. Nothing had been settled. Each new idea immediately raised a dozen problems. Each course of action ran in all directions and eventually led to disaster. They had both reached through different routes the unmistakable conclusion that there was no simple solution. There was no reasonable thing to do. There was no plan even remotely attractive. But neither believed they would actually dig for the body of Boyd Boyette. Something would happen along the way to spook them and they'd run back to Memphis. This was yet to be admitted by either. Reggie stopped at the half-mile marker. To the left was an open grassy area with a pavilion in the center for picnics. 
To the right, a small foot trail ventured deeper into the trees. Let's try this, she said, and they left the bike route. He followed close behind. You know where you're going? No, but follow me anyway. The trail widened a bit, then suddenly gave out and disappeared. Empty beer bottles and chip bags littered the ground. They wove through trees and brush until they found a small clearing. The sun was suddenly bright. Reggie shielded her eyes with her hand and looked at a straight row of trees stretching before them. I think that's the creek, she said. What creek? According to the map, Clifford Street borders West Park, and there's a little green line that appears to be a creek or bayou or something running behind his house. It's nothing but trees. She shuffled sideways for a few feet, then stopped and pointed. Look, there are roofs on the other side of those trees. I think it's Clifford Street. Mark stood beside her and strained on tiptoes. I see them. Follow me, she said, and they headed for the row of trees. It was a beautiful day. They were out for a stroll in the park. This was public property, nothing to be afraid of. The creek was nothing but a dry bed of sand and litter. They picked their way down through the vines and brush and stood where the water once ran many years before. Even the mud had dried. They climbed the opposite bank, a much steeper one, but with more vines and saplings to grab onto. Reggie was breathing hard when they stopped on the other side of the creek bed. "'Are you scared?' she asked. "'No, are you?' "'Of course, and you are, too. Do you want to keep going?' "'Sure, and I'm not afraid. We're just out for a hike, that's all.' He was terrified and wanted to run, but they had made it this far without incident, and there was a certain thrill in sneaking through the jungle like this. He'd done it a thousand times around the trailer park. He knew to watch for snakes and poison ivy. He'd learned how to line up three trees ahead of him to keep from getting lost. He'd played hide-and-seek in rougher terrain than this. He suddenly crouched low and darted ahead. "'Follow me.' "'This is not a game,' she said. "'Just follow me, unless, of course, you are scared.' "'I'm terrified. I'm fifty-two years old, Mark. Now slow down.' The first fence they saw was made of cedar, and they stayed in the trees and moved behind the houses. A dog barked in their general direction, but they could not be seen from the house. Then a chain-link fence, but it was not Clifford's. The woods and underbrush thickened, but from nowhere came a small trail that ran parallel to the fence row. Then they saw it. On the other side of a chain-link fence, the Red Triumph Spitfire sat alone and abandoned next to Romy's garage. The edge of the wood stopped less than twenty feet from the fence, and between it and the rear wall of the garage a dozen or so oaks and elms with Spanish moss shaded the backyard. Not surprisingly, Romy was a slob. He had piled boards and bricks, buckets and rakes, all sort of debris, behind the garage and out of sight of the street. There was a small gate in the chain-link fence. The garage had a window and a door in the rear wall. Sacks of unused and ruined fertilizer were stacked against it. An old lawnmower with the handles off was parked by the door. On the whole, the yard was overgrown and had been for some time. Weeds along the fence were knee-high. They squatted in the trees and stared at the garage. They would get no closer. The neighbor's patio and charcoal grill were a stone's throw away. Reggie tried to catch her breath, but it was not possible. She clutched Mark's hand and found it impossible to believe that the body of a United States senator was buried less than a hundred feet from where she was now hiding. "'Are we going to go in there?' Mark asked. It was almost a challenge, though she detected a trace of fear. "'Good,' she thought. "'He is scared.' She caught her breath long enough to whisper, No, we've come far enough. He hesitated for a long time, then said, It'll be easy. It's a big garage, she said. I know exactly where it is. Well, I haven't pressed you on this, but don't you think it's time to share it with me? It's under the boat. He told you this? Yes. He was very specific. It's buried under the boat. What if there's no boat? Then we haul ass. He was finally sweating and breathing hard. She'd seen enough. She stayed low and began backing away. I'm leaving now, she said. K.O. Lewis never left the plane. Macthune and company were waiting when it landed and they rushed aboard as it refueled. 
Thirty minutes later they left for New Orleans, where Larry Truman now waited anxiously. Lewis didn't like it. What the hell was he supposed to do in New Orleans? It was a big city. They had no idea what she was driving. In fact, they didn't know if Reggie and Mark had driven, flown, or taken a bus or a train. It was a tourist and convention city with thousands of hotel rooms and crowded streets. Until they made a mistake, it would be impossible to find them. But Director Voyles wanted him on the scene, and so off he went to New Orleans. Find the kid and make him talk. Those were his instructions. Promise him anything. Chapter 37 Two of the three, Leo and Iannucci, were veteran leg-breakers for the Solari family and were actually related by blood to Barry the Blade, though they often denied it. The third, a huge kid with massive biceps, a wide neck, and thick waist, was known simply as the Bull, for obvious reasons. He'd been sent on this unusual errand to perform most of the grunt work. Barry assured them it would not be difficult. The concrete was thin. The body was small. Chip a little here and chip a little there, and before they knew it, they'd see a black garbage bag. Barry had diagrammed the floor of the garage and marked with exact confidence the position of the grave. He'd drawn a map with a line starting at the parking lot of West Park and running between the tennis courts across the soccer field, through a patch of trees, then across another field with a picnic pavilion, then along the bike route, four ways until a footpath led to the ditch. It would be easy, he had assured them all afternoon. The bike trail was deserted, and with good reason. It was ten minutes after eleven Saturday night. The air was muggy, and by the time they reached the footpath they were breathing heavily and sweating. The bull, much younger and fitter, followed the other two and smiled to himself as they bitched quietly in the blackness about the humidity. They were in their late thirties, he guessed. Chain smokers, of course, abusive drinkers, sloppy eaters. They were griping about sweating, and they hadn't walked a mile yet. Leo was in charge of this expedition, and he carried the flashlight. They were dressed in solid black. Iannucci followed like a bloodhound with heartworms, head down, breathing hard, lethargic, mad at the world for being there. Careful, Leo said as they eased down the ditch bank in heavy weeds. They were not exactly woodsy types. This place had been frightening enough at 6 p.m. when they first walked it off. Now it was terrifying. The bull expected at any moment to step on a thick, squirming snake. Of course, if he was bitten, he could turn around with justification, and he hoped find the car. His two buddies would then be forced to go it alone. He tripped on a log, but kept his balance. He almost wished for a snake. Careful, Leo said for the tenth time, as if saying it made things safer. They eased along the dark and weedy creek bed for two hundred yards, then climbed the other bank. The flashlight was turned off, and they crouched low through the brush until they were behind Clifford's chain-link fence. They rested on their knees. "'This is stupid, you know,' Iannucci said between loud breaths. "'Since when do we dig up bodies?' Leo was surveying the darkness of Clifford's backyard. Not a single light. They had driven by only minutes earlier and noticed a small gaslight burning in a globe near the front door, but the rear was complete darkness. "'Shut up.' he said, without moving his head. "'Yeah, yeah,' Iannucci mumbled. "'It's stupid.' His screaming lungs were almost audible. Sweat dripped from his chin. The bull knelt behind them, shaking his head at their unfitness. They were used primarily as bodyguards and drivers, occupations that required little exertion. Legend held that Leo did his first killing when he was seventeen, but was forced to quit a few years later when he served time. The bull had heard that Iannucci had been shot twice over the years, but this was unconfirmed. The people who generated these stories were not known for telling the truth. "'Let's go,' Leo said like a field marshal. They scooted across the grass to the gate in Clifford's fence, then through it. They darted between the trees until they landed against the rear wall of the garage. Iannucci was in pain. He fell to all fours and heaved mightily. Leo crawled to a corner and looked for movement next door. Nothing. Nothing but the sounds of Iannucci's impending cardiac arrest. The bull peeked around the other corner and watched the rear of Clifford's house. The neighborhood was asleep. Even the dogs had called in a night. Leo stood and tried to open the rear door. 
It was locked. Stay here, he said, and slid low around the garage until he came to the front door. It was locked also. Back to the rear, he said. We gotta break some glass. It's locked, too. Iannucci produced a hammer from a pouch on his waist, and Leo began tapping lightly on the dirty pane just above the doorknob. "'Watch that corner,' he said to the bull, who crawled behind him and looked in the direction of the Ballantine home next door. Leo packed and packed until the pane was broken. He carefully removed broken pieces and tossed them aside. When the jagged edges were clear, he slid his left arm through and unlocked the door. He turned on the flashlight, and the three eased inside. Barry said he remembered the place being a mess, and Clifford obviously had been too busy to tidy things up before he passed on. The first thing they noticed was that the floor was gravel, not concrete. Leo kicked at the white rocks beneath his feet. If Barry had told them about the gravel flooring, he didn't remember it. The boat was in the center of the garage. It was a sixteen-foot outboard ski rig with a heavy layer of dust over it. Three of the four trailer tires were flat. The boat had not touched water in years. Layers of junk were piled against it. Garden tools, sacks of aluminum cans, stacks of newspapers, rusted patio furniture. Romy didn't need a garbage service. Hell, he had a garage. Thick spider webs were strung in every corner. Unused tools hung from the walls. Clifford, for some reason, had been a prodigious collector of wire clothes hangers. Thousands of them hung on strands of wire above the boat. Rows and rows of clothes hangers. At some point he'd grown weary of running the wire, so he'd simply driven long nails into the wall studs and packed hundreds of hangers on them. Romy, the environmentalist, had also collected cans and plastic containers, obviously with the lofty goal of recycling. But he'd been a busy man, and so a small mountain of green garbage bags stuffed with cans and bottles filled half of the garage. He'd been such a slob he'd even thrown some of the bags into the boat. Leo aimed the small light at a point directly under the main beam of the trailer. He motioned for the bull, who eased onto all fours, and began brushing away the white rock gravel. From the waste pouch, Iannucci produced a small trowel. The bull took it and scraped away more gravel. His two partners stood over his shoulders. Two inches down, the scraping sound changed when he struck concrete. The boat was in the way. The bull stood, slowly lifted the hitch, and with a mighty strain rolled the front of the trailer five feet to the side. The side of the trailer brushed against the mountain of aluminum cans, and there was a prolonged racket. The men froze and listened. "'You've got to be careful,' Leo whispered the obvious. "'Stay here and don't move.' He left them standing in the dark beside the boat and eased through the rear door. He stood beside a tree behind the garage and watched the Ballantine house next door. It was dark and quiet. A patio light cast a dim glow around the grill and flower beds, but nothing moved. Leo watched and waited. He doubted the neighbors could hear a jackhammer. He crept back inside the garage and aimed the flashlight at the spot of concrete under the gravel. Let's clear it off, he said, and the bull returned to his knees. Barry had explained that he'd first dug a shallow grave approximately six feet by two feet and no more than eighteen inches deep. Then he'd stuffed the body into it. Then he'd packed the pre-mixed concrete around the body, which was wrapped in black plastic garbage bags. Then he'd added water to his little recipe. He'd returned the next day to cover it all with gravel and put the boat in place. He'd done a fine job. Given Clifford's talent for organization, it would be another five years before the boat was moved. Barry had explained that this was just a temporary grave. He'd planned to move it, but the feds started trailing him. Leo and Iannucci had disposed of a few bodies, usually in weighted barrels over water, but they were impressed with Barry's temporary hiding place. The bull scraped and brushed, and soon the entire concrete surface was clear. Iannucci knelt on the other side of it, and he and the bull began chipping away with chisels and hammers. Leo placed the flashlight on the gravel beside them and eased again through the rear door. He crouched low and moved to the front of the garage. All was quiet. The chiseling could be heard all right. He walked quickly to the rear of Clifford's house, maybe fifty feet away, and the sounds were barely audible. He smiled to himself. Had the Ballantines been awake, they could not have heard it. He darted back to the garage and sat in the darkness between a corner and the spitfire. He could see the empty street. A small black car eased around the bend in front of the house and was gone. No other traffic. 
Through the hedge he could see the outline of the Ballantine house. Nothing moved. The only sounds were the muffled chippings of concrete from the grave of Boyd Boyette. Clint's Accord stopped near the tennis courts. A red Cadillac was parked near the street. Reggie turned off the lights and the engine. They sat in silence and stared through the windshield at the dark soccer field. This is a wonderful place to get mugged, she thought to herself, but didn't mention it. There was plenty to fear without thinking of muggers. Mark hadn't said much since dark. They had napped together on one bed for an hour after the pizza had been delivered to their motel room. They had watched television. He had asked her repeatedly about the time, as if he had an appointment with a firing squad. At ten she was convinced he would chicken out. At eleven he was pacing around the room and going back and forth to the bathroom. But here they were at eleven forty-five, sitting in a hot car on a dark night, planning an impossible mission that neither really wanted. "'Do you think anybody knows we're here?' he asked softly. She looked at him. His gaze was lost somewhere beyond the soccer field. "'You mean here in New Orleans?' "'Yeah. Do you think anyone knows we're in New Orleans?' "'No. I don't think so.' This seemed to satisfy him. She talked to Clint around seven. A Memphis TV station had reported that she was missing as well, but things appeared to be quiet. Clint hadn't left his bedroom in twelve hours, he said, so would they please hurry up and do whatever the hell they were planning? He'd called Mama Love. She was worried, but doing okay under the circumstances. They left the car and walked along the bike trail. "'Are you sure you want to do this?' she asked, looking around nervously. The trail was pitch black, and in places only the asphalt beneath their feet kept them from wandering into the trees. They walked slowly, side by side, and held hands. As she took one uncertain step after another, Reggie asked herself what she was doing here on this trail, in these woods of this city, at this moment, with this kid whom she loved dearly but was not willing to die for. She clutched his hand and tried to be brave. Surely, she prayed, something would happen very soon, and they would dash back to the car and leave New Orleans. I've been thinking, Mark said. Why am I not surprised? It might be too hard to actually find the body, you know. So this is what I've decided. You'll stay in the trees close to the ditch, you see, and I'll sneak through the backyard and into the garage. I'll look under the boat, you know, just to make sure it's there. Then we'll get out of here. You think you can just look under the boat and see the body? Maybe I can see where it is, you know. She squeezed his hand tighter. Listen to me, Mark. We're sticking together, okay? If you go to the garage, then I'm going too. Her voice was remarkably firm. Surely they wouldn't make it to the garage. There was a break in the trees. A light on a pole revealed the picnic pavilion to their left. The footpath started to the right. Mark pressed a switch, and the beam from a small flashlight hit the ground in front of them. "'Follow me,' he said. "'Nobody can see us out here.' He moved deftly through the woods without a sound. Back in the motel room he had recounted many stories of his late-night walks through the woods around the trailer park and of the games the boys played in the darkness. Jungled games, he called them. With the light in his hand he moved faster now, brushing past limbs and dodging saplings. "'Slow down, Mark,' she said more than once. He held her hand and helped her down the ditch bank. They climbed to the other side and crept through the woods and underbrush until they found the mysterious trail that had surprised them hours earlier. The fences started. They moved slowly, quietly, and Mark turned off the flashlight. They were in the dense trees directly behind Clifford's house. They knelt and caught their breath. Through the brush and weeds they could see the outline of the rear of the garage. "'What if we don't see the body?' she asked. "'What then? We'll worry about that when it happens.' This was not the moment for another long discussion about his options. On all fours he crawled to the edge of the thick underbrush. She followed. They stopped twenty feet from the gate in thick wet weeds. The backyard was dark and still, not a light or sound or movement. The entire street was sound asleep. "'Reggie, I want you to stay here. Keep your head down. I'll be back in a minute.' "'No!' she whispered loudly. "'You can't do this, Mark!' He was already moving. This was a game to him, just another jungle game with his little buddies giving chase and shooting guns with colored water. He slid through the grass like a lizard and opened the gate just wide enough to slide through. 
Reggie followed on all fours through the weeds, then stopped. He was already out of sight. He stopped behind the first tree and listened. He crawled to the next one and heard something. Chink, chink. He froze on his hands and knees. The sounds were coming from the garage. Chink, chink. Very slowly he peeked around the tree and stared at the rear door. Chink, chink. He glanced back at Reggie, but the woods and underbrush were black. She was nowhere in sight. He looked at the door again. Something was different. He crawled to the next tree ten feet closer. The sounds were louder. The door was open slightly, and a window pane was missing. Somebody was in there. Chink, chink, chink. Somebody was hiding in there with the lights off, and he was digging. Mark breathed deeply and crawled behind a pile of debris less than ten feet from the rear door. He hadn't made a sound, and he knew it. The grass was taller around the debris, and he crawled through it like a chameleon, very slowly. Chink, chink. He crouched low and started for the rear door. The ragged end of a rotted two-by-four caught his ankle, and he tripped. The pile of debris rattled, and an empty paint bucket fell to the ground. Leo bounced to his feet and darted to the rear of the garage. He yanked a thirty-eight with a silencer from his waist and scooted in the darkness until he was at the corner, where he squatted and listened. The chiseling had stopped inside. Iannucci peeked through the rear door. Reggie heard the racket behind the garage and fell to her stomach in the wet grass. She closed her eyes and said a prayer. What the hell was she doing here? Leo sneaked to the pile of debris, then cut around it with the gun drawn and ready to fire. He squatted again and patiently studied the darkness. The fence was barely visible. Nothing moved. He slid next to a tree fifteen feet behind the garage and waited. Iannucci watched him closely. Long seconds passed without a sound. Leo stood upright and crept slowly toward the gate. A twig snapped under his foot, freezing him in place for a second. He moved around the backyard, bolder now, but with the gun still steady, and leaned against a tree, a thick oak with limbs hanging low near the Ballantine property line. In the unkempt hedgerow less than twelve feet away, Mark crouched on all fours and held his breath. He watched the dark figure move between the trees in the darkness, and he knew if he kept still he would not be found. He exhaled slowly, his eyes glued to the silhouette of the man by the tree. "'What is it?' a deep voice asked from the garage. Leo slid the gun into the waist of his pants and eased backward. Iannucci was standing outside the door. "'What is it?' he repeated. "'I don't know,' Leo said in a half-whisper. Maybe just a cat or something. Get back to work. The door closed softly, and Leo paced silently back and forth behind the garage for five minutes. Five minutes, but it seemed like an hour to Mark. Then the dark figure eased around the corner and was gone. Mark watched every move. He slowly counted to one hundred, then crawled along the hedgerow until it stopped at the fence. He paused at the gate and counted to thirty. All was quiet except for the distant muffled chiseling. Then he darted to the edge of the brush where Reggie was crouching in terror. She grabbed him as they ducked into the heavier undergrowth. They're in there, he said, out of breath. Who? I don't know. They're digging up the body. What happened? He was breathing rapidly. His head bobbed up and down as he swallowed and tried to speak. I tripped on something, and this one guy, I think he had a gun, almost found me. God, I was scared. You're still scared, and so am I. Let's get out of here. Listen, Reggie. Wait a minute. Listen, can you hear it? No. Hear what? That chinkin' noise. I can't hear it either. We're too far away. And I say we get farther away. Let's go. Just wait a minute, Reggie. Damn it. They're killers, Mark. They're mafia people. Let's get the hell out of here. He breathed through his teeth and glared at her. Settle down, Reggie. Just settle down, okay? Look. No one can see us here. You can't even see these trees from the garage. I tried, okay? Now settle down. She fell to her knees, and they stared at the garage. He placed his finger to his lips. We're safe here, okay? He whispered. Listen. They listened, but the sounds could not be heard. Mark, these are Moldano's people. They know you've escaped. They're panicking. They've got guns and knives and who knows what else. Let's go. They beat us. It's all over. They win. We can't let them take the body, Reggie. 
Think about it. If they get away with it, it'll never be found. Good. You're off the hook and the mafia forgets about you. Now let's go. No, Reggie. We got to do something. What? You want to pick a fight with mafia thugs? Come on, Mark. This is crazy. Just wait a minute. Okay, I'll wait exactly one minute. Then I'm gone. He turned and smiled at her. You won't leave me, Reggie. I know you better than that. Don't push me, Mark. Now I know how Ricky felt when you were playing around with Clifford and his little water hose. Just be quiet, okay? I'm thinking. That's what scares me. She sat on her butt with her legs crossed in front of her. Leaves and vines rubbed her face and neck. He rocked gently on all fours like a lion ready to kill and finally said, I've got an idea. Of course you do. Stay here. She suddenly grabbed the back of his neck and pulled his face to hers. Listen, Buster, this is not one of your little jungle games where you shoot rubber darts and throw dirt clods. Those are not your little buddies in there playing hide-and-seek or G.I. Joe or whatever the hell you play. This is life and death, Mark. You just made one mistake and you got lucky. One more and you'll be dead. Now let's get the hell out of here now. He was still for a few seconds as she scolded him. Then he jerked viciously away. Stay here and don't move, he said with stiff jaws. He crept from the brush through the grass to the fence. Just inside the gate was an abandoned flower bed outlined with sunken timbers and covered with weeds. He crawled to it and picked out three rocks with all the fussiness of a chef selecting tomatoes at the market. He watched both corners of the garage, then made a silent retreat into the darkness. Reggie was waiting, and she'd not moved a muscle. He knew she could not find her way to the car. He knew she needed him. They huddled again in the brush. "'Mark, this is insane, son,' she pleaded. "'Please, these people are not playing games.' They're too busy to worry about us, okay? We're safe here, Reggie. Look, if they came tearing out of that door right now, they could never find us. We're safe here, Reggie. Trust me. Trust you? You'll get yourself killed. Stay here. What? Please, Mark, no more games. He ignored her and pointed to a spot near three trees about thirty feet away. I'll be right back, he said, and he disappeared. He crawled through the brush until he was behind the Ballantine house, he could barely see the edge of Romy's garage. Reggie was lost in the dark undergrowth. The patio was small and dimly lit. There were three white wicker chairs and a charcoal grill. A large plate glass window overlooked it, and it was this window that attracted his attention. He stood behind a tree and measured the distance which he estimated to be the length of two house trailers. The rock would have to be low enough to miss the branches, yet high enough to clear a row of hedges. He took a deep breath and threw it as hard as he could. Leo jumped at the sound from next door. He crept in front of the garage and peeked through the hedge. The patio was quiet and still. It sounded like a rock landing on wooden decking and rattling around next to the brick. Maybe it was just a dog. He watched for a long time and nothing happened. They were safe. Another false alarm. Mr. Ballantyne rolled over and stared at the ceiling. He was in his early sixties, and sleep had been difficult since the removal of the disc a year and a half ago. He'd just dozed off and was awakened by a sound. Or was it a sound? No place was safe in New Orleans any more, and he'd paid two thousand dollars for an alarm system six months earlier. Crime was everywhere. They were thinking about moving. He rolled to one side and had just closed his eyes when the window crashed. He bolted to the door, turned on the bedroom light, and yelled, Get up, Wanda! Get up! Wanda was reaching for her robe, and Mr. Ballantyne was grabbing the shotgun from the closet. The alarm was wailing. They raced down the hall, yelling at each other and flipping on light switches. The glass had scattered throughout the den, and Mr. Ballantyne aimed the shotgun at the window as if to prevent another attack. Call the police, he barked at her. 911! I know the number. Hurry up! He tiptoed in his house shoes around the glass, crouching low with the gun, as if a burglar had chosen to enter the house through the window. He fought his way to the kitchen, where he punched numbers on a control panel, and the sirens stopped. Leo had just resettled into his guard post next to the spitfire when the crash shattered the stillness. He bit a hole in his tongue as he scrambled to his feet and darted once again to the hedge. A siren screamed briefly, then stopped. A man in a red nightshirt down to his knees was running onto the patio with a shotgun. 
Leo crept quickly to the rear door of the garage. Ayanuchi and the bull were crouched in terror beside the boat. Leo stepped on a rake, and the handle landed on a bag full of aluminum cans. The three stopped breathing. Voices could be heard next door. "'What the hell is it?' Ayanuchi demanded through clenched teeth. He and the bull were shiny with sweat. Their shirts were stuck to their bodies. Their heads were soaking wet. "'I don't know,' Leo bristled, spitting blood, inching toward the window facing the hedge that separated the Ballantine property. "'Something went through a window, I think. I don't know. Crazy bastard's got a shotgun.' "'A what?' Ayanuchi almost shrieked. He and the bull slowly raised their heads to the window and joined Leo there. The crazy man with the shotgun was stomping around his backyard, yelling at the trees. Mr. Ballantyne was sick of New Orleans and sick of drugs and sick of punks trying to rob and pillage, and he was sick of crime and living in fear like this, and he was just so damned sick of it all, he raised his shotgun and fired once at the trees for good measure. That'll teach the slimy little bastards that he meant business. Come back to his house and you'll leave in a hearse. Boom! Mrs. Ballantyne stood in the doorway in her pink robe and screamed when he fired and wounded the trees. The three heads in the garage next door hit the dirt when the shooting started. Some bitch is crazy, Leo screeched. Slowly they raised their heads again in perfect unison, and at precisely that instant the first police car pulled into the Ballantyne driveway with blue and red lights flashing wildly. Ayanucci was the first one out the door, followed by the bull, then Leo. They were in a huge hurry, but at the same time careful not to attract attention from the idiots next door. They scooted along close to the ground, dashing from tree to tree, trying desperately to make it to the woods before there was more gunfire. The retreat was orderly. Mark and Reggie huddled deep in the brush. "'You're crazy,' she kept muttering, and it was not idle talk. She honestly believed that her client was mentally unbalanced. But she hugged him anyway, and they squeezed close together. They didn't see the three silhouettes scampering along until they crossed through the fence. "'There they are,' Mark whispered, pointing. Not thirty seconds earlier he had told her to watch the gate. Three of them,' he whispered. The three leaped into the underbrush less than twenty feet from where they were hiding and disappeared into the woods. They squeezed closer together. "'You're crazy,' she said again. "'Maybe so, but it's working.' The shotgun blast had almost sent Reggie over the edge. She'd been trembling when they arrived here. She'd been mortified when he returned with news that someone was in the garage. She damn near screamed when he threw the rock through the window. But the shotgun was the final straw. Her heart was pounding and her hands were trembling. And, oddly, at this moment, she knew they couldn't run. The three grave robbers were now between them and their car. There was no escape. The shotgun blast brought the neighborhood to life. Floodlights filled backyards as men and women in bathrobes walked onto patios and looked in the direction of the Ballantines. Voices shouted inquiries across fences. Dogs came to life. Mark and Reggie withdrew deeper into the brush. Mr. Ballantine and one of the cops walked along the rear fence, searching perhaps for more felonious rocks. It was hopeless. Reggie and Mark could hear voices, but they could not understand what was being said. Mr. Ballantyne yelled a lot. The cops settled him down, then helped him tape clear plastic over the window. The red and blue lights were turned off, and after twenty minutes the cops left. Reggie and Mark waited, trembling and holding hands. Bugs crawled over their skin. The mosquitoes were brutal. The weeds and burrs stuck to their dark sweatshirts. The lights in the Ballantyne house finally went off, and they waited some more. Chapter 38 A few minutes after one, the clouds broke, and the half-moon lightened Romy's backyard and garage for a moment. Reggie glanced at her watch. Her legs were numb from squatting, her back ached from sitting on her tail. Oddly, though, she'd become accustomed to her little spot in the jungle, and after surviving the thugs, the cops, and the idiot with the shotgun, she was feeling remarkably safe. Her breathing and pulse were normal. She was not sweating, though her jeans and shirt were still wet from exertion and humidity. Mark swatted and slapped mosquitoes and said little. He was eerily calm. He chewed on a weed, watching the fence now, and acted as if he and he alone knew precisely when to make the next move. 
Let's go for a little walk, he said, rising from his knees. Where to? The car? No, just down the trail. My leg's about to cramp. Her right leg was numb below the knee. Her left leg was dead below the hip, and she stood with great difficulty. She followed him through the brush until they were on the small trail parallel to the creek. He moved deftly through the darkness, without the benefit of the flashlight, swatting mosquitoes and stretching his legs. They stopped deep in the woods, out of sight of the fence rows of Romy's neighbors. "'I really think we should leave now,' she said, a bit louder, since the houses were no longer in view. "'I have this fear of snakes, you see, and I don't want to step on one.' He did not look at her, but stared in the direction of the ditch. "'I don't think it's a good idea to leave now,' he whispered. She knew he had a reason for saying this. She'd not won an argument in the past six hours. Why? Because those men could still be around here. In fact, they could be close by waiting for things to settle down so they can return. If we head for the car, we might meet them. Mark, I can't take any more of this, okay? This may be fun and games for you, but I'm 52 years old and I've had it. I can't believe I'm hiding in this jungle at one o'clock in the morning. He put his fingers over his lips. Shh. You're talking too loud, and this isn't a game. Damn it, I know it's not a game. Don't lecture me. Keep your cool, Reggie. We're safe now. Safe my ass. I won't feel safe until I lock the door at the motel. Then leave. Go on. Find your way back to the car and leave. Sure, and let me guess. You'll stay here, right? The moonlight disappeared, and suddenly the woods were darker. He turned his back to her and began walking toward their hiding place. She instinctively followed him, and this irritated her, because at this moment she was depending on an eleven-year-old. But she followed him anyway, along a trail invisible to her, through the dense woods to the undergrowth, to about the same point where they'd waited before. The garage was barely visible. The blood had returned to her legs, though they were very stiff. Her lower back throbbed. She could rub her hand across her forearm and feel the bumps from the mosquito bites. There was a thin sliver of blood on the back of her left hand, probably from a sticker in the brush, or perhaps a weed. If she ever made it back to Memphis, she vowed to join a health club and get in shape. Not that she planned any more ventures like this, but she was tired of aching and gasping for breath. Mark lowered onto one knee, stuck another weed in his mouth to chew on, and watched the garage. They waited almost in silence for an hour. When she'd reached the point of leaving him and running wildly through the woods, Reggie said, "'Okay, Mark, I'm leaving. Do what you've got to do, because I'm leaving now.' But she didn't move. They crouched together, and he pointed at the garage, as if she didn't know where it was. "'I'm crawling up there, okay, with the flashlight, and I'm looking at the body or the grave or whatever they were digging at, okay?' "'No. It won't take but a second, maybe. If I'm lucky, I'll be right back. I'm going with you,' she said. No. No, I want you to stay here. I'm worried that those guys are watching, too, somewhere along the tree line. If they come after me, I want you to start yelling and run like crazy. No, no way, sweetheart. If you're looking at the body, then I'm looking at the body, and I'm not arguing about it. That's final. He looked at her eyes four or five inches away and decided not to argue. Her head was shaking and her jaw was tight. She looked cute under the cap. Then follow me, Reggie. Stay low and listen. Always listen, okay? All right, all right. I'm not totally helpless. In fact, I'm getting pretty good at crawling. They attacked from the brush on all fours again, two figures sliding in the still darkness. The grass was wet and cool. The gate, still open from the hasty retreat of the grave robbers, squeaked slightly when Reggie hooked it with a foot. Mark glared at her. They stopped behind the first tree, then eased to the next. Not a sound from anywhere. It was 2 a.m., and the neighborhood was silent. Mark, however, was worried about the nut next door with the gun. He doubted the man would sleep well with a thin sheet of plastic over the window, and he could envision him sitting in the kitchen watching the patio and waiting for the snap of a twig before he began blasting away again. They stopped at the next tree, then crawled to the junk pile. She nodded once, taking small, quick breaths. They crouched and darted to the rear door of the garage, which was slightly open. Mark stuck his head inside. He turned on the flashlight and aimed it at the floor. Reggie eased in behind him. The odor was thick and pungent, like a dead animal rotting in the sun. Reggie instinctively covered her nose and mouth. Mark breathed deeply, then held his breath. 
The only open space in the cluttered room was in the center where the boat had been parked. They crouched over the concrete slab. I'm getting sick, Reggie said, barely opening her mouth. Another ten minutes and the body would have been out. They had started in the center somewhere around the torso and chipped away at each side. The black garbage bags partially decomposed by the cement had been ripped away. A ragged little trench had been cut away toward the feet and knees. Mark had seen enough. He picked up a chisel, one that had been left behind, and jabbed it into black plastic. Don't, Reggie whispered loudly, backing away, but still seeing it all. He ripped through the garbage bag with the chisel and followed it closely with the light. He made a slow turn, then pulled the plastic with his hand. He bolted upright in horror, then slowly placed the light squarely into the decaying face of the late Senator Boyd Boyette. Reggie took another step backward and fell onto a pile of bags filled with aluminum cans. The racket was deafening in the still air. She scrambled and fought to get up in the darkness, but the thrashing and kicking created more noise. Mark grabbed a hand and pulled her toward the boat. I'm sorry, she whispered, standing two feet from the corpse without thinking about it. Shh, Mark said as he stepped onto a box and peeked through the window. A light came on next door. The shotgun could not be far behind. Let's go, he said. Stay low. They eased through the rear door, and Mark closed it behind them. A door slammed at the neighbor's. He hit his hands and knees and slid around the debris pile past the trees and through the gate. Reggie was on his heels. They stopped crawling when they reached the brush. They crouched low and scampered like squirrels until they found the trail. Mark turned on the flashlight, and they didn't slow until they were at the creek. He ducked into some weeds and turned off the light. "'What's the matter?' she asked, breathing hard, terrified, and damn sure not willing to pause in this getaway. "'Did you see his face?' Mark asked, in awe of what they'd just done. "'Of course I saw his face. Now let's go. I want to see it again.' She almost slapped him. Then she stood upright, hands on hips, and started walking toward the creek. Mark ran beside her with a flashlight. "'I was just kidding.' She stopped and glared at him. Then he took her hand and led her down the bank to the creek bed. They entered the expressway by the Superdome and headed for Materi. Traffic was light, although heavier than in most cities at 2.30 on a Sunday morning. Not a word had been spoken since they jumped in the car at West Park and left the area, and the silence bothered neither. Reggie contemplated how close she'd been to death. Mafia hoods, snakes, crazy neighbors, police, guns, shock, heart attack. It would have made no difference. She was indeed fortunate to be here racing along the expressway, soaked with perspiration, covered with insect bites, bloody from the wounds of nature and dirty from a night in the jungle. It could have been so much worse. She'd take a hot shower at the motel, maybe sleep a little, then worry about the next move. She was exhausted from the fear and sudden shocks. She was in pain from the crawling and stooping. She was too old for this nonsense. The things lawyers do. Mark gently scratched the bites on his left forearm and watched the lights of New Orleans thin as they left downtown. Did you see that brown stuff on his face? he asked without looking at her. Though the face was now forever seared into her memory, she could not at the moment recall any brown stuff on it. It was a small, shriveled, partially decayed face, and one that she wished she could forget. "'I saw only the worms,' she said. "'The brown stuff was blood,' he said, with the authority of a medical examiner. She did not wish to pursue this conversation. There were more important things to discuss now that the silence was broken. "'I think we need to talk about your plans now that this little escapade is behind us,' she said, glancing at him. We need to move fast, Reggie. Those guys will be back to get the body, don't you think? Yes, for once I agree. They might be back now, for all we know. He scratched the other forearm and placed an ankle on a knee. I've been thinking. I'm sure you have. There are two things I don't like about Memphis. The heat and the flat land. There are no hills or mountains, you know what I mean? I've always thought it would be so nice to live in the mountains where the air is cool and the snow is deep in the wintertime. Wouldn't that be fun, Reggie? She smiled to herself and changed lanes. Sounds wonderful. Any particular mountain? Out west somewhere. 
I love to watch those old bonanza reruns with Hoss and Little Joe. Adam was okay, but it really ticked me off when he left. I've watched them since I was a little kid, and I've always thought it would be neat to live out there. What happened to the tall buildings and the crowded city? That was yesterday. Today I'm thinking about mountains. Is that where you want to go, Mark? I think so. Can I? It can be arranged. Right now they'll agree to almost anything. He stopped scratching and locked his fingers around his knee. His voice was tired. I can't go back to Memphis, can I, Reggie? No, she said softly. I didn't think so. He thought about this for a few seconds. It's just as well, I guess. There's not much left there. Think of it as yet another adventure, Mark. A new home, new school, new job for your mother. You'll have a much nicer place to live, new friends, mountains all around you, if that's what you want. Be honest with me, Reggie. You think they'll ever find me? She had to say no. At this moment, he had no choice. She would run and hide with him no more. They had either to call the FBI and strike a deal or call the FBI and turn themselves in. This little trip was about to be over. No, Mark, they'll never find you. You have to trust the FBI. I don't trust the FBI, and you don't either. I don't completely distrust them. But right now they've got the only game in town. And I have to play along with them? Unless you have a better idea. Mark was in the shower. Reggie dialed Clint's number and listened as the phone rang a dozen times before he answered. It was almost 3 a.m. Clint, it's me. His voice was thick and slow. Reggie? Yes, me, Reggie. Listen to me, Clint. Turn on the light, put your feet on the floor, and listen to me. I'm listening. Jason Maxoon's phone number is listed in the Memphis directory. I want you to call him and tell him you need Larry Truman's home phone number in New Orleans. Got that? Why don't you look in the New Orleans phone book? Don't ask questions, Clint. Just do as I say. Truman's not listed down here. What's going on, Reggie? His words were much quicker. I'll call you back in 15 minutes. Make some coffee. This could be a long day. She hung up and unlaced her muddy sneakers. Mark finished a quick shower and ripped open a new package of underwear. He'd been embarrassed when Reggie bought them, but now it seemed so unimportant. He slipped into a new yellow T-shirt and pulled on his new but dirty Walmart jeans. No socks. He wasn't going anywhere for a while, according to his attorney. He left the tiny bathroom. Reggie was lying on the bed, shoes off, weeds and grass on the cuffs of her jeans, he sat on the edge of her bed and stared at the wall. Feel better? she asked. He nodded, said nothing, then lay beside her. She pulled him close to her body and placed an arm under his wet head. I'm all messed up, Reggie, he said softly. I don't know what happens next any more. The tough little boy who threw rocks through windows and outsmarted killers and cops and raced fearlessly through dark woods began to cry. He bit his lip and squinted his eyes, but couldn't stop the tears. She held him closer. Then he broke, finally, and sobbed loudly with no attempt to hold it back, no effort at being tough now. He cried without shame or embarrassment. His body shook and he squeezed her arm. "'It's okay, Mark,' she whispered in his ear. "'Everything's okay.' With her free hand she wiped tears from her cheeks and squeezed him even closer. Now it was up to her. She had to be the lawyer again, the counselor who moved daringly and called the shots. His life was once again in her hands. The television was on, but the sound was off. Its gray and blue shadows cast a dim light over the small room with its double beds and cheap furniture. Joe Truman grabbed the phone and searched the darkness for the clock. Ten minutes before four. She handed it to her husband, who took it and sat in the center of the bed. Hello, he grunted. Hi, Larry. It's me, Reggie Love. Remember? Yeah, where are you? Here in New Orleans. We need to talk, and the sooner the better. He almost said something smart about the hour of the day, but thought better of it. It was important, or she wouldn't be calling. Sure. What's going on, Reggie? 
where we found the body, for starters. Truman was suddenly on his feet and sliding into his house shoes. I'm listening. I've seen the body, Larry, about two hours ago. I saw it with my own eyes. Smelled it, too. Where are you? Truman pressed a button on the recorder by the phone. I'm at a pay phone, so no cute stuff, okay? Okay. The people who buried the body tried to retrieve it last night, but they were unable to do so. Long story, Larry. I'll explain it later. I'm willing to bet they'll try again very soon. Is the kid with you? Yes. He knew where it was, and we came, we saw, and we conquered. You'll have it by noon today if you do as I say. Anything. That's the spirit, Larry. The kid wants to cut a deal, so we need to talk. When and where? Meet me in the Rain Tree Inn on Veterans Boulevard in Materi. There's a grill that's open all night. How long will it take? Give me 45 minutes. The sooner you get here, the sooner you'll get the body. Can I bring someone with me? Who? K.O. Lewis. He's in town? Yeah. We knew you were here, so Mr. Lewis flew in a few hours ago. There was hesitation on her end. How'd you know I was here? We have ways. Who have you wired, Truman? Talk to me. I want a straight answer. Her voice was firm, yet with a trace of panic. Can I explain it when we meet, he asked, kicking himself in the ass for opening this can of worms. Explain it now, she commanded. I'll be happy to explain when... Listen, asshole, I'm canceling the meeting unless you tell me right now who's been wired. Talk, Truman. Okay, we bugged the kid's mother's room at the hospital. It was a mistake. I didn't do it, okay? Memphis did it. What did they hear? Not much. Your man, Clint, called yesterday afternoon and told her you guys were in New Orleans. That's all. I swear. Would you lie to me, Truman? She asked, thinking of the tape from their first encounter. I'm not lying, Reggie, Truman insisted, thinking of the same damn tape. There was a long pause in which he heard nothing but her breathing. Just you and K.O. Lewis, she said. No one else. If Foltrick shows up, all deals are off, I swear. She hung up. Truman immediately called K.O. Lewis at the Hilton. Then he called McThune in Memphis. Chapter 39 Exactly forty-five minutes later, Truman and Lewis walked nervously into the near-empty grill at the Rain Tree Inn. Reggie waited at a table in the corner, far away from anyone. Her hair was wet, and she wore no makeup. A bulky T-shirt with LSU Tigers in purple letters was tucked into a pair of faded jeans. She sipped black coffee and neither stood nor smiled as they approached and sat opposite her. "'Good morning, Miss Love,' Lewis said in an attempt to be nice. "'It's Reggie, okay, and it's too early for pleasantries. Are we alone?' "'Of course,' Lewis said. At that moment eight FBI agents were guarding the parking lot and more were on the way. No bugs, wire, body mics, salt, shakers, or ketchup bottles? None. A waiter appeared, and they ordered coffee. Where's the kid? Truman asked. He's around. You'll see him soon enough. Is he safe? Of course he's safe. You boys couldn't catch him if he was on the streets begging for food. She handed Lewis a piece of paper. These are the names of three psychiatric hospitals that specialize in children. Battenwood in Rockford, Illinois, Ridgewood in Tallahassee, and Grant's Clinic in Phoenix. Any one of the three will do. Their eyes went slowly from her face to the list. They focused and studied it. But we've already checked with the clinic in Portland, Lewis said, puzzled. I don't care what you've checked, Mr. Lewis. Take this list and check again. I suggest you do it quickly. Call Washington, get them out of bed, and get it done. He folded the list and placed it under his elbow. You, um, you say you've seen the body, he asked, trying to sound authoritative but failing miserably. She smiled. I have, less than three hours ago. Maldano's men were trying to get it, but we scared them off. We, Mark and I. They both studied her intently and waited for the precious details of this wild, impossible little story. The coffee arrived, and they ignored both it and the waiter. We are not eating. "'Reggie said rudely, and the waiter left. "'Here's the deal,' she said. "'There are a few provisions, none of which are in the least bit negotiable. "'Do it my way, do it now, and you might get the body before Moldano carries it away and drops it in the ocean. "'If you blow it, gentlemen, I doubt you'll ever get this close again.' "'They nodded furiously. 
Did you fly here on a private jet? she asked Lewis. Yes, it's the director's. How many does it seat? Twenty or so. Good. Send it back to Memphis right now. I want you to pick up Diane and Ricky Sway along with his doctor and Clint. Fly them here immediately. Maxune is welcome to come. We'll meet them at the airport, and when Mark is safely on board and the plane is gone, I'll tell you where the body is. How about it so far? No problem, Lewis said. Truman was speechless. The entire family enters the witness protection plan. First they pick the hospital, and when Ricky is able to move, they'll pick the city. No problem. Complete change of identification, nice little house, the works. This woman needs to stay home and raise her kids for a while, so I'd suggest a monthly allowance in the sum of $4,000 guaranteed for three years, plus an initial cash outlay of 25000 They lost everything in the fire, remember? Of course, these things are easy. Lewis was so eager, she wished she'd ask for more. If, at some point, she wants to return to work, then I'd suggest a nice, cushy government job with no responsibilities, short hours, and a fat salary. We have plenty of those. Should they desire to move at any time and to any place, they'll be allowed to do so at your expense, of course. We do it all the time. Truman was smiling now, though he was trying not to. She'll need a car, no problem. Ricky may need extended treatment. We'll cover it. I want Mark examined by a psychiatrist, though I suspect he's in better shape than we are. Done. There are a couple of other minor matters, and they'll be covered in the agreement. What agreement? The agreement I'm having typed as we speak. It'll be signed by myself, Diane Sway, Judge Harry Roosevelt, and you, Mr. Lewis, on behalf of Director Voyles. What else is in the agreement? Lewis asked. I want your assurance that you'll do everything in your power to compel the attendance of Roy Fultrig before the juvenile court of Shelby County, Tennessee. Judge Roosevelt will want to discuss a few matters with him, and I'm sure Fultrig will resist. If a subpoena is issued for him, I want it served by you, Mr. Truman. Gladly, Truman said with a nasty smile. We'll do what we can, Lewis added, a bit confused. Good. Go make your telephone calls. Get the plane in the air. Call McThune and tell him to pick up Clint Van Hooser and take him to the hospital. Get that damn bug off her phone because I need to talk to her. No problem. They jumped to their feet. We'll meet right here in 30 minutes. Clint hammered away over his ancient royal portable. His third cup of coffee shook each time he slapped the return and rattled the kitchen table. He studied his hurried chicken-scratch handwriting on the back of an esquire and tried to remember each provision as she'd spouted it over the phone. If he finished it, it would be without a doubt the sloppiest legal document ever prepared. He cursed and grabbed the liquid paper. A knock on the door startled him. He ran his fingers through his unkempt and unwashed hair and walked to the door. Who is it? FBI. Not so loud, he almost said. He could hear the neighbors now gossiping about him at his pre-dawn arrest. Probably drugs, they would say. He cracked the door and peeked under the safety chain. Two agents with puffy eyes stood in the darkness. We were told to come get you, one said apologetically. I need some ID. They stuck their badges near the door. FBI, the first one said. Clint opened the door wider and waved them in. I'll be a few more minutes. Have a seat. They stood awkwardly in the center of the den as he returned to the table and the typewriter. He packed slowly. The chicken scratch failed him, and he ad-libbed the rest. The important points were there, he hoped. She always found something to change in his typing at the office, but this would have to do. He pulled it carefully from the royal and placed it in a small briefcase. Let's go, he said. At 5.40, Truman returned alone to the table where Reggie waited. He brought two cellular phones. Thought we might need these, he said. Where'd you get them? Reggie asked. They were delivered to us here. By some of your men? That's right. Just for fun, how many men do you have right now within a quarter of a mile of this place? I don't know, 12 or 13. It's routine, Reggie. They might be needed. We'll send a few to protect the kid if you'll tell me where he is. I assume he's alone. He's alone, and he's fine. Did you talk to Macthune? Yes, they've already picked up Clint. That was fast. Well, to be honest, we've had men watching his apartment for 24 hours now. We simply woke them up and told them to knock on his door. We found your car, Reggie, but we couldn't find Clint's. I'm driving it. That's what I figured. Pretty slick. But we would have found you within 24 hours. 
Don't be so cocky, Truman. You've been looking for Boyette for eight months. True. How'd the kid escape? It's a long story. I'll save it for later. You could be implicated, you know. Not if you guys sign our literal agreement. We'll sign it. Don't worry. One of the phones rang, and Truman grabbed it. As he listened, K.O. Lewis hurried to the table and brought his own cellular phone. He jumped into his chair and leaned across the table, his eyes glowing with excitement. Talk to Washington. We're checking the hospitals right now. Everything looks fine. Director Voyles will call here in a minute. He'll probably want to talk to you. How about the plane? Lewis checked his watch. It's leaving now. Should be in Memphis by 6.30. Truman placed a hand over his phone. This is MacThune. He's at the hospital waiting for Dr. Greenway and the administrator. They've made contact with Judge Roosevelt, and he's on his way down there. Have you debugged her phone? Reggie asked. Yes. Remove the salt shakers? No salt shakers. Everything's clean. Good. Tell him to call back in 20 minutes, she said. Truman mumbled into the phone and flipped a switch. Within seconds, K.O.'s phone beeped. He stuck it to his head and broke into a large smile. Yes, sir, he said most respectfully. Just a second. He jabbed the phone at Reggie. It's Director Voyles. He'd like to speak with you. Reggie took it slowly and said, This is Reggie, love. Lewis and Truman watched like two kids waiting for ice cream. A deep and very clear voice came from the other end. Though Denton Voyles had never been fond of the press during his 42 years as director of the FBI, they occasionally captured a brief word or two. The voice was familiar. Miss Love, this is Denton Voyles. How are you? Just fine. The name's Reggie, okay? Sure, Reggie. Listen, K.O. just brought me up to date, and I want to assure you the FBI will do anything you want to protect this kid and his family. K.O. has full authority to act for me. We'll also protect you if you wish. I'm more concerned about the child, Denton. Truman and Lewis glanced at each other. She had just called him Denton, a feat no one had dared to attempt before, and she was not the least disrespectful. "'If you want, you can fax me the agreement here, and I'll sign it myself,' he said. "'That won't be necessary, but thanks. "'And my plane is at your disposal. Thank you. "'And I promise that we'll see to it that Mr. Fultrick has to face the music in Memphis. "'We have nothing to do with the grand jury subpoenas, you understand?' "'Yes, I know. "'Good luck to you, Reggie.' You guys work out the details. Lewis can move mountains. Call me if you need me. I'll be at the office all day. Thank you, she said, and handed the phone back to K.O. Lewis, the mountain mover. The assistant night manager of the grill, a young man of no more than nineteen, with a peach fuzz mustache and an attitude, walked to the table. These people had been here for an hour, and from all indications they'd set up cap. There were three phones in the center of the table. Some papers were lying about. The woman wore a sweatshirt and jeans. One of the men wore a cap and no socks. Excuse me, he said curtly. Can I be of assistance? Truman glanced over his shoulder and snapped, No. He hesitated and took a step closer. I'm the assistant night manager, and I demand to know what you're doing here. Truman snapped his fingers loudly, and two gentlemen reading the Sunday paper at a table not far away jumped to their feet and whipped badges from their pockets. They stuck them into the face of the assistant night manager. FBI, they said together as they each took an arm and led him away. He did not return. The grill was still deserted. A phone rang and Lewis took it. He listened carefully. Reggie opened the Sunday New Orleans paper. At the bottom of the front page was her face. The picture was taken from the bar registry and it was next to Mark's fourth grade class photo. Side by side. Escaped disappeared, on the run, boyette and all that. She turned to the comics. That was Washington, Lewis reported as he placed the phone on the table. The clinic in Rockford is full. They're checking on the other two. Reggie nodded and sipped her coffee. The sun was making its first efforts of the day. Her eyes were red and her head was hurting, but the adrenaline was pumping. With a little luck, she would be home by dark. Look, Reggie, could you give us an idea how long it'll take to get to the body? Truman asked with great caution. He didn't want to press, didn't want to upset her, but he needed to start planning. Muldano's still out there, and if he gets it first, we're all up a creek. He paused and waited for her to say something. It's in the city, right? 
If you don't get lost, you should be able to find it in fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes, he repeated slowly, as if this was too good to be true. Fifteen minutes. Chapter 40 Clint hadn't smoked a cigarette in four years, but he found himself puffing nervously on a Virginia Slim. Diane had one, too, and they stood at the end of the hall and watched as the day broke over downtown Memphis. Greenway was in the room with Ricky. Next door, Jason McThune, the hospital administrator and a small collection of FBI agents, waited. Both Clint and Diane had talked to Reggie in the past thirty minutes. "'The director has given his word,' Clint said, sucking hard on the narrow cigarette, trying to extract a little smoke. "'There's no other choice, Diane.' She stared through the window with one arm across her chest and the other hand holding the cigarette near her mouth. We just leave, right? We just get on the plane and fly off into the sunset and everybody lives happily ever after? Something like that. What if I don't want to, Clint? You can't say no. Why not? It's very simple. Your son has made the decision to talk. He's also made the decision to enter the witness protection program, so like it or not, you have to go too. You and Ricky. I'd like to talk to my son. You can talk to him in New Orleans. If you can change his mind, then the deal's off. Reggie's not dropping the big news until you guys are on the plane and in the air. Clint was firm yet compassionate. She was scared, weak, and vulnerable. Her hands trembled as she placed the filter between her lips. Miss Sway, a heavy voice said from behind. They turned to find the Honorable Harry M. Roosevelt standing behind them in a massive, bright blue jogging suit with Memphis State Tigers emblazoned across the front. It had to be a triple extra large, and it stopped six inches above his ankles. A pair of ancient but seldom used running shoes covered his long feet. He was holding the two-page agreement Clint had typed. She acknowledged his presence but said nothing. "'Hello, Your Honor,' Clint said quietly. I just talked to Reggie, he said to Diane. I'd say they've had a rather eventful trip. He stepped between them and ignored Clint. I've read this agreement and I'm inclined to sign it. I think it's in the best interest of Mark for you to do the same. Is that an order? she asked. No, I do not have the power to bind you to this agreement, he said, then flashed a huge warm smile. But I would if I could. She placed the cigarette in an ashtray on the window sill and stuck both hands deep into the pockets of her jeans. And if I don't? Then Mark will be returned here, placed back in detention, and beyond that, who knows? He will eventually be forced to talk. The situation is much more urgent now. Why? Because we know for a fact that Mark knows where the body is. So does Reggie. They could be in great danger. You're at the point, Mrs. Way, where you have to trust people. That's easy for you to say. Indeed it is. But if I were you, I'd sign this and get on the plane. Diane slowly took the agreement from his honor. Let's go talk to Dr. Greenway. They followed her down the hall to the room next to Ricky's. Twenty minutes later, the ninth floor of St. Peter's was sealed off by a dozen FBI agents. The waiting room was evacuated. The nurses were told to remain at their station. Three of the elevators were stopped on the ground floor. The other was held in place on the ninth by an agent. The door to room 943 opened, and little Ricky Sway, drugged and sound asleep, was wheeled into the hallway on a stretcher, pushed by Jason McThune and Clint Van Hooser. On this, his sixth day of confinement, he was no better than when he first arrived. Greenway walked along one side, Diane the other. Harry followed along for a few steps, then stopped. The stretcher was pushed into the waiting elevator, which descended to the fourth floor, also secured by FBI agents. It was rushed a short distance to a service elevator, where Agent Durston held the door, then taken to the second floor, also secured. Ricky never moved. Diane held his arm and jogged beside the stretcher. They maneuvered through a series of short corridors and metal doors and were suddenly on a flat roof. A helicopter was waiting. Ricky was loaded quickly, and Diane, Clint, and Macthune climbed aboard. Minutes later, the helicopter landed near a hangar at Memphis International Airport. 
A half dozen FBI agents guarded the pad as Ricky was rolled to a nearby jet. At ten minutes before seven, a cellular phone rang at the corner table of the Rain Tree Grill, and Truman grabbed it. He listened and checked his watch. They're in the air, he announced, and set the phone down. Lewis was talking to Washington again. Reggie breathed deeply and smiled at Truman. The body's in concrete. You'll need a few hammers and chisels. Truman choked on his orange juice. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Place a couple of your boys near the intersection of St. Joseph and Carondelet. Close by. Just do it, okay? Done. Anything else? I'll be back in a minute. Reggie walked to the registration desk and asked the clerk to check the fax machine. The clerk returned with a copy of the two-page agreement, which Reggie read closely. The typing was horrible, but the words were perfect. She returned to the table. Let's get Mark, she said. Mark finished brushing his teeth for the third time and sat on the edge of the bed. His black and gold saint's canvas bag was packed with dirty clothes and new underwear. Cartoons were on, but he was not interested. He heard a car door, then footsteps, then a knock. Mark, it's me, Reggie said. He opened the door, but she did not step inside. Are you ready to go? I guess. The sun was up and the parking lot was visible. A familiar face was behind her. It was one of the FBI agents from the first meeting at the hospital. Mark grabbed his bag and stepped out into the parking lot. Three cars were waiting. A man opened the rear door of the middle car and Mark and his attorney got in. The little motorcade sped away. Everything's fine, Reggie said, taking his hand. The two men in the front seat stared straight ahead. Ricky and your mother are on the plane. They'll be here in about an hour. Are you okay? I guess. Have you told them? he whispered. Not yet, she answered. Not until you're on the plane and in the air. Are all these guys FBI agents? She nodded and patted his hand. He suddenly felt important, sitting in the rear of his own black car, being rushed to the airport to board a private jet, cops all around just to protect him. He crossed his legs and sat a bit straighter. He'd never flown before. Before. Chapter 41 Barry paced nervously before the tinted windows in Johnny's office and watched the tugs and barges on the river. His nasty eyes were red, but not from booze or partying. He hadn't slept. He'd waited here at the warehouse for the body to be delivered to him, and when Leo and company arrived around one without it, he had called his uncle. Johnny, on this fine Sunday morning, was wearing neither tie nor suspenders. He paced slowly behind his desk, puffing blue smoke from his third cigar of the day. A thick cloud hung not far above his head. The screaming and ass-chewing had ended hours ago. Barry had cursed Leo and Iannucci and the bull, and Leo had cursed back. But with time the panic subsided. Throughout the night Leo had periodically driven by Clifford's house, always in a different vehicle, and seeing nothing unusual. The body was still there. Johnny decided to wait twenty-four hours and try again. They would watch the place during the day and attack with full force after dark. The bull assured him he could have the body out of the concrete in ten minutes. Just be cool, Johnny had told everyone. Just be cool. Roy Fultrig finished the Sunday paper on the patio of his suburban split level and walked barefooted across the wet grass with a cup of cold coffee. He had slept little. He'd waited in the darkness on his front porch for the paper to arrive, then ran to fetch it in his pajamas and bathrobe. He had called Truman, but strangely Mrs. Truman wasn't sure where her husband had gone. He inspected his wife's rose bushes along the back fence and asked himself for the hundredth time where Mark's way would run to. There was no doubt, at least in his mind, that Reggie had helped him escape. She'd obviously gone crazy again and run off with the kid. He smiled to himself. He'd have the pleasure of busting her ass. The hangar was a quarter of a mile from the main terminal in a row of identical buildings, all drab gray and sitting quietly together. The words Gulf Air were painted in orange letters above the tall double doors which were opening as the three cars stopped in front of the hangar. The floor was sparkling concrete, painted green, without a speck of dirt, and covered with nothing but two private jets side by side in a far corner. A few lights were on, and their reflections glowed on the green floor. 
The building was big enough for a stock car race, Mark thought, as he stretched his neck for a glimpse of the two jets. With the doors out of the way, the entire front of the hangar was now open. Three men walked hurriedly along the back wall as if searching for something. Two more stood by one door. Outside, another half-dozen moved slowly about, keeping their distance from the cars that had just parked. "'Who are these people?' Mark asked in the general direction of the front seat. "'They are with us,' Truman said. "'They are FBI agents,' Reggie clarified. "'Why so many?' "'They are just being careful,' she said. "'How much longer, do you think?' she asked Truman. He glanced at his watch. "'Probably thirty minutes.' "'Let's walk around,' she said, opening her door. "'As if on cue, the other eleven doors in the little parade opened "'and the cars emptied. "'Mark looked around at the other hangars and the terminal "'and a plane landing on the runway in front of them. "'This had become terribly exciting. "'Not three weeks ago he'd beaten the crap out of a subdivision kid at school "'after the kid taunted him because he'd never flown. "'If they could only see him now.' Rushed to the airport by private car, waiting for his private jet to take him anywhere he wanted to go? No more trailers, no more fights with subdivision kids, no more notes to mom, because now she would be at home. He'd decided, sitting alone in the motel room, that this was a wonderful idea. He'd come to New Orleans and outsmarted the mafia in its own backyard, and he could do it again. He caught a few stares from the agents by the door. They cut their eyes quickly at him, then looked away, just checking him out. Maybe he'd sign some autographs later. He followed Reggie into the vast hangar, and the two private jets caught his attention. They were like small, shiny toys sitting under the Christmas tree, waiting to be played with. One was black, the other silver, and Mark stared at them. A man in an orange shirt with gulf air on a patch above the pocket closed the door to a small office inside the hangar and walked in their direction. K.O. Lewis met him, and they talked quietly. The man waved at the office and said something about coffee. Larry Truman knelt beside Mark, still staring at the jets. "'Mark, do you remember me?' he asked with a smile. "'Yes, sir. I met you at the hospital.' "'That's right. My name's Larry Truman,' he offered his hand, and Mark shook it slowly. "'Children are not supposed to shake hands with adults.' "'I'm an FBI agent here in New Orleans.' Mark nodded and kept staring at the jets. "'Would you like to look at them?' Truman asked. "'Can I?' he asked, suddenly friendly to Truman. "'Sure.' Truman stood and placed a hand on Mark's shoulder. They walked slowly across the gleaming concrete, the sounds of Truman's steps echoing upward. They stopped in front of the black jet. "'Now, this is a Lear jet,' Truman began. Reggie and K.O. Lewis left the small office with tall cups of steaming coffee. The agents who had escorted them here had slipped into the shadows of the hangar. They sipped what must have been their tenth cups of this long morning and watched as Truman and the kid inspected the jets. "'He's a brave kid,' Lewis said. "'He's remarkable,' Reggie said. "'At times he thinks like a terrorist, then he cries like a little child.' "'He is a child.' "'I know, but don't tell him. It may upset him, and hell, who knows what he might do?' She took a long sip. Truly remarkable. K.O. blew into his cup, then took a tiny sip. We've pulled some strings. There's a room waiting for Ricky at Grant's clinic in Phoenix. We need to know if that's the destination. The pilot called five minutes ago. He has to get clearance, file a flight plan, you know. Phoenix it is. Complete confidentiality, okay? Register the kid under another name. Same for the mother and Mark. Keep some of your boys nearby. I want you to pay for his doctor's trip out there and for a few days of work. No problem. The people in Phoenix have no idea what's coming. Have you guys talked about a permanent home? A little, not much. Mark says he wants to live in the mountains. Vancouver's nice. We vacationed there last summer. Absolutely gorgeous. Out of the country? No problem. Director Voles said they can go anywhere. We've placed a few witnesses outside the States, and I think the Sways are perfect candidates. These people will be taken care of, Reggie. You have my word. The man in the orange shirt joined Mark and Truman and was now in charge of the tour. He lowered the steps to the black Lear, and the three disappeared inside. I must confess, Lewis said after he swallowed another scalding dose of coffee, I was never convinced the kid knew. 
Clifford told him everything. He knew exactly where it was. Did you? No, not until yesterday. When he first came to my office, he told me that he knew, but he didn't tell me where it was. Thank God for that. He kept it to himself until we were near the body yesterday afternoon. Why'd you come here? Seems awfully risky. Reggie nodded at the jets. You'll have to ask him. He insisted we find the body. If Clifford lied to him, then he figured he was off the hook. And so you just drove down here and looked for the body, just like that? It was a bit more involved. It's a long story, K.O., and I'll give you all the details over a long dinner. I can't wait. Mark's small head was now in the cockpit, and Reggie half expected the engines to start, the plane to taxi slowly from the hangar out onto the runway, and Mark to dazzle them with a perfect takeoff. She knew he could do it. Are you concerned about your own safety? Lewis asked. Not really. I'm just a humble lawyer. What would they gain by coming after me? Retribution. You don't understand the way they think. Indeed, I don't. Director Voyles would like for us to stick close for a few months, at least until the trial is over. I don't care what you do. I just don't want to see anyone who's watching me, okay? Fine. We have ways. The tour moved to the second jet, a silver citation, and for the moment Mark Sway had forgotten about dead bodies and bad guys lurking in the shadows. The steps came down, and he climbed aboard with Truman in tow. An agent with a radio walked to Reggie and Lewis and said, They're on final approach. They followed him to the opening of the hangar near the cars. A minute later, Mark and Truman joined them, and as they watched the sky to the north, a tiny plane appeared. That's them, Lewis said. Mark inched his way to Reggie and took her hand. The plane grew larger as it approached the runway. It, too, was black, but much larger than the jets in the hangar. Agents, some in suits and some in jeans, began moving around as the plane taxied to them. It stopped a hundred feet away and the engines died. A full minute passed before the door opened and the stairs hit the ground. Jason Maxune trotted down first, and when he stepped onto the tarmac, a dozen FBI agents had the plane surrounded. Diane and Clint were next. They joined Maxune, and together the three walked briskly toward the hangar. Mark released Reggie's hand and ran to meet his mother. Diane grabbed and hugged him, and for an awkward second or two everyone else either watched or looked at the terminal in the distance. They said nothing as they embraced. He squeezed her tightly around the neck and finally said through tears, "'I'm sorry, Mom. I'm so sorry.' She clutched his head and pressed it to her shoulder, and at the same time thought of strangling him and of never letting go. Reggie led them into the small but clean office and offered Diane coffee. She declined. Truman, Maxune, Lewis, and the gang waited nervously outside the door. Truman especially was anxious. What if they changed their minds? What if Maldano got the body? What if... He paced and fidgeted, glanced at the locked door, asked Lewis a hundred questions... Lewis sipped coffee and tried to remain calm. It was now twenty minutes before eight. The sun was bright, the air humid. Mark sat in his mother's lap, and Reggie, the lawyer, sat behind the desk. Clint stood by the door. "'I'm glad you came,' Reggie said to Diane. "'I didn't have much of a choice. You do now. You can change your mind if you want to. You can ask me anything.' "'Do you realize how fast all this is happening, Reggie?' Six days ago, I came home and found Ricky curled in his bed, sucking his thumb. Then Mark and the cop showed up. Now I'm being asked to become someone else and run away to another world. My God! I understand, Reggie said. But we can't stop things. Are you mad at me, Mom? he asked. Yeah, no cookies for a week, she stroked his hair. There was a long pause. How's Ricky? Reggie asked. About the same. Dr. Greenway's trying to bring him around so he can enjoy the plane ride, but they had to drug him slightly when we left the hospital. I'm not going back to Memphis, Mom, Mark said. The FBI has contacted a children's psychiatric hospital in Phoenix, and they're waiting for you now, Reggie explained. It's a good one. Clint checked it out Friday. It's been highly recommended. So we're going to live in Phoenix, Diane asked. Only until Ricky is released. Then you go wherever you want. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, it's up to you. Or you can stay in Phoenix. Let's go to Australia, Mom. They still have real cowboys down there. I saw it in a movie once. 
No more movies for you, Mark, Diane said, still rubbing his head. We wouldn't be here if you hadn't watched so many movies. What about TV? No. From now on, you'll do nothing but read books. The office was silent for a long time. Reggie had nothing else to say. Clint was dead tired and about to fall asleep on his feet. Diane's mind was moving clearly now, for the first time in a week. Frightened as she was, she'd escaped the dungeon at St. Peter's. She had seen sunlight and smelled real air. She was holding her lost son, and the other one would improve. All these people were trying to help. The lamp factory was history. Employment was now a thing of the past. No more cheap trailers. No more worries about past-due child support and unpaid bills. She could watch the boys grow up. She could join the PTA. She could buy some clothes and do her nails. Good gosh, she was only thirty years old. With a little effort and a little money, she could be attractive again. There were men out there. As dark and treacherous as the future seemed, it could not be as horrible as the past six days. Something had to give. She was due a break. Have a little faith, baby. I guess we'd better get to Phoenix, she said. Reggie grinned with relief. She pulled the agreement from a briefcase Clint brought with him. It had been signed by Harry and MacThune. Reggie added her signature and handed the pen to Diane. Mark, now bored with hugs and tears, walked to the wall and admired a series of framed color photos of jets. On second thought, I might be a pilot, he said to Clint. Reggie took the agreement. I'll be back in a minute, she said, opening the door and closing it behind her. Truman jumped when it opened. Hot coffee splashed from his trembling cup and burned his right hand. He cursed and slung at the floor, then wiped it on his pants. "'Relax, Larry,' she said. "'Everything's fine. Sign here.' She stuck the agreement in his face, and Truman scrolled his name. K.O. did the same. "'Get the plane ready,' Reggie said. "'They're going to Phoenix.' K.O. turned and flashed a hand signal at the agents by the hangar entry. MacThune jogged toward them with more instructions. Reggie returned to the office and closed the door. K.O. and Truman shook hands and smiled goofily. They stared at the door to the office. "'What now?' Truman mumbled. "'She's a lawyer,' K.O. said. "'Nothing's ever easy with lawyers.' MacThune walked to Truman and handed him an envelope. "'It's a subpoena for the Reverend Roy Fultrig,' he said with a smile. "'Judge Roosevelt issued it this morning.' "'On Sunday morning?' Truman asked, taking the envelope. "'Yeah, he called his clerk and they met at his office. "'He's very excited about seeing Fultrick back in Memphis.' "'The three chuckled at this. "'It'll be served upon the Reverend this morning,' Truman said. "'After a minute the door opened. "'Clint, Diane, Mark, then Reggie filed out and headed for the tarmac. "'The engines were started. "'Agents scurried about. "'Truman and Lewis escorted them to the hangar doors and stopped. "'K.O., ever the diplomat, offered his hand to Diane and said, "'Good luck, Miss Way.' Jason McThune will escort you to Phoenix and handle things once you get there. You're completely safe. And if we can do anything to help, please let us know. Diane gave a sweet smile and shook his hand. Mark offered his and said, Thanks, K.O. You've been a real pain in the ass. But he was smiling, and it struck everyone as being funny. K.O. laughed. Good luck to you, Mark. And I assure you, son, you've been a bigger pain. Yeah, I know. Sorry about all this. He shook hands with Truman and walked away with his mother and MacThune. Reggie and Clint remained by the hangar door. At some point, about halfway to the jet, Mark stopped. As if suddenly scared, he froze in place and watched as Diane climbed the steps to the plane. At no time during the past twenty-four hours had it occurred to him that Reggie would be left behind. He had simply assumed, for whatever reason, that she would stay with them until this ordeal was over. She would fly off with them and hang around the new hospital until they were safe. And as he stood there, a tiny figure on the vast tarmac, motionless and stunned, he realized she was not beside him. She was back there with Clint and the FBI. He turned slowly and stared at her in terror as this reality sunk in. He took two steps toward her, then stopped. Reggie left her small group and walked to him. She knelt on the tarmac and looked into his panicked eyes. He bit his lip. 
"'You can't come with us, can you?' he asked slowly in a frightened voice. Though they had talked for hours, this subject was never touched. She shook her head as her eyes watered. He wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. The FBI agents were close but not watching. For once in his life he was not ashamed to cry in public. "'But I want you to go,' he said. "'I can't, Mark.' She leaned forward, took both of his shoulders, and hugged him gently. "'I can't go.' Tears flooded his cheeks. "'I'm sorry about all this. You didn't deserve it. "'But if it hadn't happened, Mark, I never would have met you.' She kissed him on the cheek and held his shoulders tight. "'I love you, Mark. I'll miss you. "'I'll never see you again, will I?' His lip quivered and tears dripped off his chin. His voice was frail. She gritted her teeth and shook her head. No, Mark. Reggie took a deep breath and stood. She wanted to grab him and take him home to Mama Love. He could have the bedroom upstairs and all the spaghetti and ice cream he could eat. Instead, she nodded at the plane where Diane was standing in the door waiting patiently. He wiped his cheeks again. I'll never see you again, he said almost to himself. He turned and made a feeble attempt to straighten his shoulders, but he couldn't. He walked slowly to the steps and glanced back for one last look. 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 Chapter 42. The Last Chapter. Minutes later, as the plane taxied to the end of the runway, Clint eased to her side and took her hand. They watched silently as it took off and finally disappeared in the clouds. She wiped tears from both cheeks. "'I think I'll become a real estate lawyer,' she said. "'I can't take any more of this.' "'He's quite a kid,' Clint said. "'It hurts, Clint.' He squeezed her hand harder. "'I know.' Truman appeared quietly beside her, and the three of them looked at the sky. She noticed him and pulled the micro-cassette tape from her pocket. It's yours, she said. He took it. The body is in the garage behind Jerome Clifford's house, she said, still wiping tears. 886 East Brookline. Truman turned to his left and stuck a radio to his mouth. The agents bolted for their cars. Reggie and Clint did not move. Thanks, Reggie, Truman said, now suddenly anxious to leave. She nodded at the distant clouds. Don't thank me, she said. Thank Mark. This concludes the reading of The Client by John Grisham.